today. I'm just going to go through the itinerary, you know, not place by place, because to be honest with you, most of the places in the Exodus itinerary, nobody has any idea where they are. And that contributes to the issue of where's Mount Sinai, because it's going to determine what route they took and where, you know, to, as, as to where you end up. But there are certain things in the itinerary that you can know for sure. So we're going to hit those. And there's this big problem of the quote unquote Red Sea, uh, you know, related to the crossing, just the, the description of it, just how it's described. I'm not talking about a problem with the miraculous. If you listen to this podcast for any amount of time, you know I don't have any problem with the miraculous. But there are problems in just how this thing is described that will become evident in our episode today. That part two, I'm going to look at the crossing in an entirely different way, not in terms of geography, you know, like sort of you know boots on the ground geography. Even though part two will deal with real geography, but but I want to get into the issue of how the Exodus plays off of and can be read through the lens of Egyptian cosmic geography, the, the theological messaging that the whole thing would have conveyed to an Egyptian which I think is going to be a, a lot of new stuff for, for listeners, but it's, it's, as you can imagine, it's kind of dense. So we'll do that in, in a second part, uh, looking at the, uh, the crossing and the route. But for today, you can basically boil down uh, to begin with the fact that the, the route that the Israelites take, the itinerary, as it were, is drawn primarily from three places in scripture. And they don't always exactly agree. And that's part of the problem with the route. Some of, some of them are more complete than others. And those three places are Exodus 13. So we're going to pick up a, a little bit in the prior chapter. Exodus 14, obviously. And then Numbers 33, which is a really important passage for all this. So if you look at number, or Exodus 13, going back to the previous chapter, you get, you get to verse 17. I'm just going to read verses 17 through 22, because it, it gets us sort of into the, the trip, as it were. We read this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. So let's just stop there. That's verse 17. Now, that's important because it eliminates the northern route along. They're leaving the delta. Just think of your, your map of Egypt at the top. You've got that, you know, the delta with all the, the tributaries from the Nile flowing into the Mediterranean. Well, you know, there's, there's an eastern border to all that. That extends all the way down, really, to the left tip of the what we know as the Red Sea, the Gulf of Suez. But this eliminates the northern route, like following the coastline of the sea. It's, it's just explicitly, God says, that's not the way we're going. So God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Again, the Philistines were on the coast because the Philistines were descendants of the sea peoples or part of the sea peoples. We know that from Egyptian history and so on and so forth. So that eliminates that, even though it was near, verse 17 said. So again, it's very clear where we're starting this narrative. They're, the Israelites are leaving the Egyptian delta you know, the store cities of Pithom and Ramses. Okay, we're in the Delta. And so God's like, we're not going to go the closest way. We're not going to go by the land of the Philistines. For God said, this is the rest of verse 17, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, as soon as there's a conflict, if we go the easy route, they're going to want to turn back. So God says, we're not doing that. Verse 18, but God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. This is, you know, we're, for our purposes here, this is where we first get this phrase, Red Sea. We're going to spend a good bit of time on that. And the people of Israel went up from out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkot and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So again, we get this little note that they encounter, or they're, they're going toward the quote, Red Sea. Red Sea again in Hebrew. The full phrase, as it's translated in English Bibles, is Yam Suf, which literally means Sea of Reeds. Now, in part two, when we deal with Egyptian cosmology, there are some scholars who wonder if Suf, remember the Hebrew Bible didn't originally have vowels, and certain consonants did double duty as vowels. And the, the Vav consonant could be a U vowel, like in Suf, or it could be an O vowel, as in Sof. Uh, some scholars wonder if Yam Sof is in view here, because that's like the sea that ends, or the sea that is at the edge. And if you're talking about Egyptian cosmology is basically the sea at the end of the world. You know, this, this, there's a body of water that, that marks the border of Egypt and in the Egyptian mindset. That's like, you know, you're, you're leaving, to, to, to borrow a biblical, you're leaving the promised land, the land of the gods, you know, the black land, you know, the, you're leaving Egypt and you're going off into chaos, you know. So there, there's, that's going to be part of our discussion in part two about cosmological reading of this. But for now, we're going to stick with Yam Suf, Sea of Reeds. Uh, again, that's important here because it's going to get us into a classic problem for the Exodus that we'll get to in a moment. And then in verse 20, we actually get sort of movement here. You know, they move on from Sukkoth and they camp at Etham and on the edge of the wilderness, so on and so forth. Now, a bit of a rabbit trail here, and I'm not going to camp here because I want to I focus on the, the itinerary, as it were. But it, you probably noticed, and people have, you know, in the, in the past, I'm sure, not just by the virtue of this episode, but verse 21 said the Lord, okay, the Lord went before them. And he's, so he's leading the camp of the Israelites in a pillar of cloud and at night a pillar of fire. So it's the divine name, it's Yahweh goes before them. Now, what's interesting about this, in Exodus 14, we read this in verse 19, the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Well, wait a minute, I thought it was the Lord who was out front, but here it's the angel of God that's out front. And then you have the pillar of the cloud move as well and stand behind them. So, I mean, it raises this issue. 
you know, the wording pretty clearly says that the people are led by both the angel, at the very least, both the angel, he and the Lord were going before the Israelites. Because they, they're, both, they're both put there, and then they both move behind. But then that raises the question as well, is this the two ways of referring to the same being? Now, we can't necessarily say that here because there is something visible, the, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, so that the presence of God could be in there. And you could also have an anthropomorphic figure, the angel also out front leading ahead. So you could have the presence of the two, the two powers, uh, as opposed to saying that there was only one thing they could see. Well, evidently, there's two things they can see. They can see the pillar, whether it's cloud and fire, and then the angel, you know, the angel of God was also going before Israel. So this is a, another interesting passage when you get to the two powers in heaven stuff, because very clearly you've got at least two figures. You can't necessarily say that they're only looking at one thing, they're probably looking at two, but one of them is an anthropomorphized Yahweh, okay, the angel of God, because he's interchanged positionally with the presence of the Lord himself. So again, I'm not going to camp on this, just a passing note there, because I want to focus on the itinerary stuff. So as far as the steps, we're going to utilize Numbers 33, and we just read a few verses in chapter 13, we hit you know, chapter 14. So Exodus 14 sort of presupposes um, you know, the, the context of Exodus 13, 20. Exodus 13, 20 said they moved from Sukkot and they encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And so Exodus 14 kind of picks up from that point. It, the chapter begins this way. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahirot, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal or Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. You know, for Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they're wandering the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. The Israelites did so. So we get, again, a little bit more in terms of geographical points. We have this Pihahirot place, whatever that is. We've got Migdal, we've got Baal Zephon. So if we take that in conjunction with Exodus 13, 20, Sukkot and Etham, we're beginning to have a, sort of a station by station you know, commentary. But if we go to Numbers 33, specifically Numbers 33, 5, we actually get another place from which the journey actually begins. It doesn't begin at Sukkot. Sukkot's going to come. If you read Numbers 33, 5, it says, so the people of Israel set out from Ramses and camped at Sukkot. And then they leave Sukkot and then they camp at Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. That's, that's Numbers 33, 5 and 6. So it sounds exactly like what we read in Exodus 13 and Exodus, you know, we're leading to Exodus 14. I might as well throw in Numbers 33, 7 here. I'll just read 5 through, through 7 here. So the people of Israel set out from Ramses. That's where they actually begin. And again, that makes sense because of the Pitham and Ramses thing from Exodus 111. And they camped at Sukkot, and they set out from Sukkot and camped at Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. And they set out from Etham, and they turned back to pi ha which is east of Baal Zephon, and they camped before Migdal. So we get all the place names that we've already encountered in Exodus 13 and 14, but we get this, the actual starting point here in Numbers 33, verse 5. So the order that we have here is Ramses, that city, that place, Sukkot, Etham, and then we get this pi ha Baal Zephon, and Migdal. So the, this is our little concatenation of place names that we have to sort of start with. So they sound a lot like each other. And if you go back to Exodus 13, just think about this. I want to set something in Numbers 33 up. Exodus 13 sounded like, okay, we're on our way. We're not going north. We're going to leave Sukkot. We're going to camp at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord's leading us. And then we hit verse or chapter 14. And, and, and he said, the Lord says, tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp in front of Pihahirot between Migbal and the sea. And in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp by it facing the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people, hey, they're wandering around the land. The wilderness has shut them in. You know, Pharaoh's like, I love the line from the Ten Commandments where Yul Brenner, you know, Pharaoh says, looks at the situation and he sees the Israelites with the sea to their back. And he says, the God of Israel is a poor general. <laughs> you know, he doesn't really need to worry too much about whether he graduated from West Point or not. You know, I, I just love the line because Pharaoh's going to basically eat the words pretty quickly. But the sense you get here as we start chapter 14 is that this is a precursor. These, these place names are an immediate precursor to the crossing of the sea. Yeah, it's just a, a face value, you know, sort of, of reading of it. I mean, it just sounds that way, and I think that's pretty transparent. You know, tell the people of Israel, turn back, camp by Pihahi Road, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall camp facing it by the sea. Now, if you keep reading in Exodus 14, let's just read verses 5 through 18, that observation that these places, these, again, this concatenation of place names, is leading up to the moment of the crossing, because that's basically what happens here. So Exodus 14, verse 5, and again, just bear with me, there's a point to, to doing it, rehearsing all this. Verse 5 says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done? We've let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot, took his army with him, and took 600 chosen chariots and all other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army. And he overtook them, where? And camped by the sea. Now you'll notice in chapter 14, we have now three references to the sea. None of them say Red Sea. The phrase Red Sea never occurs in chapter 14. It does in 13, and it will in 15, but it doesn't occur in chapter 14. So hold on to that, that little factoid, because you can, you can see, again, this is, this is where the, the, the conflict and the climax is going to happen here. So he overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihahirot in front of Baal Zephon, which is exactly where we read earlier that they were. They were camped. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. This is verse 10. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? 
Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, which is kind of new information. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. It's a nice way of saying, just shut up. God's got this. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? So again, you know, Moses is is evidently praying about this thing. Lord, what are we going to do? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. (laughs) Say what? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea. Notice the references to the sea, the sea, the sea. It's never the Red Sea. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians that they will go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And then it's at this point that the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, which is basically the God slot before, moves and goes behind them. And then the pillar moves as well. Okay, and it lit up, you know, the pillar of fire at night, so on and so forth. And then in verse 21, Moses stretches out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. Again, sea, sea, sea. And the waters were divided. The people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of the fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back on the Egyptians upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. And so, you know, Moses does that. And again, the rest of the story, we, we know. The waters return, you know, drowns the Egyptians. And at the end here, the people feared the Lord. They believed in the Lord, his servant Moses. Now, what's the big deal about the vocabulary? The sea. Okay, just hold on to that. As we read that story, think back to the way it began. Okay? Think back to the way it began. They leave Ramses. They leave, they, you know, leave Sukkot then. That, that was stop number two. They go from Sukkot to Etham. And then from Etham, God says, you know, tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp in front of Pihah, he wrote, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. And then that's when the crisis happens and the deliverance happens. So this sea is right there somewhere where these places are, Pihah, he wrote, Migdal, and Baal Zephon. Okay, that's where this happens. Now let's go to Numbers 33 and listen carefully, and I think you're going to detect a problem here. Numbers 33, beginning in verse 7. And they set out from Etham and turned back to Pihah, he wrote, which is east of Baal Zephon, and they camped before Migdal. And they set out from before Hahirot and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness. And they went a three days journey in the wilderness of Etham and camped at Marah. And they set out from Marah and came to Elim. At Elim, there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they camped there. And they set out from Elim or Elim and camped by the Red Sea. Did you catch that? The sea that they passed through happens before they camp by the Red Sea. So how is it? that we talk about the Israelites passing through the Red Sea. They passed through something else before they ever got there. You know, this is, this is again, something that scholars and many other people have noticed. It's like, how in the world? And it really gets weird when you look at the vocabulary across chapters 13, 14, and 15. In chapter 13, verse 18, there is the phrase Red Sea. It's a generic reference. I'll read it to you again. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea, toward the Yam Suf. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. This is kind of generic. It just says God led the people toward the Red Sea. And so it doesn't really capture the whole itinerary in one verse. It's sort of a catch-all reference, like kind of designating where they're going to wind up. But, you know, it might be useful in light of what we're going to, how we're going to try to unravel this. In chapter 14, the term Yam Suf, Red Sea, is never used. You have verse 2, verse 9, verse 16, verse 21, verse 23. Again, that's not all. It's just Yam, the sea. But when you get to chapter 15, both of those terms are used. And one time they're used in the same verse in parallel. In other words, the crossing for chapter 15 was the crossing in the midst of the sea and in the midst of the Yam Suf, in the midst of the Yam and the midst of the Yam Suf. And it's like, how, how can that be? Because in Numbers 33, they pass through the midst of the sea, Yam, and then they go days before they camp by the Red Sea, the Yam Suf. In Exodus 15, uh, 4 specifically, that's sort of the key text in chapter 15, it uses both Yam and Yam Suf for what was crossed. Let me read it to you. Pharaoh's chariots and his host, he, God, cast into the sea, Yam, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea, Yam Suf. So it's very evident that both terms are referring to the same event in the same place. But yet, Numbers 33 seems to separate them by days. Like, how does that work? What body of water did the Israelites cross, if we're reading Numbers 33, if it wasn't the Red Sea? But then how could it not be the Red Sea if Exodus 15 uses that term in parallel to just the sea? So we kind of have a double conundrum here. How can they be separate but the same? And how can they be different geographical places? Because in Numbers, they're separated by days, but still be the same. So how can they cross something you know, that, it's just weird. 
Like it looks like there are two places at one time, and, and, but they're all still the same. And, you know, again, people have noticed this, and it, it's become kind of a classic problem uh, for this passage. And, and it, it, it relates to, it contributes to, if that's the right word, makes worse would be a better word, but it contributes to the, the problem of after whatever it is they crossed, which way are they going? Because you first have to settle the crossing problem and have it somehow be both the Red Sea, but yet not the Red Sea. And then, you know, once they're out, God's going to tell them, you know, we're going to read about them turning, you know, like, like what, which way do they turn? Because that's going to dictate the route and that's going to dictate what you think about Sinai, the destination. So all these problems sort of, again, you know, are mixed together, which again, I'm hoping you're seeing is, is again, why this is a struggle for interpreters to figure out, and nobody has it figured out, but you know, where'd they go, which way they take, where'd they end up, what's Sinai, what's the Red Sea, what's this other sea? I mean, all these questions that just go into a, just a straightforward reading of, of the passages, the three main passages anyway that talk about the journey. Like, what in the world's going on? Now, Hoffmeyer, uh, James Hoffmeyer, has spent a good deal of effort uh, resolving the problem of the Yam itself. That's kind of how it's known to scholars, the problem of the Yam itself, the problem of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, you know, which is another thing. If it's the Sea of Reeds, it can't be salt water because reeds don't you know, grow in salt. I mean, what, what's going on here? So I'm going to abbreviate uh, Hoffmeyer's treatment here because I think he really does good work here. This is from his, if you want, if you want the book with all the details, and it's, it's quite detailed. Uh, his book, Israel in Egypt, which I have referenced before in other episodes, uh, for those of you who, you know, this is the, the book I always recommend when I get emails like, you know, either asking genuinely or, or trying to, somebody trying to make it sound like they know something when they really don't. But, oh, you know, the Bible's not historical. There's no evidence, you know, that the uh, Exodus narratives, you know, there's, there's like no supporting evidence to, you know, from Egypt that, that makes these at all, you know, possible, blah, blah. Yeah, right. There's only like 200 pages of it here. Read that if you're really interested. Ken Hoffmeyer is an Egyptologist. You know, there, there's a lot of cross-fertilization in Exodus with Egypt, Egyptological material. Yeah, you don't, have, you don't have the Egyptian version of this event, but basically everything about the event you can find in Egypt, Egyptian literature somewhere, and of course, archaeological remains. So again, just as a word to those of you who might, be, I guess, be apologetics-minded, you know, whenever you hear this, try not to laugh, but, but you know, direct people to this book, Israel in Egypt, and he also has one, uh, Hoffman has one, I think it's called Israel in Sinai or something like that, where you get more of it, but this is the book you know, for the Exodus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abbreviate how uh, Hoffmeyer proposes that we resolve this. And I'm going to refer to some things that we will have on the episode webpage, again, to, to help you look. Basically, most of it's going to be pictorial uh, pictures that you can look at later if you're, if you're listening now in a car or something like that, you can go look at them later. But in his book, Israel in Egypt, uh, he gets into this in a lot of detail. Now, his discussion is primarily about the literal geography here. We haven't even gotten to the cosmic geography stuff. He has a little bit in his book on that, but we're going to get into that in a lot more detail next week. So the Yom Suf problem. Hoffmeyer notes that it should be obvious, and I would say it, it should be obvious from the little we've read, that the crossing of the sea is, is at Egypt's eastern border. I mean, that much we know. We've hit the landmarks. Ramses, Sukkot, Etham, and then from Etham, they set out, they turn back, important phrase, they turn back to Piha he wrote. We'll find out what that is in a moment, which is east of Baal and they camp before Migdal. So that, those names do tell us some important things. All of these places are known to be on or immediately adjacent to Egypt's eastern border, the eastern border of Egypt. Now that much is proof positive that the crossing of whatever body of water this is was nowhere near Eilat, the Gulf of Aqaba and Midian. It is nowhere near that. It's on Egypt's eastern border. The crossing basically occurs when they're getting out of Egypt, I mean, ba basically right at the beginning of the whole trip. Now, to be fair, those who argue that Sinai, you know, Mount Sinai, is east of the Gulf of Aqaba in Midian somewhere, they don't necessarily tie that view of Sinai to a, a specific place of the crossing of the Red Sea, but some do. But just, just so that you understand, you know, if someone you know, holds to Mount Sinai and Midian, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have the, the Red Sea crossing at the right prong of the Red Sea, the, the Gulf of Aqaba. The left prong is the Gulf of Suez, okay? Where, this, where the crossing actually happened, and again, the, the geography itself tells us we can know this with absolute certainty. The crossing occurred on Egypt's eastern border. That's where these places are, and they are all known, okay? Anyone on the internet or anywhere else that tells you that the Israelites crossed anywhere in the right prong of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, that like the crossing at Nueva or some other such crossing to get the Israelites into Midian from Mount Sinai, you can safely ignore any crossing view of the right prong. It completely ignores everything that is known about these place names. Again, that doesn't mean that you've argued against Mount Sinai in Midian. There, there are other problems with that, as we, as we talked about. But there are some who tie these two things together. I mentioned the Nueva crossing. You know, I, that was associated with, I believe, Ron, Ron Wyatt. Um, and and you know, it's on the internet. I mean, you're, if, you, if you Google this, you're going to run into this view. This view, textually, is not possible because of the geographical names. So any view of the crossing on the right prong of the Red Sea is just not correct. I mean, I, don't waste your time even thinking about it. You know, and you're, you're going to get some you know, goofy archaeology that tries to prove this and that. Look, all you need to do is go read the itinerary and look up these place names and academic sources, and you're going to find out they're all known and they're all on Egypt's eastern border. So we're, we're done with that. Let's go back to the actual Yam Suf problem. Hoffmeyer takes Exodus 15:4, where both Yam and Yam Suf are used in parallelism, to describe the body of water that was crossed. Now, his hypothesis, you know, listen to this carefully. His hypothesis is that what is being described as a body of water, with the word Yam, sea in English translations, 
that that body, whatever that was, in ancient times was connected to what we know as the Red Sea, what the biblical writers would call Yam Suf. If you can picture in your mind, and again, I have maps on the, on the, the episode page you know, that you can look at. If you can picture in mind the two, the two forks of the Red Sea, the left forks, the Gulf of Suez, it points, as it were, upward toward the eastern border of, of Egypt's delta region. In ancient times, there were a string of lakes extending from that tip of the Gulf of Suez northward to form, again, part of like a borderline uh, of Egypt. And they were connected. They were either connected naturally or they were connected by a series of canals. We're going to come back to the canal thing because that's going to be, become important. Therefore, Hofmeyer argues, Israel could cross one of these bodies of water. And there are just a bunch of them dotted upward from the, the tip of the Gulf of Suez all the way into the delta. Egypt could cross one of these lakes. They were essentially lakes. And the word yam can refer to any body of water, even a river in the Old Testament. When you cross, when Israel crossed one of those lakes, they technically, to the mind of an ancient person, would also be crossing the Red Sea because all of those things are connected to the Red Sea. They're not the Red Sea proper, but they are nevertheless tethered to it by a series of waterways. So in this view, sea and Red Sea are one and the same, but they're also different. The sea is just one of the smaller bodies of water connected to the left tip of what we know as the Red Sea. The left tip is the Gulf of Suez. Now, Hofmeyer, to articulate this and defend it, draws heavily on the work of geophysical surveys that for him, and I, I'll say, you know, just tell you, for me as well, I think, I think this, is, this is how this needs to be thought of. I think Hofmeyer does really good work here. You know, these, these surveys for him and for me explain references in a variety of ancient sources to a string of lakes that at various times in Egyptian history were connected by canals. So this is, modern geophysical surveys have, have detected these things even thousands of years after they're dried up. You can actually see them in satellite photography. And so there's, a, there's an important article that Hofmeyer draws on, and it's by uh, Amahai Sneh, that's S-N-E-H, Tuvia Weisbrod, and Ithamar Parat, and the article is entitled Evidence for an Ancient Egyptian Frontier Canal. It's an important description, by the way, Frontier Canal. This is part of the border. Evidence for an Ancient Egyptian Frontier Canal, the remnants of an artificial waterway discovered in the northeastern Nile Delta, uh, may have formed part of the barrier called the Shore of Egypt in ancient texts. It's a long title. Uh, it's from American Scientists, number 63, uh, volume 63, number five. This is 1975, September, October 1975. Now, I've posted pictures from this article in a PDF on the episode page. I can't post the whole article. It's not publicly accessible. Again, I can put it in the protected folder, but I've at least put pictures, a couple of the relevant pictures in the article that will help you see what, what the satellite photographs show. So this 1975 article referenced by Hofmeyer, again, is really an important piece of work. Now, there's another uh, article on this that can also get you some good pictures. That's much later. Hofmeyer's book was written after that first article I mentioned, but before this one, the second article. And the second article is publicly accessible. So we'll have a link to this on the episode webpage. And that's by John Cooper. Egypt's Nile Red Sea Canals, subtitle Chronology, Location, Seasonality, and Function. This is pages 195 to 209 in a book called Connected Hinterlands, Proceedings of the Red Sea Project, Volume 4, held at the University of Southampton in September 2008. Uh, it's part of the Bar International Series and part of the Society for Arabian Studies monograph series. But this, is, this chapter is publicly accessible, so we'll have a link there. Now, again, to summarize all that, what you have, and what Hofmeyer is going to defend, again, I think he does a good job of it, I think this is the answer to the, to the, to the OMSOF problem, is that you've got the Gulf of Suez, the left tip, what we think of as the left tip of the Red Sea. But extending from that, you have a series of lakes that are connected, again, by canals. So Israel, Israel crossed one of those bodies of water, one of those lakes, and then they're going to turn, and then they're going to camp somewhere by the, the actual Red Sea. Okay, So you can have crossing the sea before you get to the Red Sea. This is how you approach it. So I'll, I'm going to read a little bit from Hofmeyer. He says this. In the early 1970s, a team of scientists of the Geological Survey of Israel, while working in the Sinai Peninsula during Israel's occupation of the territory east of the Suez Canal, discovered the remains of what they believed was a canal that ran along Egypt's border with the Sinai. Aerial photography and on-site study led to this identification by the leaders of the team, Amihai Sna and Tuvia Weisbrod. The width of this canal constantly measures 70 meters at the top and was probably tapered toward the bottom where it was thought to be around 20 meters wide. So that's a, that's a pretty substantial canal. This makes it wider than the Suez Canal when cut in 1873. The recently discovered channel is calculated to be two or three meters deep. So what's left of this, you know, it dries up and it's going to fill up with sand, but it's still detectable, again, with, with satellite you know, photography. What's left of it isn't very deep, but it's, it's there. Back to Hofmeyer. Hof, Hofmeyer writes, the Israeli geologists associated with the newly discovered canal with the one shown on a relief, or they associated the newly discovered canal with one shown on a relief of Seti I. Again, Seti I, circa 1300 BC. Again, Hofmeyer's late data, but this doesn't really factor into earlier late data. It's just a canal. The canal is actually much older than, than either of the dates. So the geologists thought, hey, you know, here we got this canal. And they remembered, or they were found, that there's a reference to a canal on Egypt's border in one of the inscriptions of Seti I at the Karnak Temple in Thebes. Hofmeyer writes, in the midst of the waterway of that inscription, that, that relief, that drawing, in the midst of the waterway, a hieroglyphic label reads, Ta Denit. Sir Alan Gardner commented on this scene in 1920 and noted that the building complex depicted on the relief, again, on the, on the piece of art, to the left of the canal is labeled Ketem en Charu, which is translated the Fortress of Charu. Concurrently, the earliest reference to this fort by this name is in the animals of Tutmos III. The name of the canal was Ta Denit, clearly meaning, quote, the dividing waters, and so-called because they sundered Egypt from the desert. Weisbrod and Sna believe that the history of the canal might go back to the 12th dynasty because of the references concerning Sinue's journey back from Palestine by boat to Ij Tawi, the capital at the time. And then Hofmeyer goes into the text and talks about you know, commentary on it. 
Hofmeyer, you know, winds up his discussion by asking this on page 169 of his book. If indeed a canal existed along Egypt's border with Sinai during the New Kingdom, and the evidence does support this view, it seems logical to conclude that it would have been an impediment to the Israelites in their departure from Egypt. Thus it must be asked, is there any reference or allusion to this canal in the Exodus narratives? And if they're leaving Ramses and then Sukkot and Etham, they should be running into this waterway and the lakes that it connects. So is there any reference to that? And Hofmeyer thinks the answer to this question is, you betcha, yes. He writes, the itinerary of the departing Hebrews from Egypt includes P. Ha Hirot in Exodus 14.2 and Numbers 33.7. Scholars have long attempted to find an Egyptian etymology, Egyptian source origin for P. Ha Hirot because of the initial element P, which in Egyptian would be per. That element is suggestive of Egyptian toponyms, Egyptian place names such as P. Ramses, P. Thom, and P. Besafet, just to name a few. There's a lot of these. So when, when scholars, let me stop there, when scholars saw P. Ha Hirot, they found this, this is probably a term that comes from Egyptian. Hofmeyer proceeds to discuss why an Egyptian etymology fails, and it does, uh, basically because of what comes after the P, that is ha he wrote, which does not conform well to Egyptian for linguistic reasons. Again, if you've had Hebrew, when I say ha he wrote, you should be thinking definite article plus a feminine plural. Because it's just, this is a Hebrew term. This is a Semitic term. So I, you know, I'm amazed that they kept looking at Egypt for as long as they did, and it's basically because of the, the P, P-I word that, that came in front of it. But basically, there aren't any seasoned trained Egyptologists now who would disagree with Hofmeyer that, that says, look, this is not an Egyptian term. Every, everybody more or less agrees with that now. There really aren't any good equivalents. And again, if you know Hebrew, ha he wrote should just scream Hebrew to you, just a normal you know, feminine plural noun. So Hofmeyer goes on to reference the work of Albright here back in 1948, who suggested, and I think this is pretty clear, he suggested a meaning for P ha he wrote as this, the mouth of the canals. P is mouth, he wrote, you know, it's, it's canals. Okay, that, that's what it is. Hofmeyer proceeds to link the phrase with the canals that connect various bodies of water, lakes, from the tip of the Gulf of Suez that form part of Egyptian's eastern border. This makes a lot of sense. It explains the dual reference to the sea, again, one of these bodies of water, and then the Red Sea later on, how they can be the same, but yet different. And in so doing, it explains why both terms are used interchangeably for the body of water through which is your past. Yes, you're, you're, okay, you're crossing a lake. Okay, I got it. But it's part of the Red Sea, kind of technically, because it's joined by all these canals. And this is how they would have thought about it. So if you go back to the itinerary, you've got Ramses, Sukkot, Etham. Then they set out from Etham, turned back to Pihah, he wrote, which is east of Baal Zephon, and they camped before Migdal. Now, the text here says, speaks of a turning back after leaving Etham to Pihah, he wrote, the mouth of the canal. So they set out. You know, they're, they're going, and then they, for some reason, God directs them to turn in a, in a certain direction so that they're, they're at this water border, okay? And we know what the purpose is. God knows that Pharaoh's going to look at this and snicker, and like the old Brenner say, the God of Israel is a poor general, because God is going to get glory over Pharaoh. <laughs> I don't need to be a good general, okay? I'm God. You know, it, so th- this is a setup. The whole thing is a setup. You know, and then they, they pass through, again, one of these bodies of water, they pass through the sea, and then they're going to turn, and they're going to go for a few days, and they're going to hit this place and that place, and eventually they're going to camp by the Red Sea. So what we know for sure is that the crossing is at one of these lakes, and there, there are a number of candidates. You know, Hofmeyer in his book, he goes through all the candidates, you know, Lake Timsa, Lake Bella, you know, there's, there's three or four of these. You know, and, and he's like anybody else, you know, he has his favorite and whatnot. But, but that isn't important. What they cross, even the canal. I mean, if you, look at, if you look back at the canal, I mean, the measurements of the canal, lots of people would have drowned just in the canal. I mean, this is a, a meaningful, a serious crossing. It has to be divided. You don't just walk across it like you're, like you're going across a sandbar or something. This is a serious obstacle. It's a lethal obstacle. Because the waters are going to part, the Egyptians are going to go down in there, and then they're going to get drowned when God closes the thing up. But it's not the Red Sea proper. It's one of these extension bodies of water. So we have the crossing, and then we, have, we run into some questions. Okay, Numbers 33.8. They set out from before Ahi wrote and passed in the midst of the sea into the wilderness. You have to ask, well, what direction are they going? What direction are they going? They get through. They get through the barrier, pass through the midst of the sea, into the wilderness. So now they're out in the desert. They went a three days journey into the wilderness of Etham and camped at Marah. They set out from Marah and came to Elim. At Elim, there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there. And they set out from Elim and camped by the Red Sea. Now, here's the question. Think about your map again. You've got the two prongs of the Red Sea, as we, we know it, as we refer to it now. They're crossing some body of water that extends from the left one, the Gulf of Suez. They get through. The Egyptians are drowned. Now they're out in the wilderness. Do they turn south, or do they go more or less straight across the, the wilderness? And the answer is, nobody knows. If you believe in the traditional site of Mount Sinai, which is way, way south, Jebel Musa, you're going to say, oh, they must have turned south. If you don't believe that that's where Mount Sinai is, you're going to say, oh, they must have just gone straight across. Because after all, there are caravan trails there. They could follow a caravan trail. And there are caravan trails there. There have been since, you know, thousands of years, you know? See, that's the question. Once you get past the crossing, where are they going? Because from this point on, while the early place names are known with certainty, none of what follows is known with certainty. And, and frankly, there aren't, there's only really even a guess at one or two of them. And it's nothing more than a guess. So here we are again. You know, what? How, how do we take this information and know where they end up? Now, Levine's, just to illustrate this for you, Levine's commentary on Numbers 33, this is Baruch Levine in his Anchor Bible series. His, I just want you to, it's not just Mike saying, nobody knows where in the world these things are. This is Levine's commentary. He says, from Etham, you know, and you know, Pitham you know, at the beginning, 
The Israelites turn back to Piha. He wrote, again, this is the setup. God's putting them in, a, in an impossible situation so that he can show Pharaoh who's God. And they turn back to Piha, he wrote, which is facing Baal Zephon and camping before Migdal. None of these you know, three toponyms has been positively identified, but the name Migdal means watchtower fortress, and that's West Semitic rather than Egyptian. In context, it's certainly located in the Egyptian Delta region. The name Migdal appears once in the El Amarna letters, but again, we don't know exactly where this particular tower was. As for Piha, he wrote, and this is the key, it is likewise specifically unidentified, like we don't know exactly where in the network of canals they crossed, but it's somewhere in the Eastern Delta region, and it appears to represent a Hebraized rendering of an original Akkadian designation. I didn't mention the Akkadian equivalent, but he's correct. P. Kheritu, the mouth of the canals. So he's saying, look, we don't know exactly where, but all these places are in the Egyptian Delta, the Eastern border of the Egyptian Delta. Baal Zephon, also unidentified, again, as with precision, was known, a well-known syro canaanite deity, or Baal, whose cult was imported into Egypt. At least three Baal Zephon sanctuaries have been found in Northern Egypt, in Memphis, Toppenes, and Mount Cassius as Ras Kasrun. According to Betok, who's the guy who excavated Avaris, you know, the, the Pith of the Ramses you know, location, the site associated with that. According to Betok, a temple at El, the Tel El Daba, just south of Kantir, was dedicated to Baal. Again, this is all in the, in the Eastern Delta. Every, all of it. He takes note of a place called Migdal. This is Betok again. There's a place called Migdal up there, located near Wadi Tumilat, which is mentioned in Cairo Papyrus 31169, blah, 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 blah. And, and Brut Levine says this, this all indicates a location in the Eastern Delta area. Again, this is, that's what we know for sure. There is no crossing anywhere except in the Eastern Delta border. That's why I'm saying, if you go on the internet and you go, oh, I want to learn about the crossing of the Red Sea, if you read anything else but somewhere on Egypt's Eastern Delta border region, it's wrong. It's just this. He goes in further into Numbers 33 and says, you know, Marah, you know, Levine starts talking about Marah. He postulates a place where the water is, quote, brackish, because Marah means bitter, and says, some have suggested Marah is Ayan Havara, 47 miles south of Suez. Well, you know why they're picking that, that location? Because it's south. And the traditional view of Sinai is that it's south of where they cross. That's the only reason. You know, and then all of the other sites, Dovka, Alush, Rephidim, and Sinai that show up in Numbers 33, Levine says, we don't know where they are. So what you have is after the crossing, you have a situation where the place names, in any view, not just a view you like or don't like, but in any view, they are all speculation. And again, I'm hoping to see how it matters. Once they break through, once God brings them through, you got two choices. And you're going to have a map on the episode website for this. And, and where people think they went, where, you know, is directly related to where people, well, let me say it this way, where people think or try to argue. Let's put it that way. That's even better. Where people try to argue these other place names are in Numbers 33 depends entirely on where they think Sinai is. And most people will say, well, Sinai's down there in, in the, you know, in that, you know, near St. Catherine's Monastery, Jebel Musa, you know, way, way, way down there between the forks. So it's obvious, quote unquote, obvious that we should expect to find these places moving southward after the crossing. Well, it's actually not obvious because you're letting one preconceived conclusion dictate your methodology and your conclusions for the other stuff. But the, other, the alternative views do the same thing. You have to realize that everybody's in the same boat. Some people are going to, you know, say, well, Har, you know, Har Karkom is Mount Sinai. Again, and, and because that's Mount Sinai, then they went directly across. Or they're going to say, oh, Mount Sinai is somewhere, you know, in that Edom you know, border with Midian area, like we talked about in earlier episodes. So if you like that view, you're going you're gonna to take them straight across. If you, if you think Mount Sinai is, is east of the Gulf of Aqaba over in Midian proper, you're going to take them straight across. That's what you're going to do. Your view of the location of Mount Sinai will dictate where you look for these place names and how to defend and try to defend certain sites as being these places. But the reality is nobody knows. Well, let's jump into part two. Um, again, this is just sort of, it's going to be supplemental but it's going to be new stuff. So, you know, see, now I'm tempted to say, this is kind of like what we, Trey and I were talking about off the air, like, you know, taking something familiar and then adding new stuff to it. So I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but I think, you know, I wanted to add this because it's just, it's something that I've come across in the past and I find really interesting, again, a way to sort of just look at what's a real familiar story from a quite a, you know, a different but related you know, angle. So in part one, and again, if you haven't listened to part one, it's not like you have to listen to part one for this, but I, I still recommend you do that. In part one, we talked, you know, we focused kind of on the Yam Suf problem, the Sea of Reeds you know, or, or Red Sea problem. Like, what does that phrase mean? Why do we have a sea and a Red Sea that are separate, but yet the same? And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and that problem is linked to ambiguities in, you know, physical place names in Exodus 14, in, in, the, in the itinerary, the narrative. And other passages, namely Numbers 33 is the other big one. So that, that's what we spent our time on last time. It's sort of the physical geography and its ambiguities and its problems. So this time, though, I want to look at the Exodus event uh, broadly from a cosmic geographical perspective, uh, mainly, mostly from the, the way an Egyptian would, would be thinking. And then, you know, kind of, again, how the writer, who I, I, would, I would think, certainly, I mean, certainly if there's mosaic material here, and I've, I'm certainly not opposed to that. I'm not a, like I've said many times before, I'm not a, a Moses wrote every word of the Torah person, but I'm not a, I'm not a JEDP or either. I don't, I don't see any specific impediment you know, that we couldn't have a mosaic hand in lots of places in the Pentateuch. If it was, then the Egyptian connection is obvious. Even if it's not, this is just going to be part of the larger Egyptian worldview that, you know, would have been known in the broader ancient Near East among people who could write, you know, literate, the literate class, the scribal class. So I want to get into, again, how the Egyptians essentially sort of looked at their world and the way they viewed the 
the relationship of their gods, specifically solar deities, uh, to the to that world, and then how that sort of informs, or you know, could possibly inform, reading the Exodus crossing again, just like the plagues, as a theological polemic. Now, Hebrew Bible scholars occasionally traverse into this territory. It, it is not frequent, though. The first place I ran into this was uh, a Journal of Biblical Literature article that was republished in a book um, by Bernard Batto, that's B-A-T-T-O, and it was entitled The Read C. I've never had Latin here, so I'm gonna, I might butcher this for someone who has had Latin, but the Requia Scott in Pace, you know, it's sort of Latin, I think, for rest in peace. So like he's putting this to rest. And Bado takes a skeptical view about you know, this actually being a, a literal historical event. And he sees this chapter and the whole episode as sort of historicized mythology or theology. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a theological polemic only. It has not, no bearing on, on historicity. Of course, that, that is not you know, my view and the view of many others, but that's where Bado is coming from. Nevertheless, this was a really interesting article. I'm not going to you know, necessarily agree with all of what Bato said. And Hoffmeyer, uh, who we referenced a lot in part one, does interact briefly uh, with Bato. It's one of the few times I've seen Bato's work referenced in, in studies on Exodus. But I found it really interesting. And that's going to be the, the, the first sort of foray into this. I'm gonna trans- we're going to talk about Bato's uh, thesis a little bit. And then we're going to transition to something more recent. Bato's article was in 1983, so it's over 30 years old. And this idea that I'm going to describe what, that he writes about wasn't original to him either. It, he actually picks up on some things. Uh, from a 1965 article by uh, Snaith, and S-N-A-I-T-H, uh, the Amsuf, Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea. That was in Vita's Testamentum. Bato's article was in Journal of Biblical Literature, uh, again, in 1983. So this has been around for a while, but it's, it's just not referenced very much. Now, what, what Bato does, and Snaith before him, again, to, to a certain extent, the argument is that the word suf, yam suf, okay, which we've talked about extensively here, should not be read as yam suf, but it should instead be read as yam sof. Okay, that would be a different word in Hebrew. You have to recall, Hebrew, again, has no vowels. Originally, it used certain consonants to mark vowel sounds. One of those consonants is the vav, uh, which can be the vowel u or the vowel o. Okay, so yam suf or yam sof. Everybody takes it as yam suf, but Bato, again, following Snaith, had this idea that, well, you know, maybe we've, we've been misreading this. Maybe it, it, it said we should be vocalizing it yam sof. And the word sof means end. So it'd be the sea at the end of the land, or the sea which is at the end. Again, if, if, if images of uh, I don't know, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, you know, with Reaper Chief the Mouse and Aslan, you know, the sea that, that, that's at the end, you know, of all things. And then you know, there's this transition to, I guess, the eternal state in, in, in Narnian, you know, thinking. This is kind of the idea, uh, cosmically, that, that the Egyptians looked at their land as being, again, special. It, it was Egypt. Everything else was the wild place, uncivilized, you know, just, you know, chaotic mess. And, and the, the wonder that was Egypt is, is something that is special. It's under the dominion of Egypt's gods. It's the place they want to live. It's not that they don't rule elsewhere, as we're going to find out. They, the Egyptians thought they ruled basically anything you could see. But you know, Egypt was special. It was a, a divine land, again. And so when you cross the border, when you, when you left Egypt at this, you know, we, we talked about in part one, the, the, this body of water that extended, one of these lakes that extended from the Gulf of Suez, the left prong of the Red Sea, you were leaving this wonderful place and you were, you were moving past the sea, which is at the end, you know, the border, and you're moving off into chaos. So there's a cosmic concept here. Now, you know, this is consistent with, you know, Hoffmeyer's notion that you have this string of lakes, you know, that marks the Egypt's, you know, eastern border and all that. So there, there's, this isn't different in that respect, but sort of how it would have been perceived is what's different. You know, Bato, you know, by arguing this, you know, he, he wants to say, well, the story is what it is just because, you know, you have this notion. We don't have a literal, you know, crossing of the sea. We don't have a miracle here. But what we have is we have a bunch of, you know, vagabond Israelites leaving Egypt. And, and you know, it's this, they're going off into cosmic chaos, you know, that kind of thing. And so he tries to, to develop the, the content of the chapter along these, you know, mythocosmic themes. Okay, that, that's, that's what he's trying to do. Now, you, you might say, well, where does, I mean, is there any real justification for this? You know, one of the, the places that Bateau picks up on, it, it, he suggests that you know, one of, at least one of the Septuagint translators, you know, whoever the guy was that was assigned to Exodus, or maybe there was more than one guy assigned to Exodus, you know, he's going to translate it one way, and then there are going to be other guys that are translating other parts where Yom Suf occurs. And, the, and whoever had First Kings nineteen twenty six, okay, in Greek, it actually translates what we would think of as Yom Suf. It translates it as though it was Yom Suf. It really does that. He translates the phrase in Greek as eskates thalases, the end of the sea, or the edge of the sea. You can even translate it the end sea. The Greek word for red, there are several of them, uh, eruthros, uh, porakes, poros, those aren't used in 1 Kings 19.26. Now, eruthros is used elsewhere for Yom Suf, Red Sea. You know, and also, if you're paying attention, the Septuagint translator did not translate it to Sea of Reeds. He didn't use the Greek word for reeds either. They do use the, the color red, Red Sea, or here in 1 Kings 19.26, the sea at the end. Um, so Bato you know, looks at this, at this one place in the Septuagint and says, hmm, you know, that's an interesting idea. Maybe that's, that's the way we should look at this phrase everywhere, you know, that, that's associated with this, this episode in, in, in biblical history. Maybe that's what we should do. You might be wondering at this point uh, where the sea got its name, because if the, the Septuagint translator does, in fact, uh, use the, the, the Greek word, one of the Greek words for the color red, so that you know, there had to be somebody in antiquity that would call this body of water the Red Sea. If you're wondering you know, who was the first person to do that, nobody really knows, and some have theorized that the name comes from the fact that Edom, 
okay, the, the, you know, the people group, the place of Edom controlled the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the, the, the point of reference in First Kings, um, you know, elsewhere, uh, when, it when it mentions the Red Sea. So Edom was associated with red dirt. Okay, if, you, if you look at pictures of Edom, if you, if you Google Edom, like red clay, red, you know, red soil, red dirt, you're going to see that a lot of the country is, is reddish. In color, and since they once had control over one of these tips, somebody, you know, people have theorized, well, maybe that's where it's got, it got its name. It was the sea that the Edomites control, the Red Sea, you know, just sort of playing off the, the color of the Edomite land. And of course, Edom with Seir and you know Esau, Esau, you know, being the, the, the forefather of the Edomites, Esau was hairy and red, you know, all, all these sort of associations. So you know, nobody really knows for sure why it got its name. But again, in Greek, the, the word for the color red is used of sea. But in this one place that Bato, you know, seizes on, or at least offers, you know, by way of a defense of his suggestion, we have this sea at the end. So. Again, he uses this to argue for a, a historicized myth in Exodus 14. You know, again, he's, he's not looking for any, any historicity here. The Israelites, again, they leave Egypt. They move out farther than the eastern delta border, a border which is marked, again, by the Gulf of Suez and its canals, just like we discussed in part one. They leave you know, the, the, this wonderful paradise of Egypt. They venture out into the chaos of the wilderness. So it's, it's like this, this uh, you know, mythic voyage into the unknown, you know, that, that sort of thing. So that's it. You know, that, that's how he, he takes this, this one nugget and he starts thinking about mytho-cosmic associations with land. I th you know, just to comment on Bateau, I mean, actually, you could see, say the opposite, too, that the meaning of the cosmic geography would be more compelling if they actually did pass through a body of water at the border. If it really, if it really was conceived of as the sea of the end, this thing that sort of prevents icky foreigners you know, from getting into Egypt, uh, or you know, if this thing you know, sort of marks the, the, the gateway into this wonderful realm of the gods you know, that called Egypt, well, to, to basically have a foreign deity, Yahweh, just split that thing right down the middle, and you walk over it like on dry land, that would be pretty dramatic. That would basically establish, well, who's really in control here? And, and, and you might be fearing the lands beyond Egypt, but you really ought to fear the God you know, who has dominion you know, of, of this place called Canaan, which is eventually where they're going to go. But that same God is in control of your lands as well. I mean, that, that, again, that would speak a lot more loudly if you know, we, we didn't divorce you know, the historicity you know, from, from the episode. But again, I mean, you, you could say that. You could look at what Bato's doing and say that. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. Now, Hoffmeyer ultimately in his book rejects the idea uh, that, that Bato's putting out you know, the C at the end. And he largely does so because of the inconsistency of the Septuagint. I mean, we really only have this one place, you know, where it, it looks like the translator saw the Hebrew text and thought, yeah, I'm so see at the end. You know, so not much has been really made of this. So let's segue into some more recent work, though. I mean, Bato's observation is interesting. You know, there, there might be something going on there, you know, see at the end, even though you would think if that's the way a lot of people thought about it, you, you would at least get it a few more times in the Septuagint. Again, so, you know, Hoffmeyer's criticism is, is, is legitimate, you know. But there are other ways to look at, at you know, the cosmic geography here that, that don't have anything to do with the phrase Yam Suf or Yam Sof. And I'm going to reference two articles here, and I've uploaded these into the protected folder in case anybody is interested. Uh, yes, you know, it's going to be peppered with hieroglyphs and all this stuff, but I, he transliterates everything. And again, you can still get something, something out of both of these works, but they're both by the same guy. And I've actually referenced uh, his dissertation in an earlier episode on chronology. But the, the name is Julian Cooper, that's J-U-L-I-E-N, and one of the articles is, is entitled The Geographic and Cosmo-Geographic Expression, this is an Egyptian phrase, ta Necher. And that's from the Bulletin of the Australian Center for Egyptology, Volume 22. That's a 2011 publication. And then six years later, uh, the same author wrote uh, a second article. And again, this one's in the protective folder as well. It's called Between This World and the Duat. That's another Egyptian term, uh, basically for the netherworld. Uh, the, Between This World and the Duat, the land of Wetenet and Egyptian cosmogeography or cosmography of the Red Sea. And that's from a book. It's not from a journal. The book is called The Cultural Manifestations of Religious Experience, Studies in Honor of Boyo Akenge, who was a pretty well-known Egyptologist. And that's 2017. So I want to spend most of the time on the first one here. Uh, this phrase, uh, Taha Necher, which you know, shows up a good deal um, in Egyptian texts. And there's been, if you get Cooper's article, the 2011 one, you read through it, he gives you sort of the whole history of scholarship here on the work that's been done. But I'm going to read, again, some excerpts from Cooper's article on Taha Necher. Like, what does that mean? Because it is connected to the Sinai and the Red Sea and then a few other things. He writes, the Egyptian expression, Taha Necher, which means the gods, or, you know, God's land, G-O-D apostrophe S. So the land of some particular god. We'll talk about who that might be in a bit. The Egyptian expression ta nature or God's land, is an enigmatic geographic phrase which represents a particular conception of the geography to the east of Egypt. Okay, there's, that, that ties in with what we're talking about here, the eastern border, east of Egypt. This toponym, or place name, is an exceptional label in Egyptian geographic and cosmographic terminology, as it amalgamates two basic ideas, that of a deity, nature, and the earthly concept of land, ta, ta nature, okay, the land of the god, the god's land. The presence of kaset, the kaset classifier, now again, just let me comment on what he means here. Hieroglyphs, Hieroglyphic Egyptian is, is a pseudo-alphabetic language. You've got certain hieroglyphs that make one sound like an alphabet. You've got a few hundred that make two sounds or three sounds. And you also have hieroglyphs that don't make any sound. They are like cheat, you know, little, little cheat hieroglyphs. Uh, a scribe would use a hieroglyph at the end of a word to classify it. They're called determinatives. So if you had an Egyptian word and your little determinative was a picture of a guy with his hand to his mouth, then that's the scribe's way of telling you, well, this word has something to do maybe with speaking or eating, something like that. So Egyptian would use you know, hieroglyphs to classify terms, which are really helpful when you're trying to 
you know, learn vocabulary and things like that. Um, it kind of helps you cheat a little bit. Well, Cooper says the presence, well, when you get Tom Etcher, there is something called the Cossett classifier determinative is used. It, it's, it's, a, it's like a hilly horizon. And it means foreign land. So it classifies Ta Netcher as being some geographic place outside of Egypt. Right? And he says this determines the phrase that the phrase indicates an expression that is the label for a unit of space outside the Nile Valley. Continuing with, continuing with Cooper, he writes, the debates surrounding this toponym, Ta Netcher, as in all studies of ancient toponymy, usually center around two important lines of inquiry. The most common is the debate of localization, that is the precise location or area a toponym refers to. The other, no less important debate, is that of semantics, namely what the toponym means in an etymological sense, but also what it means to the contemporary culture. As Ta Netcher clearly communicates a theological conception of geography, it is important that the religious implications of this word be studied, particularly the identity of the deity in question, and what is exactly meant by a land of, of the god, or a, the god's land. And he, he writes, this article presents the results of textual lexicographic study of all the documents from the Old Kingdom, that's the Pyramid Age, to the end of the New Kingdom, which contain the phrase Ta Netcher. So this is a pretty thorough article. It's not, it's not hugely long, but it's, it's very thorough. And as far as what his conclusions are, I'm just going to read you a few snippets of you know, what he discovers. So he writes, Numerous texts associate Ta Netcher with toponyms in West Asia. Uh, that's, that might be a foreign phrase. Let me just break in here. But uh, you know, Egyptians referred to people from Canaan or Palestine as Asiatics. So West Asia to Egyptian is the, the, the landmass of Canaan and the landmass between you know, the forks of the Red Sea, the landmass that we call the Negev, all that stuff. It's not like China or something like that. So don't get thrown off by the term Asia. So back to Cooper. He says, numerous texts associate Ta Netcher with toponyms in West Asia. These toponyms seem to cluster around northern Syria, Palestine and are most commonly associated with text narrating the procurement of ash wood. That's not ash like we think of, but it's, it's an, an Egyptian term. So a particular kind of wood is where they would go to get it. The Middle Kingdom, Wadi Hamamat inscription of Henu, mentioned above earlier in what he was writing, also suggests that the Red Sea shore was part of Tan Etchard, part of the god's land. Two inscriptions at Sarabit el Kadem suggest that the Sinai Peninsula may also have been part of the god's land. Although Tan Etchard is not geographically defined here, the association of God's land with the gemstone at turquoise suggests that the Sinai was within the borders, the boundaries of God's land, in this Ta Netcher thing. From these sources, it is clear that the God's land then refers to a wide arc of lands which are east, northeast, and southeast of Egypt, including the eastern desert, Punt, and again, you know, this Asia, according to how the Egyptians would per perceive this, stretching from the southern Red Sea to northern Syria. So basically, if you can think of a map of Egypt, you get out of the eastern delta, it's the Negev, it's Canaan, it's the Sinai Peninsula, all that. The Egyptian, to an Egyptian, would have been the god's land. It's under the dominion of one of their deities. Okay? So they're, they not only view their own place as sort of a cosmic location, but they have this, also this concept that all this other stuff, especially you know, moving out east, is under the dominion of you know, one of their gods, or basically any solar deity, as we're going to find out. Now that's interesting because, you know, of course, in the biblical storyline, none of that is the case. And in fact, the exact opposite is. This is where Yahweh is going to encounter the Israelites, certain patriarchs. Of course, there's a land of Canaan. So it's diametrically opposed to you know, how an Israelite would look at things, uh, really you know, 180 degrees away. So a few more comments from Cooper, uh, the cosmography of Tan Etcher. And in this section of his article, he's talking about religious texts in particular. He said these religious texts use the God's land in this phrase, Tan Etcher, in terms of cosmography. That is, how Egyptians map the general features of the universe, including heaven and earth, usually relating it to the solar cycle. Tan Etcher is associated with the eastern horizon. Now, you should already be thinking about the sun. The sun rises in the east, okay? Ta Netcher is associated with the Eastern Horizon and the home in Egyptian theology of the Eastern Souls. Now, this, this has something to do for an Egyptian with, you know, what, what happened during the sun. So let me, let me just break in here. If this, the sun rises in the east every morning, and then it traverses the sky, goes through the sky, and you can see it, and then it descends, you know, on the opposite horizon. Okay, we, we talk about the sun going down. We know, we know the sun isn't really going down, but this is the language we use, the ancients used. So it rises, goes across the sky, and then goes down, and everything becomes dark. Well, for an Egyptian, that meant that the deity, they, they looked at the sun as a deity, Ra, or again, they had different names uh, you know, for this, that the deity was entering the netherworld when, when everything went dark. And that doesn't mean that he was going to hell. It just meant he was going to the, the, the realm where the, where the god normally lives, you know, the, the spiritual world. Then you know, he's doing stuff over there. And then the next morning, he comes out of his domain, the domain of the spiritual world, and he traverses the sky again and keeps an eye on everything going on in Egypt and everywhere else. Okay? So when, when the sun rises to an Egyptian, it's leaving, the god is leaving the spiritual world. And so they also had this concept of the eastern souls. Basically, those those human souls that essentially get to live with the deity in the spiritual world. This, the, the East was where they were as well. So that, that's where you get this idea of the, the home of the Eastern souls. So back to Cooper, he says this suggests a strong connection between the phrase Ta Netcher, the God's land, and the phenomenon of sunrise. Taken together, all these assertions appear to confirm Quince's theory, as is somebody he talked about earlier, that Ta Netcher was, if not equivalent to, then strongly associated with the Eastern horizon. You were standing in Egypt. This is me breaking in now. If you were standing in Egypt, you're looking to the east where the sun rises. You're going to notice something if you do it every day. You're going to notice that the sun rises a little bit differently, in a little bit different place every day. It seems to like move. And again, we know this because of you know, the, the shape of the earth. The earth is round and it's tilted at an angle and the sun hits it differently and you've got the equinoxes and all this kind of stuff. Again, to an Egyptian, 
it looked like the the gateway essentially that the the deity emerges from the spiritual world in the east that, that, that it was really wide i mean it, it could range this is why you have ton etcher referred to all the way as north as syria palestine and all the way as south as punt which is in africa you know, considerably a far ways down the, down the nile because again if you were an egyptian and the priest did this sort of thing they're the ones who wrote the religious texts they're watching this and, and there's there's movement there's a range you know that of, of this gateway and so their they, their idea of ton etcher just as to make it a summary here is that all of the land the physical land that was sort of between the, 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 the two far points, the northern point and the southern point, where the, the sun rises, and, you know, it moves back and forth. All of that was the God's land. That, that, was, that was under the dominion of the solar deity. Again, that, that, was, that was a place where he, he, would, he would come up and start inspecting things you know, on Earth. And then at the end of the day, he would go back into the netherworld and rise again the next day. So that's why you have this, this long you know, swath of land that was perceived this way. And the motion of the sun across the horizon you know, would explain why we get these sort of northern and southern extremes. As the sun god rose, again, at different points on the horizon, between what we now know as the solstices, he would visit these regions. You know, he would be above Punt some days. He would be above, you know, Canaan some days. He would be above the Negev or Sinai or you know, you know, any, any of these places in between. He was visiting those places because he was their lord. You know, his home, you know, the, the place that, that he loved the most, of course, was Egypt, because this is where his incarnate son, in the form of Pharaoh, was put. You know, Egypt is the central axis from which every, you know, from which Maat, earthly and cosmic order, was perpetuated. But the sun god, the sun deity, would visit other places too because you know, he, you know, he was interested in them because they were his. It was the god's land. Now, what, what's really interesting is if you, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way, if you take the late date of the Exodus, that means the Exodus occurs after the Amarna period. Now, what, say, who cares about the Amarna period? The Amarna period was when Akhenaten was Pharaoh. And, and, and Akhenaten did away with a lot of the, the, the normal sun worship. He worshipped not, not Ra, okay, the sun god. He worshipped the Aten, which was the, the disk of the sun. He even changed his name you know, to Ak, Aknaten, okay? The last part of that name is Aten. So he was a worshiper of this, this, the actual disk of the sun. That was his, his main deity. Now, you know, people say, well, he was a monotheist. Well, yeah, he, he did have the names of other deities, you know, basically where, wherever he could, could get away with it, you know, erased from monuments and things like this. But he didn't, he also thought he, that he himself was a deity. So he's not, you know, is that, is that really a monotheist? I mean, people bicker about this all the time. It's not the same as the biblical conception for sure, but this is where he was at. Now, when he dies, you know, he's anathematized by the Egyptians and they restore. This is one of the things, one of the reasons why King Tut, even though he died as a boy, was such a big deal because Tut authorized the restoration back to the old religion and he got rid of the Aten. He got rid of Atenism, the religion of Akhenaten. And so by the time you, you hit the Exodus, you know, later on uh, in the late date, you have Ra sort of back in place and as supreme. And it's really important to an Egyptian because he, you know, Maad has been restored now. You know, we had this burp. We had this, this, this awful period of, of you know, Akhenaten being on the throne and through everything, the whole land into chaos and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and he did. You know, he was. He was. He, he puts up the people in a lot of turmoil because you don't just like change all the religion. You know, and just expect people to be happy with it. There were lots of people that weren't happy with it, and everything that, that you know, was bad that happened got blamed on this change and you know, this sort of thing. So when he's gone, Tut comes back, restores all the old, all the old ways, and everything's wonderful because now we have we have cosmic order restored, and Ra is in his rightful place. You know, everything is the way it should be until Yahweh shows up. <laughs> you know, so again, if, if you're a late dater, it, it, it sort of amps up the, the, the drama a little bit more. Because now you have the God of the Hebrews showing up and basically giving all the, you know, a whole assortment of Egyptian deities, including Ra, a beating with the plagues. And basically saying, hey, guess what? This, this land over here, this is mine. In fact, I'm going to take my people out of Egypt. I'm going to take them across the desert. And you know what? We're, we're not afraid at all of Ra. We're not afraid that he's going to interfere with us. Okay, Ra was just taught a lesson along with the, the rest of the Egyptian pantheon. So there's Yahweh out there leading his people, just going wherever you know, he, you know, he feels like, on the way to, to Sinai and then on the way to Canaan, but without a care in the world. He's not afraid of Ra at all. I mean, this, this is how it would have been perceived. Well, we thought that was the God's land, you know, because that's where the sun rises and, you know, that, that's his turf. It shouldn't, no, we're not, we're not scared. We're not even giving him a, a, a second thought. Now, you can, you can have that, that polemic if, if it's before the Amarna period as well. I mean, you don't, you don't lose anything with the early date. But if it is after the Amarna period, then, then we've got something, you know, fairly significant here um, where, you know, it, it just makes, it makes the confrontation a little more dramatic and a little more traumatic uh, for an Egyptian because you've just, you know, your, your country's just gone through this period that was just such a mess and you thought everything was restored, everything's the way it ought to be. And now we've got this. Uh, so, again, they're, they're just thinking about, these places in, in these sorts of ways. Now, back to Cooper. He says the term Ta Netcher most commonly occurs in sun hymns, that should be no surprise, devoted to different solar deities like Ra, Amun Ra, and Ra Harakti, Ra of the horizon. Uh, that, that's what that phrase means, which strongly suggests an association with solar deities and this, this concept. When Ta Netcher is connected with other deities, it is usually their solar manifestations which are evoked. So, again, there's the solar connection. Mut is one where he, he, the, the name of Mut will be connected to Ta Netcher, the, God, the God's land. But Mut is called the daughter of Ra. And the manifestation of the sun disk in the crossword hymn. That's text 51 from this corpus that he's been using. The goddess Hathor, who is associated with some regions of God's land, is called the Eye of Ra, the sun disk in God's land. In a Ptolemaic text, so Hathor gets into this too. 
In another text of this period, Horus says the god of the sky and the sun is called the one who assesses God's land. But again, he's, there's, a, there's a solar connection. So this has everything to do with where the sun rises. And again, that, this is how it would have been perceived. Basically, everywhere that the sun rises, everywhere that, that, that the light of the sun reaches, when the sun you know, comes up every morning, that's the god's land. I mean, which is a real broad statement of sovereignty, again, if you're an Egyptian. So again, it's pretty clear that Ta Netcher was cosmic in, in the way it was thought of. All of these places, wherever the, the sun rises, essentially the sun is a theophany. Think of it as a theophany. The God has come out. He's emerged from his spiritual world, you know, the alternate reality, the spiritual reality, the reality of the divine, and he's surveying his land. And to an Egyptian, that meant dominion. That meant sovereignty. That meant control. That meant ownership. All these things. And when we have the episode with the Hebrews, those concepts just get, they, they just take a beating. Because you'd think if Ra is going to show up every day and, and he sees something he doesn't like going on, something that violates Ma'at, like these Hebrews, you know, you know, doing what they're doing, and all these plagues and this guy Moses, and all that, that Ra would do something about it. Well, that ain't going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, again, that's a theological statement to everybody who's, you know, who sort of knows the worldview. Uh, that's a theological statement that uh, is pretty powerful for them. Now, from Cooper's other article, the Duat article, just one brief point from that one. He writes, the Egyptians considered the southeastern regions, specifically, not only directionally associated with solar birth, again, you, you know, the, the sun emerges and he's born. Like in, in Egyptian paintings, you'll have the sky, the sky goddess was Newt. Remember the, the sun traverses the sky, you'll have, you'll have Ra on his solar bark, his solar ship, traversing the sky, and the sky is this gigantic woman you know, with stars and stuff you know, on her. That, that was Newt. Uh, so the, the, uh, the sun traverses you know, Newt and then goes you know, down into the, into the netherworld, and, and the sun emerges from, you know, I can't say it any other way, but from, uh, from Newt gives birth to the sun. The sky gives birth. So where do you think the sun emerges in Egyptian painting? Well, you know, from the vaginal area. And this is what the Egyptian concept was, that the sky, again, is giving birth. And the birth canal essentially is, is the, you know, the path of the sun. And so the imagery of Newt gets thrown into this as well. So Egyptians considered the sun being birthed from Newt and the region where the sun issues forth from the duat, again, from the spiritual world. Cosmic theology, writes Cooper, provided a discourse in which Egyptians could speculate on the nature of not only the inaccessible universe, the stars and the skies, the heavens, the gates of the netherworld, the gates of the duat, but also they could speculate on the boundaries of the real universe where the duat joined the terrestrial sphere, where heaven met earth. Where heaven met earth is where the sun emerges. Okay, and the sun emerges over the horizon, the eastern horizon. And during the course of the year, that horizon gets wider and wider because, again, of, of science that they don't particularly know, but they can track it. They can see it happening. They can see it happening. And so the, the, the place where heaven meets earth runs from Syria, North Syria, Palestine, all the way down to Punt, and that is the God's land that belongs to him. It's his domain. It's his doorstep. If you want to, you want to you know, use that as an analogy or a metaphor. And again, this is the very place where, you know, just think about what, what, what the Lord had told Moses uh, to tell Pharaoh. You know, let my people go because we're going to go for a three-day journey out into the wilderness and they're going to sacrifice to me. Well, wait a minute. If you do that, you're sacrificing to Yahweh on the God's land. Yeah, we are. And, and again, that, that's, that should make a point. So again, these, these are just examples of, of the way Egyptians and again, Israelites familiar, you know, with the way Egyptians thought would have conceived you know, some of this language, some of the, this dialogue, and, and, and some of these events. So just to summarize the point, the Egyptians believed that Amun-Ra, you know, the solar deity, owned these lands. And they believed that the solar deity was reborn from these lands every day. These lands were the lands of his appearing. Again, so it, the, the sun is like a theophany to an Egyptian, the appearance of, of the deity himself. And these lands were the place where the spiritual world and the earthly world converged in that the solar deity emerged from them each day to survey the world that he owns, the world that he has dominion over. Now, we've already saw, if you think back to the episodes we did on the plagues, how the plague of locusts and its associated plague of darkness freaked the Egyptians out. That, that would have been directly seen as a power play of Yahweh over Ra because they couldn't see Ra. There's something wrong here. Why is Ra obscured? Why can't we see him? Why is there darkness? Why can't Ra get rid of these, you know, this thick cloud of locusts that are you know, keeping us from seeing his glory? Why can't he do something about that? So those last two plagues, again, are, are, are an attack on, on Ra's power and sovereignty. And this, this whole concept as well. So the Israelites aren't just leaving Egypt to an Egyptian especially. They're headed into lands that were thought to be under the dominion of Egypt's solar deity, Ra, or some of these other deities in their solar manifestation. But guess what? Yahweh is in control of the land where Israel has been. That would be Egypt. He certainly showed he was in, in control there with the plagues. And he's also in control of the land where they're going. He has dominion, not Ra. Yahweh and Israel, by extension, has no fear of going onto Ra's turf because Yahweh has ultimate sovereignty. They're going to go out into the desert and worship Yahweh at his mountain. And then the plan is to go to Yahweh's own land, Canaan. He'll lead Israel on whatever route he pleases. No permission is needed from Ra. And even more to the point, Yahweh has laid claim to part of the God's land, Canaan, because it isn't Ra's to claim. It was Yahweh back at Babel. Okay, think of your Deuteronomy 32 worldview here with you know, the unseen realm and other stuff that I've written and you know, stuff we talk about a lot. It was Yahweh who doled out the nations, Deuteronomy 32.8, and set their boundaries as a judgment. Okay, that, that, that was Yahweh who did that, not Ra. Ra has what he has because Yahweh lets him have it until he decides that he's done with that. Psalm 82. Again, to a, a literate Israelite reader, you know, once we have the text as we have it, someone who's familiar with the Egyptian worldview, uh, someone who you know is boots on the ground. You know when we have these these sorts of things happening, 
Just the act of leaving Egypt and going out into the desert to sacrifice to Yahweh is a, is a punch in the theological face of Ra. Just that, because again of this concept of the God's land. So I wanted to include this in, in our treatment of Exodus 14. And it was too long to tack on to the first part. But again, if you're interested in some of this Egyptian stuff, you can look at the, uh, at the articles in the protected folder. Uh, but I, you know, this is the kind of stuff I, I just kind of like, because it, it sort of gets you in the head of more of the people that are involved in the story. In this case, namely the Egyptians. Like, what in the world are they thinking? Well, they're, you know, they're, again, they, they were freaked out with the plagues. And this is, this is just another episode of them being taught, or you know, sort of a visual aid to, to discerning uh, who's really in control here. Again, it's, it's the defeat of their gods, and specifically the most important one, you know, the, the solar deity, which, again, it, it's not just that the sun rises and sets every day. But that is connected to the to the, the annual flood of the Nile, which which keeps Egypt alive. Okay, Egypt is not Egypt without without calendar and the regularity of what happens with the Nile. It, it doesn't exist. It dies. So again, all these things are connected in the Egyptian mind, and they're connected to Ma, you know, the divine order that uh, supposedly the, the Egyptian gods established. And that all just that all just gets smashed uh, in the Exodus episode. Typically, people look at this chapter. And it's like, oh, it's just like a, a reiteration of the crossing of the Red or the Reed Sea, the Yam Suf. And sure, I mean, you can read through chapter 15, and that's kind of what it is, but that's just the surface. There are actually a lot of things in here that, for this audience, especially people who've read Unseen Realm, and in some cases, the lighter version, you know, Supernatural, that book, but especially if you've read the book Unseen Realm, you're going to see that there are things in this chapter that sort of take you into Divine Council worldview content. And so, as is our custom here, you know, we're not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse thing. I'm just going to go through the chapter and sort of drill down in places uh, where there's just something like that that surfaces, and then we'll talk about it, why it's important, what it means, all that sort of thing. So let's just jump into the first three verses here to get started. Exodus 15 says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In those three verses, Lord, there again is the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Um, one sort of peripheral note here, ESV has the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The wording there in, in, in the Hebrew can refer to somebody who drives a chariot, so that it's not inconsistent with what's gone before. It's just a, You might get that impression just reading through quickly that, wow, they were all riding horses? No, it refers to chariotry. But the, where I want to sort of do the initial camp out is the third verse there. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Now, Durham, uh, in his Exodus commentary, I'm going to read you a little, little section of, of his comments and then a little bit from uh, Carpenter. And then I want to I take this verse into a larger issue that is really concerning the, the two powers in heaven uh, issue. You might have already sort of sensed that Yahweh is a man of war, just the language there. So Durham says, okay, there follows a description of Yahweh as a victorious deliverer. He is Ishmil Chama, a man of battle, a warrior, an undoubtedly authentic epithet the translators of the Septuagint found too embarrassing to keep. But the Septuagint okay, actually alters this. And you might think, well, that's kind of weird. The Septuagint has, again, this is from Durham, uh, I'll put it in, in English, uh, Yahweh crushes wars or basically you know, wins battles or something like that. Instead of a man of war, it, it turns that into this descriptive phrase. And you might ask, well, why would they do that? And this takes us into, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak as a critic now, you know, uh, sort of a, somebody who does Israelite religion and sees an evolutionary arc. You know, we've been in this territory before in Exodus, and you all know my, my position you know, on this basically is, I, I think the, that the evolutionary approach to Israelite religion is largely based on circular reasoning because it has so many inconsistencies. And we're going to get into that here again. Now, just as, as a jumping off point, there would be those who say, well, the Septuagint translator, you know, obviously, you know, this, this Hellenistic Jewish guy, was offended by anthropomorphism, you know, anthropomorphism, anthropomorphic language about Yahweh, transforming Yahweh into a man. He didn't like that wording because by the time of the exile, Yahweh was transcendent above the gods. And, and this is primitive religious thinking to cast the deity as a man and blah, 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 blah. And if you're thinking, well, good grief, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Second Temple Jewish literature that have Yahweh as a man, you'd be correct. Again, so that ruins the evolutionary arc, the neatness of the picture. I think the most you could say is I mean, there's nothing unclear about the Hebrew. The most you could say is the guy who was doing Exodus, you know, just thought this made better sense because elsewhere in Exodus, the burning bush, you know, Yahweh is in the form of an angel there, okay? Other places where, where Yahweh in the Torah is going to show up. You know, the people who did the translation of the Septuagint, who did the Torah, it's not just one person, okay? But you're going to have many that have no problem at all with anthropomorphic language. And then you got this guy that maybe you could say that about him. Maybe he has some other motive. We actually don't know. But people will assume, scholars will assume that they know the motive. They know why the, the translator did what he did because they are operating mentally with this evolutionary trajectory in mind, that, that the cast Yahweh as a man is primitive. This is primitive religion. And, and it's more enlightened. It's more, you know, you know uh, mind-expanding or something like that, more sophisticated, more intellectual, to abstract Yahweh as this non-person, this non-human you know, deity entity that's just you know, so transcendent out of the human world in every... This is the kind of language that, that you get when you read academic material about just religion in general. 
but here it's applied to the Hebrew Bible. And again, if you're sitting there, and again, if you've had good exposure to Second Temple literature, and even, even the late literature of the Hebrew Bible, you're thinking, good grief, there's lots of exceptions to that. Yeah, there are. That's the point. That's the point. There is no neat trajectory. If you were at the Naked Bible Conference last year, I did my presentation on, on how the Septuagint uh, handles, and, and also the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, how, they, how it handles the language of divine plurality. Because one of the, the axiomat, axiomatic things in biblical studies is, well, when we get to the Greek period, the Hellenistic period, you know, they don't, they don't use sons of God anymore. They, they just take all these phrases that are primitive polytheism, and they, they use the word angel. Yeah, except where they don't. Okay, except for the 180 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls where they have B'nai Elim, B'nai Elohim, B'nai Ha Elohim in, in, in divine council scenes, the stuff that's supposedly pre-exilic and now has been outlawed religiously. That happens to show up 180 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Septuagint does not consistently render these phrases with angelos, angel. I, went, I actually went through in that session, and you know, I guess this is a commercial for the next Naked Bible podcast. This is the kind of thing we do. You know, we, we, we present you know, good topics, research, and that sort of thing, because we know whoever signs up for that, you know, they, they, they care about content. But I, I gave a handout last year and said, look, you know, of all the places where you have divine plurality in the Hebrew Bible, plural Elohim, B'nai Elohim, B'nai Ha Elohim, all this stuff, I showed you know, how the Septuagint handles that. And there were only, as I recall, three or four instances where you couldn't find a Septuagint rendering that was literal, sons of God. You know, in other words, there were only three or four instances where, where all, all, the, all the manuscript material we have says angels. It doesn't, you know, doesn't take it literally. Most of the time, they're just fine taking these phrases and translating them literally. They're not bothered by it at all. You know, but all you know, scholars again have this template that they impose on the text, you know, this evolutionary art thing, and it is, it's just so inconsistent. But yet it is axiomatic. This is why I wound up doing my dissertation on this topic. And, I, and again, to my advisor's credit, he let me do it. But it, it was a fight every step of the way because this was contrary to the consensus opinion. And you know, once he figured out that, yeah, Mike knows it's contrary, but good grief, there are lots of exceptions here, <laughs> um, then it was okay. It, it, in other words, it was, a good, it was a good experience for me to see how a seasoned scholar, you know, sort of is, is embracing an idea but never actually looked at it because it wasn't, you know, that wasn't really the, his field. So this is what you have. And, 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 you know, Durham's comment here is representative or not representative, but, but he at least points out that we have one, one instance here where Yahweh is a man of war gets sort of erased by translation. Now, Carpenter says, the new era, just, just, just the wording there, the new era of Yahweh's name and his great acts of judgment and deliverance is ushered in. Now, if you restrict that comment to the Exodus, that, that's a good thing to say. If you're, and Carpenter's not. Carpenter's not one of these that's on the evolutionary trajectory thing. But again, somebody who is could read that, oh, yes, the new era of enlightened monotheism. Here, you know? Again, that's not where, where Carpenter's going here. Um, Yahweh is holy, high above all the gods. This assertion, Yahweh is a man of battle, caused much puzzlement to the ancient translators. Uh, maybe this phrase did. But again, the concept itself you know, didn't, even though that's what's accepted. But Carpenter does add, the concept itself causes consternation among God's people even today. And I, that, I don't know, I look at that and I think well, that's a little overstated, but it, it's probably still kind of fair because again, we, you know, we, there, there is something of a struggle. I'll, I'll use the word struggle, where because we have Jesus in the incarnation in the New Testament, I, I've met a lot, of, a lot of Christians that are surprised at their Old Testament, that you actually have God as a man in the Old Testament. Like they've never seen it before. They never really thought about it. So that, I, I think if you're looking at it that way, then what Carpenter says here, yeah, you know, that, that can be legit. Uh, again, it, a lot of it is because people just don't look. They're not, they're not sort of thinking about, they're not thinking in these terms when they read certain Old Testament passages. It sort of just gets glossed right over. Or, or we, we take things like the word of the Lord um, and think that that's just a, you know, a voice in the prophet's head. You know, sometimes it is, but sometimes it is clearly not. Again, this is the two power stuff that I discuss in Unseen Realm. Uh, you know, we, we, there, there's just no blanket statement that you can make here. There are plenty of people who aren't offended by it today, and there are plenty of people who weren't offended by it in the intertestamental period and in the, on into the New Testament. Now, Siegel, Alan Siegel, he's the guy who wrote, you know, back in 1977, the Two Powers in Heaven book. Siegel, uh, again, is a, was a rabbinic scholar, was a Jew, he passed, passed away recently in the last few years, and he wrote this book on the Two Powers of Heaven, trying to find the, the history of when, when did this teaching, that there were two power, good powers, not, a, not good versus evil, this isn't like Zoroastrian stuff here, but two good guys, okay, two gods, essentially, in Judaism, because he knew that Judaism used to teach that, because he's familiar with Second Temple Jewish monotheism, or Jewish binitarianism, in the, in the Second Temple intertestamental period. So he, he, Siegel asked a very logical question. Well, if there were lots of Jews writing about this and, and they're fine with it, it was a big item of discussion, nobody was calling each other heretics over it, why did they start doing that? Why did they start making it off limits? Why did they start forbidding the discussion? When did that happen and why? You know, when did Jewish theology change? And in his book on the two powers, Siegel, again, makes, the, makes a number of observations. Obviously, the whole book's about the subject, but specifically about this verse. He actually includes some rabbinic commentary on this verse. And Siegel's point is that, look, you can tell by this commentary that they are writing after the two powers idea has become forbidden. They know it exists. They know it exists dead as well. They know that there were people in their community that used to think this way, and, and, and apparently not too long ago, by, by the way this, this is written. But it's very clear from certain selections in rabbinic material that we don't want to think this way anymore. And, and I'm, I'm going to read you this, this section because what, what, what this section actually shows is that rabbis started to, to write and talk like modalists. If you're not familiar with modalism, it's the idea that God could could uh, show up in more than one form. And modalism doesn't work with Trinitarianism because of things like the Incarnation. Um, 
you know, modalism to a Christian, again, because of you know, Trinitarianism and the Incarnation, all the deity of Christ, all this stuff, uh, modalism is not acceptable language for Trinity. But the, the, here you have Jewish rabbis that sound like modalists. And, and the reason they do this, they want to start talking about God appearing in more than one form, is that, well, there aren't really two powers in heaven. It's just that God shows up in two different disguises, as it were. God shows up in two different kinds of manifestations, so that the two don't exist simultaneously. It's just God in different forms, periodically. Uh, and, and, and Siegel is on to them. He's on to the people in his own community, because again, this is what his book is about. So I'm going I'm to read you this. So he's reading Siegel quotes from the Melkita of Rabbi Ishmael Bachodesh, 5, Shir to 4. And here, here's, here's what the rabbis are saying. I am Yahweh, your God. You know, why is this said? Because when he was revealed at the sea, he appeared to them as a mighty hero making war, as it is said. Yahweh is a man of war. He appeared at Sinai like an old man, full of mercy, as it is said, and they saw the God of Israel. He's quoting Exodus 24, 10. Now let me stop. If you go back and look at Exodus 24, it doesn't describe Yahweh as an old man. The rabbis are just reading that into that passage because they're thinking like modalists, okay? Back to Siegel's quote of the rabbi. The rabbi says, and at the time after they had been redeemed, what does it say? Okay, like the very heaven for clearness, Exodus 24, 10. Again, it says in another passage, I beheld till thrones were set down. Now he's quoting Daniel 7, verse 9. And it also says a fiery stream issued and came forth from him. Scripture would not give an opportunity to, to the nations of the world to say there are two powers, but declares, I am Yahweh, your God, Exodus 20, verse 2. I was in Egypt. I was at the sea. I was in the past. I will be in the future to come. I am in this world. I am in the world to come. And that's the end of the rabbinic section. So Siegel, again, is looking at this. And again, he, he's on to this trajectory. He, he knows what they're trying to do. He can tell that they don't want to land in two powers territory as their predecessors in the Second Temple period did so often. Because to the rabbis, you have to realize, folks, the rabbinic material is not contemporaneous with the Old Testament. When you start listening to people about what the rabbis say, that's medieval. That's when the, the rabbinic material is put together. Some of it, you know, the, some strands of it, some content strands, you know, go back into the Second Temple period and are relevant, you know, for like New Testament thinking. But this is not contemporary, contemporary with the Hebrew Bible. And a lot of it is even, even contemporary with the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Second Temple period. It's after, it's later. And again, Siegel knows this because he's a professor of rabbinic you know, literature, and he knows that they're trying to avoid landing in two powers land. So he writes this. This is Siegel now, pages 35 and 36. The exegesis notes the repetition of the name of Yahweh in Exodus 15.3. Let me just read it to you again. Exodus 15.3. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. So that's Exodus 15.3. So Siegel says, the exegesis notes the repetition of the name in Exodus 15.3 and explains its significance. Yahweh is a man of war is to be interpreted as a descriptive statement referring to God's manifestation as a young warrior when he destroyed the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Yahweh is his name, the other half of verse 3, is necessary because at Sinai he will reveal himself as an old man, showing mercy. Hence it is important for the Israelites to realize that the same God is speaking in both cases, though the manifestations look different. The proof text for these statements is Daniel 7, 9 and following which describes a heavenly enthronement scene involving two divine manifestations, the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days. In this context, the reference from Daniel must be taken to demonstrate that God may be manifested either as a young man, that would be the Son of Man, or as an old man, the Ancient of Days. Now, let me stop there. You see what the rabbis are doing. They're looking for a way to handle Daniel 7. Son of Man, Ancient of Days. Oh, that, those aren't two figures. Those are just two modes of Yahweh. Those are two manifestations of Yahweh. And one goes back to Exodus 15.3. That's the young one, the man of war. Son of Man somehow is equated with the man of war. And then the Ancient of Days somehow is equated with Exodus 24.10. They saw the God of Israel. Of course, Exodus 24.10 never describes what he looks like. But the rabbis don't care. They need the two modes there. One deity, two modes, two manifestations. Not two, not two powers. God forbid we, you know, we have two powers in heaven. Back to Siegel. He writes this. When the whole biblical passage is seen, the passage seems to describe more a danger than a solution. Not only does the passage allow the interpretation that God changes aspect, it may easily be describing two separate divine figures. More than one throne is revealed, that's Daniel 7, and scripture describes two divine figures to fill them. One sits, the other seems to be invested with power, possibly enthroned. The Ancient of Days may be responsible for judgment, but delegates the operation to a son of man who accomplishes judgment by means of a fiery stream. That this son of man is young or that his dominion is to be merciful, ostensibly the point of the reference, is hardly evident in the text. Now that's an honest comment from a rabbinic scholar about what the rabbis are saying. Basically, he's saying, these guys are just blowing smoke here. <laughs> Again, because his book, Siegel's book, is about the history of this idea within the Jewish community and when, why did it transition from being okay to being a heresy? Okay, so. I just wanted you to know that Exodus 15.3 is part of the two powers in heaven debate within Judaism. And if you get into a conversation with a, a Jewish friend, uh, they might have been schooled by rabbis, and they might go to their rabbis, and you're not going to believe what this Christian you know, person you know, told me. And the rabbi gets, oh, you know, just tell them it's two modes, it's two manifestations. Here, read Rabbi Melchitah. You know, I mean, that, that, that's what you're going to get. But Siegel, again, is honest enough to say, well, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Again, and in Siegel's book, what he's trying to do is show the reader how this was dealt with. But again, he, he's, I mean, there, there you have it. He goes, well, the passage, if you actually look at the passages, they could just as well be teaching two separate individuals not two modes. So let's move on to verses 8 through 12 here. Another thing I want to just land on a little bit briefly. I think chapters 4 through 7 is, again, just a repetition of what happens at the Red Sea. Uh, we hit verses 8 through 12. You know, when the, the Egyptians are drowned, we hit verse 8. 
At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood up in a heap, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. That's verses 8 through 12. I want to comment on all those verses except for verse 11. Verse 11 I'll come back to. But did you notice the odd phrase in verse 12? I mean, we're talking about, the song is talking about what God does to the Egyptians at the Red Sea, right? The earth swallowed them. But the earth isn't water. Water is not the earth. I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's an odd thing. What, what it's going to take us into, that comment and some other things in these verses, is Israelite cosmology, specifically the underworld, you know, the, the underworld deep, as it were. So this is underworld imagery that's used of what happened in or at you know, this, this particular body of water that we talked about a few weeks ago. Durham says here, there's a subtle but important shift from waters, the Hebrew term mayim, and currents, neither of which refers to the primor- primordial waters of chaos, to the ancient deeps, which is tahom. Okay, and tahom is actually used in this passage along with these other two terms, when it says the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. It's tahom. The implication, Durham says at the very least, is that the visible waters in their everyday flow were thrust aside to make way for the temporary release of the devastating rebellion waters from their subterranean prison, you know, the ultimate deep, the Tahome. Then these same waters, the very symbol of disorder in motion, because the, the deep, again, is, is the, the chaotic mess. If you think back to Genesis 1, this is the, the chaotic state out of which Yahweh creates order. You know, God creates an unordered place of habitation for humanity. And the darkness was over the face of the deep, okay? Again, implying some sort of control, then you get refashioning in, in Genesis 1. So Durham is saying, that here we have the same concept, this primordial deep, this, this subterranean waters, the waters that were in the three-tiered cosmology of Israelite thought, water's under the earth. Remember, to an Israelite, the earth was around, you know, flat thing, floating on water. You say, well, where's the water? Isn't the water also on earth? Again, you're, you're thinking like a 21st century person when you ask questions like that. The writers are not 21st century people. Okay, they don't, they don't, they're not asking questions about where the water came from, where it is in relation to other water. Okay, it's just, you have this primeval mound come up out of the earth. It's surrounded by water. It floats on water. And then God, of course, fastens it. He fixes it with, with pillars, the pillars under the earth. Again, this is all standard Old Testament cosmological language and ancient Near Eastern cosmological language. And then water under the earth, the great deeps, that would threaten, again, to, to break the pillars and unleash chaos on, on the habitable landmass. And that's what this term, to home, is talking about. So back to Durham, he says, again, these same waters of the very symbol of disorder and motion are, in the Exodus account, made solid. They congeal. They are stilled in the middle of the sea, and God makes them sort of stand up like walls. And when God does that, the earth, verse 12, swallows the Egyptians. So well, how does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because the, the great deep now that is, again, cosmologically under the earth. That's been split apart and congealed and made into walls, and so that opens up this cavernous thing. Basically, the Egyptians slide into the underworld. They go to hell, okay? If you want to use, you know, you know later language for this sort of thing. This is, this is the idea. They're all sent to the underworld. And Yahweh is the sovereign over the inescapable underworld. And remember, from Unseen Realm again, that one of the terms for land, Eretz, is also used of the underworld. Eretz, same word. And that's what we have here when it says the earth swallowed them, the Eretz swallowed them, the underworld swallowed them. They're dead. Okay, they're dead and they go, there's no escape from this, this realm because you know, no Egyptian deity is sovereign over this because it's Yahweh commanding the great deeps to congeal and swallow the Egyptians. So there, there's, again, some cosmological thinking going on here. Now, there is an interesting article uh, that compares this language, I should, um, well, yeah, that, that takes this language and, and the language of other passages and start, you know, tries to make an argument. I think there's, there's some really good material in this article um, where you can connect this kind of language, the language used of the Red Sea and what happens there with Sheol with the realm of the dead. And that is not to say that, on, on my part, it's not to say that this wasn't a historical event. There's just two aspects to it. This is, this is like anything else in Exodus, and frankly, like lots of things in the Hebrew Bible. There's sort of the, the boots on the ground interpretation of what's going on, what the text says, okay, and, and that the, the writer's talking about. But then there's this sort of cosmic, supernaturalistic, metaphysical kind of thing in interpretation behind all that. This is another case in point. What happens at the Red Sea to the Egyptians, again, is viewed as, as sort of you know, event kind of terms, historical event terms, and then there are these cosmic terms. There are two ways to read the same, same material. Now, this article is, is by a fellow named uh, Wiffall, W-I-F-A-L-L. And let's see if I have an article reference to it. The, what the article is about, I don't know if this is actually the title, how the Sea of Reeds is based on Egyptian symbolism or, or gets tied into Egyptian symbolism, specifically the Shehor, which is the Egyptian equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol as the place of death. Now, interestingly enough, okay, go back to our, our, our discussion again a few episodes ago about where the crossing occurred. Again, you think of the Red Sea, you got the left prong, that's the Gulf of Suez, and then at the tip of, the, of that, you've got a bunch of bodies of water that in ancient times were connected, in some cases by canals, you know, forming the eastern border you know, of Egypt at the delta there. Uh, basically, again, if, if you pass through that or cross over that, you're out into, to an Egyptian, you're out into the wilderness and the chaos and all that kind of stuff. But this is borderland territory. Okay? So we talked a lot about that, this chain of lakes. You know, and, and, and it factors into the way the Old Testament describes 
the crossing at you know Kiha, he wrote the mouth of the canals so again at some point you know, along this chain of bodies of water so we don't know which body of water they crossed but it was in this this sort of you know conceptual and literal barrier or border you know borderline waterway link you know, all these bodies of water linked together so one of those bodies of water is the Shihor, believe it or not and again that that's a term a term that is associated by the egyptians with the underworld this particular place is near Avaris or Avaris. Again, this is in the Delta. And we have a map on the, uh, on the episode webpage so that you can see where this is. Again, it's one of these bodies of water. So this might be, if Wiffall's article is correct, that, that the language here, not only of Exodus 15, but you know, some of the other, the other parts of this event description, if this is tapping into Egyptian belief about this one particular place, maybe that's the place that they cross. Because the Egyptians going in there to pursue after them wind up in the underworld. Again, maybe that's the case. And I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Withall's article, just so that you get a feel for it a little bit, uh, you know, a couple of portions here. So he's going through the uh, the history of scholarship you know, on this in his article, and he writes this. An article by L.S. Hay on the historicity and history of the tradition of the Reed Sea events points to another source besides Canaan for the mythological elements in Israel's description of her exodus from Egypt. Again, mythological, this is me breaking it here. Mythological is a term that most scholars are going to use for cosmic terminology, you know, something about their, you know, connected to the supernatural worldview. You know, whether, the, whether this author treats the event as historical or, or not you know, is, is a different question, different but related question, but don't get thrown off by that, that term. Back to Withal. In arguing for a military encounter in which Israel defeated the pursuing chariotry of Pharaoh, Hay proposed that this basic historical account was later overlaid in the tradition by a Sheol myth, possibly derived from Egyptian mythology. Hay cited an article written several years ago by J. Towers concerning Egyptian influences on the Reed Sea story. Towers pointed out the equation between the Hebrew term Yam and the Egyptian She, or She, sea or lake. Probably in Egyptian would be Esh. In Egyptian mythology, the lake or field of reeds was the underworld, where the soul of the dead was purified before ascending into heaven. The soul was said to pass over the underworld sea of reeds. Wasn't that interesting? Let me just break in here. Isn't that interesting? For an Egyptian, again, an Egyptian acquainted with these texts, this lake, I'll read it again, was the place where the soul of the dead was purified before ascending into heaven. Kind of like a purgatory. The soul was said to pass over the underworld sea of reeds, much as the historical Passover of Israel in the Reed Sea events. I'll finish with all sentence there. Guess what, folks? Again, again, if you're an Egyptian and you're, you're either witnessing the events or you're, you know, if you're Hebrew familiar with this and you're reading about it later on in Exodus 15, this is not purgatory. The Egyptians ain't going anywhere. They're dead. They are in the realm of the dead for keeps because it's the God of Israel who has command over this. Okay, he sets the terms. Again, this would have really, again, struck fear into an Egyptian. And again, the, the biblical writer, if indeed, again, Withal is correct, that we have these, these connections back into Egyptian thinking, the writer knows exactly what he's doing. And if, if you're someone who's familiar with this belief, either because you're an Egyptian or about the Egyptians, you're going to know that this is a theological statement. You're not going anywhere, buddy. Okay, <laughs> you, are, you are in the underworld this isn't just like a temporary thing that you're going to get out of here later. No, you're not getting out of anywhere. You're, you're locked up. Uh, back to Withal. Towers' remarks about Egyptian mythology as the possible source of the Exodus imagery can be amplified through studies by Egyptologists such as Frankfurt, Raymond, Zandi. For example, Frankfurt, in his study of Egyptian religion, noted a close relation between the geographical lake and field of reeds and the mythological region of the dead. And Frankfurt, this is me again, Frankfurt is a, is a major figure in Egyptian religion. All, all sorts of stuff you can get you know, online or, or uh, you know, books by him. Back to Withal. Raymond, in her study on the mythical, mythical origins of the Egyptian temple, has also emphasized the importance of these two geographical regions in Egyptian mythology. On the one hand, the lake, with its field of reeds, was both the site of the first creation and of the earthly temple, where life was renewed daily in the royal cult. Indeed, the temple's design and complex reflected the reeds in the pool or lake of the mythical creation setting. On the other hand, although the sun rose daily with life, it also set on the western horizon into the dark abode of the dead, so that the lake represented also the pit where the nightly struggle between light and darkness was waged. The light was the place where Apophis, the serpent of darkness, was pierced and slain by the sun god in both primeval and daily combat. Just as Ra expelled or repelled Apophis in heaven, so the Egyptian king was believed to drive out disorder daily and establish justice, Ma'at, in the land. In his study on the Egyptian concept of death, Zandi has cited terms and descriptions of the underworld Lake of Reeds, which recall the Old Testament's concept of Sheol. For example, the Egyptian dead were at times called the drowned ones, and the wicked were said to be burned by fire. Let me just stop there. You know in Old Testament talk about Sheol, there's both water and fire? Okay, back to the back to Withal here. They're said to be burned by fire as Yahweh burned his enemies. In fact, Israel's understanding of the underworld is a great body of water upon which floats the disk of the earth and her fear of death in the sense of drowning and inundation would appear to reflect more the attitudes of Egypt than those of Ugarit or even Babylon. We'll just wrap up Withal there. Um, and I will, I will put Withal, Withal's article in the uh, protective folder as well for newsletter subscribers. But I mean, there's some good stuff here. You know, if, you, if you're looking at this, again, as an, either as an Egyptian or someone who's you know, familiar with Egyptian thinking, this accounting of the Exodus, the elements of it, the Sea of Reeds, you know, where you know, it's on the border of Egypt, you, you, know, you go over the other side, it's chaos. And, you, know, you, don't want to, you don't want to wind up in, in this water here, this specific body, because you know, again, that would be you know, where, where the dead go. I mean, if you go there, you're going to be dead. But you know, the good news is you're only going to be there for a while because it's kind of like Egyptian purgatory, you know, get out and you'll go to heaven. When and if, and I think there is something you know, to this, the biblical writers are drawing on these ideas. You, you go back and you read Exodus 15. No, this is not a temporary situation. They've been judged by the one who has control over the deep because it was Yahweh who 
made the waters of the deep congeal and stand up like walls and let his people pass through. They're the ones that go to quote unquote heaven because they're on their way now to Yahweh's domain. We said last week you know, about you know, other elements of Egyptian thinking, Israel's not, you know, they shouldn't have been afraid you know, to, to traverse the wilderness on the way to God's house at Sinai, okay? The place where, where God lives and then on to the land of Canaan where God will put his name and, and be, you know, they will be his people, he will be their God, all that sort of stuff. Again, this is all Edenic. This is all establishing the, the domain of, of Yahweh, the divine abode, you know, the, the people of God on earth, you know, the God's original intent back in Genesis, the, that whole thing. And if, you're, if you've read Unseen Realm, this is familiar territory to you. If you haven't, I'm sorry, but you need to go read the book. I can't repeat all the content in every episode and then we'll get into this kind of stuff. This is familiar territory. These are, these are repetitive ideas and concepts. They, they mime and then they can build off each other step by step through scripture all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. Okay, these are repeating themes. And you know, if, if you're aware of that, you, you can look at this material and it's like, hey, they shouldn't have had any fear going through the wilderness, you know, the, the, the place of chaos, because who was in control of that? Well, evidently Yahweh is, because look at what he did with this other, this, this really big bad place in the Red Sea. Because you know? that, you know, to an Egyptian, that, you know, that, that was the, the gateway of the realm of the dead. You know, you, all these ideas. It's Yahweh's people who are taken out of the realm of the dead to new life okay, at the Exodus event, at the crossing event, not the Egyptians. And that shows the Egyptian. And of course, the Israelite is familiar with these ideas. Who's in charge? It's just as simple as that. Who has sovereignty? Who has authority over these forces? Forces of chaos, life and death, eternal death and eternal life, you know, dwelling with, with, with God you know, forever as opposed to not. I mean, who, who is in command of all this? Well, it ain't the gods of Egypt. Again, this, it's just theological messaging all over the place. Let's go back to Exodus 15, 11, as we skip that. I'll read it to you again. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? among the Elim there in Hebrew, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Now Durham, again, in his word biblical commentary, the Exodus volume writes this, Yahweh is extolled as incomparable among the Elim, among the gods, any and all beings for whom divinity is claimed. There is simply none like him, none even approaching an equality with him. He is magnificent in the holiness that sets him apart. And that's essentially what holiness means, to be set apart, to be other. He is magnificent in the holiness that sets him apart from all of others. Uh, he references uh, Labushan, uh, that's L-A-B-U-S-C-H-A-G-N-E. I'm probably messing up the name, I think it's French, uh, who wrote an important book, The Incomparability of God in the Old Testament. It's really hard to find. I use it for my dissertation. It's, it's an important work. If you ever find it, you, know, you snatch it up, unless, it, unless you got to take a loan out, okay? It's just hard to find, but he references this book on pages 79 and 80, and he makes the comment that uh, Labushan uh, would he mend in holiness, okay, who is like you, majestic in holiness, the, the phrase there, in holiness. Labushan wa- wants to change that to, from, you know, back Kodesh to Back, uh, back Kadoshim. So he wants to make it plural. You say, well, why would he do that? You know, why does Labushan think that's a better reading of the original text? Well, he said, because that's what the Septuagint has. The Septuagint has en hagiois. It's a plural. You say, well, who cares? What does it matter? Well, here's, here, it's just kind of interesting. This is just a, like a nugget to throw out. It would read then, who is like you, majestic among the holy ones? It, it, would, it would be a nicer parallel to the, the preceding line. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic among the holy ones? And you know, Ultimately, Durham says, ah, you know, I'm not persuaded. I don't think it's necessary. Well, nobody says it's necessary, but it, it, it's still reflected in the Septuagint. Uh, and and I, I will add, this isn't the only place that such an emendation might be merited on the basis of what looks to be like a, a different text that the Septuagint translator had. Just Again, it's just a, a nugget to throw out there. It would sound, in other words, Exodus 15, 11 would sound a little bit more like Psalm 89, verses 5 through 7. And even in Psalm 89, which is again, a very famous divine counsel passage, even there, there are others like Dahud, a uh, famous Ugaritic scholar and Psalms scholar. Uh, who argue for a couple places in Psalm 89 that there are some things there that should be pluralized as well, just to, to bring out the council imagery a little bit more, as far as the composition of the council, you know, the, the, the gods there. So again, uh, you, you can look that up if you're interested, but it's just kind of an interesting observation. You have textual evidence, apparently, in Septuagint, working with a different text, different Hebrew text, had a plural there, that just brings out the divine council thing a little bit more. And, and again, the point is theological. Who is like you among any, any member of the heavenly host? Who's like you among the Elohim, the Elim in council, or the B'nai Elim, Psalm 89? And the answer is nobody. So no, as you know, my one article, uh, I put the title, you, know, you can't say you've seen one Elohim, you've seen them all. No, in, in Israelite thinking, there is one among them that is unique. Species, unique, utterly incomparable. Incomparable in terms of who he is, ontological uniqueness. And so you, know, you can you even find that in Exodus 15. Now, if you get to, you keep reading in Exodus 15, we'll run into a couple other things here. We've read through verse 12, so let's hit verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Let me read that again. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Uh, you say, why would, I, why would I include this in our discussion? Because it sounds like they've already been to Sinai. This again is, is, a, is a clear textual element that suggests that Moses isn't, he's either not writing this then, like, like this wasn't somebody like, they get to the other side of the Red Sea and Moses breaks out in song and somebody writes this down or he says, I'm going to break out in song now, start writing. No, it's after the fact. They've already been to Sinai. Now, now you know, other scholars would say, well, yeah, they've already been to Sinai. I mean, this, is, this is written way, 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 you know, centuries after you know, the, the, the biblical events, okay? And, and that could well be. I just, I like to point things out like this to you to, again, reinforce the point that when, when scholars wonder about when something gets written, 
it's not because they're just sitting in a, in a dark room wondering what to do. You know, what, what can we think up next, you know, to, to like talk about Bible stuff or get after the fundamentalists or something like that? And that's not what they do. They're, they're looking at the text and they're going, hmm, sounds like they've already been there. So how could that be most, you know, so there are just these things in the text that are very easy to read over. But again, I'm trying to reinforce the point that biblical scholarship, even biblical criticism, you know, criticism, when you, when you hear, you know, higher criticism, that, that, that's about things like, when was it written? How the text as we have it come together? Was it written or transmitted in stages and all this kind of stuff? You know, and when we hit this, we have hit it you know, through the, the Exodus series here. There are just things like, again, that are easy to overread the text that are just there that make you ask these questions if you're a close reader. Now, you know, what you do with it, and again, what your presuppositions are when you start thinking about it, that's, that's a total, it's, it's a related but a different question. But again, just so that you're aware that this stuff does arise from the text. You look at the next, next uh, couple verses, verses 14 through 16. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Rahab at Jericho. Hey, we've heard about what happened at the Red Sea. That just kind of freaks everybody out. We know you're going to kick our butts. <laughs> so like, please save me and my family. It sounds like the itinerary that Moses and Joshua take on their trip up through the Transjordan which is long after the crossing of the Red Sea. Again, the, the content of these, of these verses do not happen as soon as they hit the other side. But you know, a, lot of the, a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard, well, I, I can't say a lot of you have heard this preached because it's the Old Testament. A lot of churches don't even preach the Old Testament anymore. But if you have heard this, chances are that, that the setting that's described for you is, you know, they get through the sea and they, everybody just kind of stops and Moses breaks into song. Isn't this awesome? Well, yeah, it is awesome, but you have stuff like this in it that is clearly much later. So again, these things arise from the text. It's not people just sort of making stuff up. Currid, in his commentary, his study commentary on Exodus, the first volume, uh, Exodus 1 through 18, writes this, all four nations, these nations that are mentioned in the verses I just read, were to become notorious enemies of Israel. Philistia was located in the coastal plain of Palestine, and the Philistines often fought with Israel during the early centuries of their existence, Judges 13 through 15, 1 Samuel 4 through 7. The Edomites were descended from Esau, and they populated the, areas of, the area of southern Transjordan. They struggled with Israel in order to not let her pass through the territory, much later in Numbers 20. Moab in central Transjordan was the home of the descendants of Lot. Balak was one of the kings of Moab during the conquest period. Uh, in Numbers 22, the, the Canaanites, of course, had happened to the land of promise, and many of them were destroyed by the Hebrew invasion of Palestine. Now, you know, Currid doesn't, doesn't want people to, to think, and I don't know why, because so, so what if this was written after the fact? But, you know, he's like, well, you know, I know that sounds like later authorship, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, well, it is later authorship, because nobody's there. You know, CNN isn't there. They'd probably destroy it anyway if they were. But CNN isn't there with a camera and beaming it into Philistia. You know, this isn't like a, a real-time moment-by-moment, blow-by-blow commentary. Of course, it's after the fact. It's very obvious. Um, th- th- there's no harm in this. You know, saying that, that parts of the you know, Moses could have written it later if you want mosaic authorship. But you don't even need that either. And we've talked about this before. My point is here to, to, again, show you that if you read the text closely, these things just pop out, these questions arise. You keep reading, verses 17 and 18. And this is interest in terms of a polemic against the Canaanite divine council, Ellen Vale. You might think, my good grief, how do you get that out of verses 17 and 18? Well, let, let me read it here. You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. By the way, that sounds like it's contradictory to the earlier verse where it seemed like they'd already been there. Okay? Just, just, you know, pay attention for the sake of the point we are making. We're not going to get into authorship and editorship and all this kind of stuff. But you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. You say, how in the world does that relate to the Canaanite divine council, all that Ellen Bale stuff from Ugaritic? It does. Uh, Currid again, takes note of this. This epilogue looks even further into the future when God will establish Israel in the land of promise. The Hebrews will build a sanctuary there to, to worship Yahweh. The designation of a mountain, this is Currid's talking now, obviously refers to Mount Zion, where the temple will ultimately reside. Okay, I'll read verse 17 again. You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So I, I, I would agree. I mean, this is, this is temple language. It's Zion language, which is much later. It's necessary, Kurd says, you know, or you know, when he starts talking about chronology, let's, we'll just cut him off there. Where I want to zero in on is, he does notice the parallel here. On the mountain of your inheritance, the place of your dwelling, that occurs in, again, these verses. That's, that's important. The reference to the sanctuary, to the mountain, to the divine abode, these are stock terms used of divine council stuff. And the Hebrew terms here are used, they, they have Ugaritic equivalents. So Kurd, you know, takes note of this and he starts talking about it. And he says, there's probably a polemic here against the Canaanite divine council, specifically Baal, because Baal is the one who gets a house after his battle with Yom and Mot, the god of death and the river. You know, Baal is declared king of the gods and he gets a house and Baal is declared king of the earth. Look at verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And that language is close to the language used in the Baal cycle of Baal. And so Curran and others look at this and say, oh, there's, probably, there's something going on here in the text where the writer not only wants to tell us what happened to the Egyptians and is dipping into Egyptian worldview stuff, but the writer is also given Baal and El, and the divine council, the Ugaritic stuff, the Ugaritic pantheon, giving them a pope too. Because 
it's not Baal who is Lord of the earth. It's Yahweh. Now, again, for my part, I, I do think that there is you know, something to this. Uh, there's no dispute that Canaanite literature existed at the time of the Exodus. So if you want Mosaic authorship, you know, you, there's no obstacle there. The issue is when the Israelites, or even Moses, when would they have really been exposed to Canaanite religion as an opposing system? That's much later. That's the time of the prophets, the monarchy. Certainly not in Egypt. Okay, they're, they're not exposed to Ugaritic religion in Egypt. You know, the full-blown Ellen Bale is a competition to Yahweh. That's going to be later. So again, I, I think what we have here is we have either an editorial hand or something going on, maybe an original, part of the original composition or an editorial hand that wants to loop in Ellen Bale, Canaanite thinking, into this story and say, Yahweh is not only better than the gods of Egypt, he's also better than these guys over here. You know, Yahweh is the one who is, again, at command. He takes his people you know, through the waters of chaos, through the chaos wilderness. He's, he's taking them to Zion. where that, that is where his abode is. That, that's the, the realm of God on earth, the high God, the most high, all this kind of stuff. But he's going to build his sanctuary there. And, and the Lord, Yahweh, will reign forever and ever. He is king of the whole world, not Baal. And I think that's entirely, you know, entirely possible. Um, and, and I wanted to sort of riff on this a little bit, because w- what you have here is, again, this is territory that those who are on this evolutionary trajectory perspective of Israelite religion, they're, they're going to sort of look at this and say, well, yeah, you know, the writer wants to do that because at one time, you know, he, he, has to, he has to sort of, you know, establish the fact that Yahweh is now king of all the nations. And that wasn't true at one time. Yahweh was just one of the council of El. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm, if you've read any of my articles, if, you, if you've read, you know, some of the, the other things that I have on the website, this is common, the common perspective of Israelite religion. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up, divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. And so those who, who believe Israel, Israelite thinking, specifically the biblical writers, not just the Joshua Israelite, but the biblical writers were, were once polytheists, that polytheism was orthodoxy, that Yahweh was just one of a number of gods. And, and here we have, we have the Most High, El Elyon, as a separate deity in Deuteronomy 32. And he gives Yahweh a little piece of the earth, and it happens to be Israel. But the Most High, El Elyon, and Yahweh are different deities because they were polytheists. Later on, Israel is going to evolve into the notion where all these names, all these, all these deities are fused into one, into Yahweh. And, there, and, there, and when that happens, well, Yahweh is Lord of all the earth because now, now there's only one God. And so the, you know, the, the critics will say Psalm 82 is about the Israelites evolving to this point of enlightenment where they kill off the other gods in Psalm 82 and only leave one, and that's Yahweh. So Psalm 82 for them is proof of, of uh, the defeat of polytheism in the mind of the biblical writers. Polytheism is no longer orthodox religion. Polytheism has been defeated. Now we have the, this wonderful breakthrough to monotheism. The lights have turned on. And so that allows that the critics, again, you know, to say, well, from that point on, they don't believe the other gods exist. You have an intolerant, exclusivistic monotheism. And so all talk of Elohim means that the other gods don't exist anymore. Again, I reject all that. And if you want to know why, you can go to my website, thedivinecouncil.com, read some conference papers and published articles and whatnot. Because there are, there are littered through that neat little picture a number of problems and inconsistencies. Things like assuming that Elohim, you know, plural Elohim, that they're all sort of you know, equal. That's an assumption. Assuming that, that El and El Yon, or you know, that, that Yahweh is a separate deity in Deuteronomy 32, that's an assumption. Because if you look, if you go back two verses, like, boy, boy, take the trek back two verses, you have El and Baal epithets both applied to Yahweh. Okay, it's very clear that the writer is not looking at Yahweh as a separate deity in Deuteronomy 32, 6 and 7. So why would he innate? And if you go to Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, Yahweh isn't given Israel. He takes it. It's his choice. Okay, there's all sorts of problems. I'm not, not going to rehearse all this stuff. You can go back and, and read this material. But if you're thinking that way, you look at what's going on in, in Exodus 15 here. And you don't just see a polemic here, you see an evolution out of polytheism, another evidence of this evolutionary trajectory. And I bring this up because it's kind of sad that there are folks in evangelicalism who are buying into this. And I, you know, I'm not saying that you can't you know, get the gospel and, you know, and, and think this way. I'm just saying that, that you're thinking that way because you've never examined the problems with the whole idea. You know, you're, you're, just, you're hearing this, and you're just buying into it, and you never get to where it doesn't work and why, and the circularity of the argument. And I, I want to zero in on one of these just for the rest of the episode. This notion in Exodus 15, Okay, I'll read it to you again. Exodus 15, 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. If the evolutionary trajectory is correct, then this idea that Yahweh is the God of all the nations over the earth, in effect that Yahweh now has become the most high, who divides up the nations, okay? You, if you think that is a late development after the exile, because you know, the exile, you know, they're, they're getting punished for this, and then out of the exile comes this breakthrough, breathtaking, wonderful idea of that the gods are all dead now and we have, we have only one. If this is what you're thinking, you're going to have some problems. There are other places in the Hebrew Bible where you have this language of Yahweh being king over all the nations that are clearly pre-exilic. They're pre-exilic. The king of the earth was a Baal title. And so what we have here is a polemic against Baal. Okay, Baal, of course, that the material is pre-exilic. And you have this idea show up because the biblical writers want to establish this point long before the exile. And 
there are just a number of indications that this is this is the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit from my second BBR article, Bulletin of Biblical Research. This is the one about uh, uh, co-regency in the Divine Council of Ugarit and how in the Hebrew Bible that idea was was repurposed. In the Ugaritic Council, you had Ellen Bale, two deities. Okay, Israelite Council did not tolerate that. You have Yahweh applying or occupying both slots. You have the invisible transcendent Yahweh, and you have the Yahweh that that's, that is appears as a man. They're both Yahweh from the from the get go. Okay, and Baal imagery again. Baal is the one who is anthropomorphized a lot too. You know, again, I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm just going to read a little bit as to how again this idea that Yahweh was over the whole earth is an old one. It's not late. It's it's not something that results from some breakthrough to monotheism, you know, after the exile, during or after the exile. So I wrote this. For example, terrestrial lordship is transparently stated in several enthronement psalms that date to well before the exilic period. Psalm 29.10 declares, quote, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. Okay, that's Psalm 29.10. The Lord there is Yahweh. If you're familiar at all, and scholars should be, with Israelite cosmology, you have the waters over the earth, you know, over the firmament. That's where the Lord sits. And the firmament covers all the nations, folks. Psalm 29 dips into Ugaritic you know, material. And it has this idea. I don't know that any, any scholar thinks that Psalm 29 is not pre-exilic. So you don't need an evolution to have this thought. It's already there. Yahweh is, is God over all the nations. There's no one higher that doles him one out. Okay? In Israelite cosmology, back to my article, the flood upon which Yahweh sat was the watery covering thought to be over the solid dome that enclosed the round flat earth. This throne obviously did not cover only Israel. As such, it cannot coherently be denied that the author viewed the foreign nations under the dome of the flood as being under the authority of Yahweh. The same kingship perspective is echoed in the Song of Moses in Exodus 15.11. Again, Exodus 15 is considered some of the oldest material in the Torah by the source critics. We encounter the rhetorical challenge, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Followed in verse 18 by the Lord will reign forever and ever. As Frank Moore Cross, who he's deceased now, but he was professor at the department chair at Harvard Near Eastern Studies for many years, as Cross noted many years ago, quote, the kingship of the gods is a common theme in early Mesopotamian and Canaanite epics. The common scholarly position that the concept of Yahweh as reigning or king is a relatively late development in Israelite thought seems untenable. Unquote. And I would agree. I think Cross puts his finger right on it. This is an old idea. Other pre exilic texts, this is me now, can be brought to the discussion. Psalm 47 2 not only declares that Yahweh is a great king over all the earth, but in so doing, it equates Yahweh with El Yon, the Most High. Quote, For the Lord Yahweh, the Most High, El Yon, is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. Not two great kings, a great king over all the earth. Verse 7, the same psalm adds, God is king of all the earth. This psalm belongs to the category labeled by scholars as enthronement psalms. J.J.M. J. M. Roberts argued that the psalm should be situated in the, quote, cultic celebration of Yahweh's imperial accession based on the relatively recent victories of David's age. David is pre exilic A narrative sampling of the same idea is readily available in the Deuteronomistic history, which is also pre exilic The writers of the DH, the Deuteronomistic history, presumed that Yahweh controlled the destiny of the nations targeted for removal from Canaan. Israel's pre-exilic biblical writers expressed the belief that Yahweh had defeated and banished the nations in Israel's land, an idea that presumes Yahweh was supreme over the gods of those nations. And as we have seen, the supremacy is cast anthropomorphically by means of the angel in whom was the name who is Yahweh. That's the end of, of my article portion. Again, I, I think we need to, you know, without you know, getting into names and podcasts and all this kind of stuff, this notion of this evolutionary trajectory within Israelite religion is, is seeping into evangelical thinking. Now again, this is not something that the gospel succeeds or fails on. And I've also written uh, and then said in interviews, look, on the one, you know, let's just pretend that Mike doesn't hold Mike's views. Let's just pretend that the evolutionary trajectory is correct. That is easy for an evangelical to handle. It's called progressive revelation. Is it, is it impossible that God could have told the biblical writers only limited information about himself? And then later on, as they get more information, they, start, they sort of figure out, okay, you know, like, you know, there's, you know, God is unique and you know, Yahweh is different than the other ones. And, and there's none like him. You know, before, you know, we were talking about councils. Is it possible that because God gives them more information that, that they, they go through this evolutionary arc? Sure, you can, you can look at it that way. I think you actually have a tough time if you actually pay attention to the text because you do not have that neat picture. And you certainly don't have it after the exile. Remember, Dead Sea Scrolls, you had 180 references to divine plurality. They didn't get the memo there. And those guys at Qumran were not liberals. They were not progressives. Okay, they were about as, as uptight about theology as you could possibly get. And they're not offended at all by the talk of divine plurality. And I would suggest the reason is because it has always been part of biblical thinking, biblical worldview, supernatural worldview. And they always viewed Yahweh, the biblical writers anyway, they always viewed him as unique among the gods because they don't view Elohim as a term that is connected to a specific set of unique attributes. That's not what the term means or signifies. The reason they, that the biblical writers use it of half a dozen different things, different entities, is because all it really means is that you are by nature a resident, a disembodied member disembodied inhabitant of the spiritual world. That's all it is. And that has nothing to do with polytheism as moderns conceive it. 
But people, and I'm including scholars here, have just have literally not thought about the topic. Literally haven't done it. Because it's it's repeated so often in biblical studies that people just reflexively conclude there's nothing to think about here. <laughs> On my Twitter feed today, I, I saw a New Testament textual critic, New Testament scholar, say this. If you repeat the idea that Gehenna was a garbage dump often enough, even scholars will begin to believe it. Again, his, his point is that there's no evidence for that. Well, I'll, I'll give you the Old Testament equivalent. If you hear often enough about the evolution from polytheism to monotheism in Israelite religion, you hear that often enough, even scholars will believe it. And most of them do. And, and now, again, we, we have evangelicals that just don't think really anything about this. And again, it's not like the gospel is in trouble here. It, it, it's not, because there's, a way, there's other ways to process this progressive revelation. I get it. I just think the whole thing is incoherent. I think it implodes on itself upon close examination, which is why I don't accept it. And again, this, is, this was the subject of my dissertation. It's just something that, for one reason or another, I wound up you know, seeing, thinking about, and then winding up doing a dissertation on it. Let's just jump in. I'm going to read uh, Exodus 15, verses 22 through 27, and then we'll you know, get into some of the content here. So we, I'm reading ESV again, and verse 22 starts like this. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what, that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. And that's the end of the chapter. That's verses 23 through, 22 through 27, end of chapter 15. And again, most people approaching this would you know, s- sort of fixate on the grumbling, and that would be your sermon content. There are a number of other things going on in here. And we're, you know, we can't hit all of them, uh, but I'm going to pick out a few uh, to sort of be trajectories for the rest of the episode. There's a really nice summary in Durham's commentary, his word biblical commentary about this that I want to read because it, it just has some good stuff in here and, and kind of you know, sets up why we're going to do what we do uh, in this episode. So he writes, the root of the continuation of Israel's journey in Exodus beyond the barrier of the Sea of Rushes, the Sea of Reeds, is no more clear to us than their route through and from the Nile Delta. Now, let me just stop there. You know, we've had a number of episodes in this now basically saying, hey, most of these place names aren't known. There are some that are. We've had a couple of episodes that deal with the, the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea problem, or the Reed Sea problem. Uh, last time, you know, we got into the uh, Egyptian cosmology as well. The, you know how the, the, the sea, you know, one of these bodies of waters that formed this, this barrier on uh, you know, the east eastern barrier, eastern boundary of Egypt there at the Delta, you know, extending from the Gulf of Suez, there was this, you know, sort of network or, you know, connect, you know, all these bodies of water that were connected to form part of the eastern border. And one of them, you know, to an Egyptian was the underworld. It represented the underworld. So we got into that last time. And there, there's a connection here, even in this passage, Shore, the wilderness of Shore. And that takes us back to what we talked about last time with that particular underworld body of water. And again, there, there are scholars who know this information and prefer that particular body of water because, again, it's symbolism. Um, there's just a lot of that kind of stuff going on. But outside of that, you know, these, these places, this network of bodies of water, most of the places, you know, are just unknown, you know, where they go. So Durham's right, you know, what they do after they pass is no more clear to us than basically anything else here. So back to Durham, he continues and says, once again, the narrators have gone to some length, verses 22, 23, 27, and also number 33, to make the direction of the journey clear to us, but places and landmarks that were clear to them are clear to us no longer. Several identifications of Mara and Elim have been attempted, but not one of them is convincing. The location of Sinai, equally uncertain, is of course a determining factor. And again, just breaking in here, we talked about that last time, how all of this is connected to Sinai and the difficulties of finding that location. Durham continues, if the traditional view of you know, the location of Sinai is followed, we must pose a route east, then south from the delta. If Sinai is located at Kadesh or in Edom, Seir, a direction more nearly due east is likely. And again, we've talked about that as well. Durham says, this question remains unanswered, not only because of the uncertainty surrounding the geography of the places mentioned, but also because, as the studies of Coates, Davies, and Walsh, he cites three articles there, and Cross, Cross's book. So as the studies of these four sources have shown, there are at least two and perhaps three travel sequences that give evidence in themselves of some independence from the Tetratugal. That's a, again, that's just the, you know, a way of referring again to, to the books of the Torah, certain books of the Torah, you know, from the sources generally posed. So you know, the JEDP thing is what he's talking about there. So he's saying, look, you know, even in the Torah, you've got two or three possible ways to reconstruct an itinerary. Once you get past that problem, most of the place names in these, these itineraries are not known. So good luck with that. You know, that, that's essentially what Durham is saying. It, it summarizes you know, what we've said in several episodes up to this point. So rather than spend our time you know, talking about, hey, where is Mara? Hey, where is Aileen? I want to get into the, you know, how an, an ancient reader, what, what they would have been thinking, especially in relation to the last verse, you know, the, the 12 you know, springs and the, the 70 palm trees and Aileen, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, how that would have 
set their imaginations you know on, on fire that, that that they would have been thinking certain thoughts immediately when they hit that verse and not only just that verse but but the whole you know kind of the way this thing is set up from the crossing to this paradise place you know this, this little mini itinerary here verses 22 through 27 and i i've put a uh, i'll put this in the protected folder uh there's an article by bernard robinson now, there isn't much written on verses 22 through 27 specifically and this is one of the few items that, that is and i don't always agree with uh, robinson's assessment but again since it's one of the few sources that you can actually get that gets into the you know symbolism uh, of these verses i'm gonna uh, i'll put it in the protected folder the, the title of the article is symbolism in exodus 15 22 through 27 and it comes from the uh, scholarly journal review biblique volume 94 number three it's 1987 and pages 376 through 388 now i'll be dipping into robinson a little bit as we go go along several places but he uh you know, he kind of sets up where he's going, and so it kind of sets up where we're going early on in his article. So let me read a paragraph or two here as to you know, how he gets, gets going. He writes, the story begins at 1522 with, uh, the, with the Israelites striking camp at the Yam Suf, and Sea of Reeds, Red Sea, however we translate that, and reaches its climax after several ordeals with the opposite activity, Israel's pitching camp by the waters of Elim. That's verse 27. As if to say that the theme of the narrative is, in Kasudo's words, from the peril of the Sea of Reeds to the safe dwelling place by the waters of the wells of Aileen, unquote. So he's quoting Kasuda there, which is a, he's a famous Jewish commentator. Israel's journeyings between verses 22 and 27 are beset with hazards. No sooner has she escaped from pursuing Egyptians than she is in danger of death by thirst. She finds water, but it is rendered drinkable only by divine interposition. She is warned by Yahweh that she herself is in danger of incurring the plagues experienced by the Egyptians unless she obeys the divine commandments, which will presently be proclaimed on Sinai. Immediately, however, after Yahweh has pronounced himself her healer, she is brought safely to the shady oasis of Elim. Now, just by virtue of that little bit of an introduction, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. I'm going to tweak all of that a little bit. And here's my take on verses 20 through, 22 through 27. And this will telegraph a little bit more for this audience where we're going to go here and where Robinson ultimately goes. I would say that verses 22 through 27 are a capsule presentation and also a bit of a preview of later deliverance and sustenance of the escape from Sheol or death. That is the Yam Suf. Remember our, our previous episode on Exodus 15, the Shehor. And that, that body of water that represented the underworld, the, the realm of the dead. So Israel escapes through that. They are delivered from death. They are delivered from the underworld. So they're delivered from that, and then they go out into the wilderness, the place of chaos. And they're delivered from the wilderness chaos threats as well, where they don't have good water. Sometimes they don't have food. So God delivers them from, from the underworld, from the realm of the dead. He delivers them from chaos threats out of the desert. And he brings them to salvation in the cosmic abode or the divine abode. Now, we think that that means Sinai. And then ultimately Canaan, but th- these these few verses are a precursor to those things to Sinai. Uh, it reminds us that God not only has God delivered His people Israel, who basically are reborn to life now, but what He wants is for a human family to dwell with Him and He with them. And so we get this cosmic, you know, mountain imagery, this divine council imagery, this divine abode imagery at the end of this little section, verses twenty-two through twenty-seven, uh, because God is taking them again from death, from chaos, to His abode, to where He is. He's sustaining them with food and water. And ultimately, he wants them home. He wants them where he is. And, and you get the 12 springs, the 70 palm trees. And again, it's a depiction of the lush, well-watered paradise garden. It's an Edenic depiction. Um, so we, we've talked a lot in Unseen Realm. Again, if you haven't read Unseen Realm, you, you just got to get up to speed. You know, either that or read Supernatural, because I can't be, keep repeating the content of the book in these episodes. But there's a reason why Eden is described as both a well-watered garden, on a, you know, where there's an abundance of food, and a mountain. Scripture describes Eden as both. And the reason for that is because gardens and mountains are places of divine dwelling in ancient Near Eastern thought. They dwell in, the gods dwell in the best places where there is no want, and they dwell in the most remote, inaccessible places where there aren't any people. Because the divine abode is not for people, but the, the Israelite version of this, the Hebrew Bible version of this, is an exception. God wants people. He actually installs humans from the very beginning of the story in his abode. He wants a human family. And then when that gets ruined you know, by rebellion, not just in Genesis 3, but a series of other supernatural and and human rebellions in the primeval story, the rest of the Old Testament, the rest of the Bible, is about God restoring his original desire, You know, God working his original plan. There is no plan B. God wants a human family, he wants them with him, and he wants to be with them. So you, you get th- those ideas played out in various scenes throughout the Bible. And this is, again, a little encapsulation of a much bigger scene, because the bigger scene is, well, you know, Israel as a nation, you know, and Israel was, was chosen because of the rebellion at Babel, and you know, the, the nations assigned to the sons of God who become corrupt and have to be dealt with, and blah, 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 Psalm 82. And so you know, God turns around and takes Israel, you know, as his portion through Abraham, his choice of Abraham, his supernatural enabling of Abraham and his wife, Sarah, to have a, have a child. And out of that child is going to be his, his new, really newly reconstituted human family. And then God is trying to get Abraham to the place where God has chosen to put his name to dwell. And he, he wants them to dwell with him. You know, we get the, you know, there, God appears to them and to the patriarchs where? By trees, well-watered gardens or mountains. Okay. Again, the, the, these themes ripple through the Bible 
And they are designed to telegraph the fact that God wants to be with his human family and he wants his human family with him. Eventually, you know, that morphs into a nation and a monarchy and blah, you know, so on and so forth. So these things, again, in the Old Testament just ripple through. And then we get the New Testament, how they are ultimately completed or completed in, a, in an anticipatory way. They're inaugurated, waiting a, a full consummation through Jesus and the coming of the Spirit and so on and so forth. So this is, these are all the core stock elements of, of the supernatural meta narrative of the Bible. And we get in these few verses, 22 through 27, it's told in capsule form. The deliverance from death, deliverance from chaos, and now we're at the place where God dwells. His family is with him. That's the point, and that's what's being telegraphed in verses 22 through 27. And it's hard for us to pick that out unless we're sensitive to garden imagery 1270. You know, the, the, these, the numbers and the imagery mean something. Even Elim, which is, you know, plural for gods, <laughs> you know, how much, how much more can it be telegraphed? Now, granted, you know, if you actually you know, look at the spelling, you, know, you have Elim uh, in Hebrew instead of Elim. It, but there are places elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible where you get the, the absence of the, you know, sorry for the Hebrew spasm here, but the absence of the Yod before the Mem at the, at the ending, where an, an emendation really needs to be made, you know, because of something else in the passage where you actually have, you know, gods there. But in this case, you know, it's, it's fine to say it's just wordplay between two different words, Elim and Elim, but you have the 12 and the 70. And, you know, again, the, the, the Semitic, the Hebrew reader is going gonna, is gonna to catch the wordplay immediately. This is the dwelling of, of God. This is the divine abode. This is what it looks like. Springs of water, 70 palm trees again in the 12. The 70 and the 12 are going to matter here, and we're going to hit those. So what I want to do for the rest of the episode is talk about the water and the trees and the numbers and, you know, again, sort of flesh this out a little bit. But what, what you have essentially, again, my tweak here you know, that, that Robinson's beginning is you, you get, you know, sort of the supernatural meta narrative in just a few verses, you know, the, the main, main themes, the core ideas anyway. So what Robinson does after his intro is he proceeds to venture into a discussion of the symbolism. And his, again, I think that the very next paragraph, once he gets into symbolism, is useful for illustrating um, the difference between what the rabbis are doing and what the early church is doing and what we ought to be doing. Again, taking, this, taking the text in its own original context rather than sort of making stuff up. And w- Robinson writes this. Again, I just think this is a good illustration. The early Jewish and Christian commentators frequently found symbolism in the Mara and Elim narratives. Thus, a number of the Jewish writers saw in our passage a symbolic message about the Torah, usually to the effect that without the Torah, the people's life was bitter. Until at Mara, Yahweh gave them an advanced installment of the laws and sweetened their lives with the tree of life, which is the Torah. And then at Elim, they, they then studied the laws that they had recently received. Okay, well, that really isn't in the text. Okay, and, and of course, if you're, if you're a rabbi, what do you, what do you, everything's about the Torah. If you're a Christian, everything's about Jesus. So, so Robinson continues, he says, The Christian fathers tended, for their part, to see in the tree of Marah a symbol of the cross of Christ. For them, the bitter waters usually symbolize the letter of the law, which the cross would sweeten. And the twelve springs at Elim stood for the truth that paradise is to be reached only through the work of the twelve apostles of Christ. Well, really? Uh, again, you can see how both the Jewish community and the early Christian community could take this passage and spin it to their, 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 their core theological commitments, the Torah and then, and then the cross, okay? But what I'm saying is the passage doesn't, doesn't talk about any of that. If you're reading it, you know, again, in light of the worldview context of the writer, you're not going to get either of those things. You're going to get something different, just as significant, and, and it might have some peripheral connection to some of that. But that isn't, you know, the, the stuff that the rabbis are talking about and the early church was talking about, that, that is just not what the passage means. It's not what the passage is doing. So I think it's a good illustration of you know, how these later traditions basically just allegorize the Bible a lot. And they, you know, this is going to sound harsh, but they just make stuff up. You don't need to make stuff up. But what you need to do is you need to, again, try to approach the text and, and, and read it, again, with the thoughts of antiquity, you know, the original ancient context in your head, and then you get something out of it. So that's all we're trying to do here in the podcast. It's all you know, we're trying to do in Unseen Realm. And I think, uh, again, if, especially if you've read Unseen Realm, you know the difference. And this is a little bit of a glimpse of the difference. So the rabbinic approach, let's just talk a little bit more about this. You know, it is something of a leap. I would say not as much as the Christian thing you know, about the cross and the apostles, but it's still a leap. The Torah is never represented as in the Old Testament as a tree, for one thing. However, wisdom, and it's not the same word as Torah. Wisdom is chokhmah, okay? Wisdom is associated with tree language, that's true, but the Torah is never called a tree. You know, wisdom is referred to as a tree of life, Proverbs 3.18, but the Torah isn't mentioned. That would be a great place if you were writing that proverb to use the word Torah so that nobody could miss it, but they don't do that, and they just don't do that. Um, so... You know, this is the kind of thing that you can look at, and and, and the Christian you know, version as well. Oh, boy, I would have never seen Jesus and the apostles in Exodus fifteen twenty two through twenty seven. Well, that's because they aren't there. Uh, but but again, if, if you if you say it eloquently, or if you you know are in the in the rabbinic community and you start talking about this this stuff, you start allegorizing the passage eloquently. Then, then the, your, the people in your community are going to sort of glom onto it and think that it makes sense, even though they don't really have a textual rabbit trail to trace back to the idea. Again, that that's the problem. So let's get into the real conceptual metaphors here and see what they do telegraph. And I'm going to reiterate again the point I made a few minutes ago so it's fresh in our minds. This is a capsule presentation of the deliverance from the realm of the dead, deliverance from, from the underworld, from death, through, you know, continuing on through, for deliverance from, uh, from chaos, you know, chaos threats. In, in their case, the Israelites' case, no water, no food, ultimately to salvation with God, you know, salvation in the cosmic abode, the divine abode, 
Um, and that, that idea is telegraphed. The fact that Aileen is, is, a, is a divine abode is telegraphed through the symbolism of the 12 and the 70 and the water and the palm trees. These are all motifs associated with the divine council, the divine abode, so on and so forth. Now, Robinson picks up on some of this, and he points us first to the fact that Mara and Aileen, the section, mention water six times. I mean, that, that's a lot for just a small number of verses. And so he wonders about a symbolic point of reference in view of that repetition. You know, what, what might it suggest, he asks. So he goes first you know, to, the, to the sort of most obvious, and that is water is a life-giving and life-sustaining thing, especially in an arid you know, culture, an arid you know, place, people who are used to living in that, in that kind of climate. You know, so that's the literal aspect of the water, and that's kind of obvious. But Old Testament references to water you know, point readers to God's spirit and presence as well. They, they do that in other passages. So I'm, I'm just going to read a few. You have Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. But he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So, you know, in Isaiah 55, again, this is part of the, the, the servant, you know, stuff. And it's, it's referring to more than just getting a bucket of water. It's referring to everything you need, okay? Everything you need. And, and you get that by going to where the Lord is. And again, it's going it's to start talking about temple and so on and so forth. Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Again, so water, again, being linked to the spirit as a conceptual metaphor. Jeremiah 2, 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. It's a reference to idolatry. So they've traded me in, the, you know, the, the fountain of living waters for you know, the, these things they create themselves. So it, it's, it's equating the divine presence with water. And, and obviously, if you read a verse like that, the fountain of living waters, who do you think of? Well, as Christians, we think of Jesus because he uses the same phrase, same idea you know, in, his, in the, water, the, the woman at the well passage in John 4. You have Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So on and so forth. You know, I, put my, I will put my spirit within you. So there again, we have water being used as a vehicle to talk about the presence of God, the spirit of God. Ezekiel 47, you got the first nine verses. I'm not going to read all of them, but you have, you have this, this supernatural stream of, of water flowing from the temple. Again, it, it, the temple imagery there, if, if you want to go back and listen to our series on Ezekiel, you know, I'd recommend we did two, two episodes on Ezekiel 40 through 48, the temple imagery there. And the, the first one deals with the difficulties of taking chapters 40 through 48, literally, you know, the, the, sort of the conundrums they create and the shortcomings that has. And then the second one loops Ezekiel 40 through 48 into New Testament temple talk, which focuses first on Jesus and then on the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, which is the church. And you get, again, this, you get the imagery you know, of, of, of the temple you know, associated with the fountain of living waters. Well, that's how Jesus refers to himself. And it's also how he refers to believers, those who believe in him. You know, I'll, I'll cause you know, springs of living water to flow up and well up within you. Again, this is it's actually consistent kind of language. It's just applied to Jesus and to the body of Christ on a bigger, more grander uh, scale. You know, so, so this is the kind of thing that we need to be aware of, we need to be thinking about. And in the Old Testament, the point for today is you do have pl- passages that talk about water, and what they're really referring to is the presence of God and the Spirit of God. So while, sure, you know, water is the literal source of life, I get it. God is the life source, <laughs> is also conveyed by water imagery and God's presence. Where God is, there is life. Again, th- th- this is going to mentally take us back into you know, garden imagery, like in Eden, that the presence of God was there. Why? Because that's where God lives. It's the divine abode. And, and you describe the divine abode through this garden, well-watered garden imagery you know, that we get with Eden and so on and so forth. It's just, these are classic elements of divine council descriptions in the wider ancient Near Eastern literature and in the Hebrew Bible. And this is where God is. And so we're going to use these, you know, these metaphors, these things like water and, and, and springs to take our minds back to the paradise that is the divine abode. That's what the description of Elim is about, uh, to make us think of that. Now, the idea, of course, is reinforced by the palm trees. In this passage, verse 27, there are 70 of them. And yeah, it's interesting, and we'll come back to this, that 70 is the number of the sons of God, you know, members of, of El's council, at Ugar. Again, everybody, everybody who's in the Israelite religion pretty much knows that. In the Hebrew Bible, it's the number of the nations assigned to the sons of God by Yahweh. And reading Deuteronomy 32.8 with the Septuagint and, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls before them. Again, the, the number 70 there is, is telling. It's the number of, of the nations you know, that, that were abandoned, disinherited, by God. And then what does God do in the very next you know, breath, so to speak? That's when he calls Abraham and creates for himself a new human family. And the rest, you know, humanity to that point is put under placeholders. And we know that doesn't go well because of Psalm 82 and some other passages. You know, we, we have this situation here where the ideal, God over the nations, over, over all people, the fulfillment of the Edenic idea. What was the idea in Eden? God comes to earth. This is what Eden is. Eden is not the whole world. Eden is a little, little place in the world. God comes to this garden that he has made. He has put humanity in it. He tells humanity, okay, multiply now, be fruitful and multiply. And, and then go out and subdue the earth. Now, the, the garden well, it doesn't need to be subdued. You, you don't have the subduing language of the garden. You have a, you still have a partnership idea. You still have working and, and you know, maintaining it. But the rest of the world needs to be subdued. It's a, word, it's a word that you would use for chaos, you know, a, a word that you would use for something that needs to be made better or tamed. 
And so the, the original mission is that here's where you live. This is our house. This is our headquarters, this place called Eden. God is with man. Man is with God. And God wants every human being, all of the, the children that come from Adam and Eve, he wants all humanity to enjoy him and his presence so he can enjoy them. He wants the whole world, all the nations, to be like Eden. Of course, that isn't what happens, right? But the numbering of them here, you know, the fact that we've got it at, at Aileen, we've got the number 70, which corresponds to the number of nations, telegraphs the idea that you know, God really wanted and still wants all of the nations home with him. This is the original Edenic idea. Now just cast to reflect the situation that there are nations out there who are not literal ethnic descendants of Abraham, that God still wants, but they're outsiders now. You know, but they still belong here. And th- these, these things are really hard to miss if you're thinking in ancient Near Eastern Hebrew Bible terms. Now, Robinson writes this, the image of the sacred tree, and Robinson is going to quote E.O. James, is, quote, an integral and recurrent feature in one form or another at all times in most states of culture, unquote, and rests upon, quote, the conception of an ultimate source of self-renewing life at the center of the cosmos, unquote. The tree, often represented as planted on the top of a mountain and standing beside a plentiful supply of water, symbolized everywhere the continual renewal of life and the divine power that affects this. It also represented the hope of personal immortality, whether as a realistic aspiration, you know, the Egyptians viewed this positively, but of course, I mean, let me just jump in here. Of course, where do they drown? You can, again, if, if you know, they, they drown, they die. In, if, if the crossing, and again, you, you can tell, I, I, I find this really attractive. If the body of water is Shehor, they wind up in their own underworld. And we talked last time about how you know, the, the, the dead in Egyptian texts are, talk about, are described as drowned ones. <laughs> you know, it doesn't turn out very positively for them. And it telegraphs, again, who is ultimately in control of life and death. It isn't the gods of Egypt. Okay, it's Yahweh of Israel. So again, back to, to what uh, Robinson is saying, you know, this was viewed, personal immortality was, was viewed positively in Egypt, or as an illusion or a lost cause, you know, like in the Gilgamesh story, the Mesopotamians had a very negative view of this. But they still had, again, these, these stories like Gilgamesh, which has a tree of life, you know, this plant, the plant of youth that can ostensibly give more immortality, but it's lost and so on and so forth. You know, what Robinson is saying here, just, just to end it, what he says, is that you know, the, the, the palm trees, the tree idea, is a stock element of, of all these things. You know, the, the renewal of life, the hope of life, life sustenance, and even immortality. Uh, he also points out Carol Myers in her work has shown the pervasive presence of sacred tree imagery in Israel, where it came to, to have several specific positive connotations. Now, if you're able to find these sources, again, I, I often recommend sources to, to this audience. Uh, E.O. James, The Tree of Life, an Archaeological Study. It was written in 1966. It's really hard to find. If you find it used online, it's going to be expensive, so good luck. Uh, however, Carol Meyer's book, The Tabernacle Menorah, subtitled A Synthetic Study of a Symbol from the Biblical Cult, 1976, that is still available for a, a reasonable price. And it's, it's really excellent. It's, it's tree imagery. It's the menorah. It's the tabernacle. It's, it's just a great, it's a great work. It situates all that stuff, again, in a, in a wider ancient Near Eastern context. Now, as far as, let, let's take a little sidebar here on tree imagery, because in, in the Faith Life Study Bible, again, I've, I've written a lot of notes for that thing. I actually wrote a sidebar on sacred trees uh, in Israelite religion. So I'm going to read that. It's, it's short. Um, but again, it, it just gives you the idea of some of the things that a book like you know, Carol Meyer's work on the menorah, the stuff that she would get into, uh, tree imagery in the Hebrew Bible and what it signifies. So I wrote this. The, the little sidebar is called Sacred Trees in Israelite Religion. The narratives about the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, provide insights into the faith of God's people before the establishment of the priesthood, tabernacle, and law. Trees play a particularly interesting role in this faith. Sites marked by trees often become, became associated with the appearances of Yahweh that involved divine revelation. Again, the, just to break in here, the idea, again, is that the trees signify the place of divine encounter where God is. And it, it ultimately, 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 all these went back to Eden because God was with man in a garden that had lots of trees. Okay? For example, continuing with the sidebar, in Genesis 12, 6 and 7, the oak at Shechem commemorated Yahweh's appearance to Abram with the promises of the covenant. Later in Genesis 35, 4, it marked the place where Jacob buried his family's idols to fulfill a vow to Yahweh. Due to these events, the oak at Shechem became a sacred site. It was considered a place of divine residence and encounter many years after the patriarchs. In Joshua 24, 25 through 27, Joshua erected a stone at the Oak of Shechem containing a portion of the word of God. The site was chosen for its significance as a holy place. The Hebrew is Mikdash, sanctuary, for the God of Israel. In Judges 9, 5 through 6, Gideon's son of Imelech was declared king, quote, by the Oak of the Pillar at Shechem, unquote. The pillar at the town of Shechem also appears later in the same chapter. There, the tree is associated with divine revelation, Judges 9, 34 through 37. Judges 4, 4 through 5 contains a similar association of a tree with divine revelation. There, the prophetess Deborah customarily sat under, quote, the palm tree of Deborah, unquote. To fulfill her ministry. In 2 Samuel 5, 24 and 25, God tells David to listen for the sound of marching in the tops of balsam trees as a sign to attack the Philistines. The guidance was supernatural. Later in Israel's history, the land was apparently dotted with trees or pillars to mimic a tree to mark the location of false gods in their place of worship. These, quote, high places, unquote, and their pillars, Matzavot, were ubiquitous. Pagan tree symbols were particularly associated with the goddess Asherah. 1 Kings 14.23, 2 Kings 17.10, so on and so forth. This unfortunate evolution profaned a sacred symbol of Israel and Yahweh's presence with the nation. God angrily spewed out judgment on such places in Ezekiel 6.13, for example. So that, that's the end of the sidebar. But again, why, why trees? 
Well, you could say, well, that's where God chooses to appear. Well, some of these places are only planted after the encounter. You, you, would, you would either appear at a place with, with a tree or plant a tree to commemorate a divine encounter to take the mind back to Eden, okay, to the cosmic garden, the garden which is God's abode. That is why you would do it. This is why the tabernacle gets decorated with, lo and behold, garden stuff, okay, the menorah, tree of life, you know, even, even the bread of the presence. Why, how is that a garden image? Because there was lots to eat in Eden. And, and the bread of the presence is the bread of the presence. God is the sustainer of life. As it was at the beginning, so it is now here in the tabernacle. This is the, the, the miniature you know, home of God now. It's the portable, the portable Eden. And how do we know this is, again, coherent? Because when they build the temple, the temple gets decorated like a garden. Plants and animals. You know, of course, the, you know, you've got the menorah there. You've got the ark. You know, the ark with, with, you know, guarded the entrance to Eden. And you know, all these things are not accidental. They are designed to take the mind back to the cosmic garden, also referred to as a mountain and in Ezekiel, because this is where God dwells. This is where God dwells. And not only that, but it's where he wants you. It's where he wants his human family. So, you know, again, I would encourage you to, to get into this kind of material because it really helps. Now, James, just to elaborate on him a little bit more and, and Robinson's use of him. And this goes some interesting directions uh, beyond what we've already talked about. You know, James tends to see the, the sacred tree idea in any wooden member of the plant kingdom. That might be going too far. I'm not sure that's solid, but it's fair to say, you know, in fairness to him, that the ancient Near Eastern imagery about trees isn't always depicted artistically as something that looks like, for example, an oak tree, something really big and solid. A lot of times, sacred tree imagery is a smaller plant. That's true. Plant or a bush. Bush. What does that make us think of? A bush. Ah, Exodus 3. Again, and James goes here. You know, Exodus 3, this is where Yahweh is. Yahweh is in the burning bush. So James and Robinson suggest that the burning bush manifests by means of both the tree and the fire. Fire, again, is, a, is a, an element associated with divine presence. They think that the, this is part of cosmic tree imagery. It's the presence of Yahweh. You know, fair enough. I would say Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 16. Again, it's kind of interesting. Let me read that. Uh, this is uh, Moses speaking about Joseph, the tribe, or that, without getting into how the tribes are parsed here. And of Joseph, he said, blessed by the Lord be his land with the choicest gifts of heaven above and of the deep that crouches beneath, with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, with the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph, on the pate of him who is prince among his brothers. Kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I'm no farmer. I'm no you know, horticulturalist. But it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot that's grown on mountains. But the line here, the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills. The favor of him who dwells in the bush. <laughs> Again, James and Robinson are going to go back to a passage like this and say, look, but, yeah, you can grow stuff there, okay. But, but it's really designed to cast God as the, the sustainer of life. And, and the mountain imagery combined with the abundance imagery is cosmic mountain, cosmic garden language. And here it's, it's part of a blessing on Joseph you know, and his progeny. And James goes on, and again, this is really interesting. He suggests that this is the point of Exodus 17, where Moses' rod, which he refers to as a portable symbol of the tree, because it's made from a tree, is successfully raised aloft as a victory banner in the battle against Amalek. Now that I find really interesting, because that's kind of a bizarre passage, you know, where they have to keep Moses' arms up and you can say, well, that's because, you know, this is the, the, this is the rod that God gave him. At, oh, yeah, that's right. He gave it to him at Sinai and God was in the bush. Oh, yeah. You can say, well, yeah, it's because the rod had power. God's using the rod. And that's all true. But what James and Robinson are angling for here is, hey, where's that thing made from? It's made from a tree. It, 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 again, it, it's, it's like a, a talisman kind of thing in that it's a thing you carry with you to remind you of a tree. And when you think of the tree, you think of the divine presence. And so Moses raising, you know, the rod above. Yes, that's what God told him to do. But there's a little bit more that goes into the worldview thinking here. It's a symbol of the presence of God and the power of God, not just because Moses happened to have it with him at the bush encounter, but because of, of, of its material, you know, what, what it is, just you know, intrinsically. So again, I, I don't know if, you, if they're pressing some of that too far, but it, it's interesting. I think it's really worth thinking about. You know, there's another trajectory here. There's actually a couple more that I want to hit. Israel herself. You know, remember, Israel collectively as a nation is called the son of God when Moses and Aaron go in before Pharaoh, uh, before you know, the plagues start. Let, you know, my son, God says, let my son go out into the desert, you know, three days and worship me and so on and so forth. So Israel collectively is the son of God. And, and that is connected to tree language, both collectively and individually. Um, I don't know if, you, if we've realized this, but that's true. So let me, let me just read you a few examples here. You know, there, there's, there's tree language associated with the nation or with, you know, parts of the nation, individuals. And, and along with that is planting language. Again, this is, I, I wish I, I had the right term. I want to say horticulture, but I don't think that's the right term. But anyway, it, this is, these are terms that you would associate with the nurture and care of trees, okay, of planted, you know, things, you know, substantial planted things, okay? That's an awkward way of saying this, and somebody's going to give me the right word later on. It'll be too late then. But Exodus 15, 17 says this, you will bring them in, again, this is Moses, the Song of Moses, again, talking about what God's going to do with the nation. You will bring them in and plant to them, where? In a field somewhere? No, on your own mountain. There's the garden and the mountain imagery again. 
You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. That's Exodus 15, 17. Talking about the nation, using planting language. Second Samuel 7, 10. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And the parallel to that is 1 Chronicles 17, 9. Psalm 80, verses 8 through 11. You, O God, you know, okay, brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. It's cosmic garden and cosmic mountain imagery applied to, not, not necessarily God or God's own place, but it is God's place because it's applied to God's family, God's people. Again, this is all, these are all little forays. or they, they, they're, they're, The launching point for all of this stuff is the original Edenic vision that God has. That we have like, in the early chapters of Genesis. Uh, Isaiah 44, 3 through 5, I will pour water on the thirsty land, and streams on the dry ground, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. And we read this before about the spirit, I will pour out my spirit. But, but notice the, again the, the agricultural terminology pour water, pour out my spirit. They will spring up among the grass like willows. That's verse 4. You know, Israel will spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. Okay? This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. Another will write on his hand the Lord's and then name himself and name himself by the name of Israel. Jeremiah 24, 6, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Hosea 14, 6 through 8, his shoots, like you know, think of you know, roots or something like that, his shoots or branches shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and shall and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the, the wine of Lebanon. Okay. Oh, Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. So I mean, there you have God as a reference, probably messianic you know, as a reference, and the nation itself as a reference, again, using the same kind of language. Amos 9.15, I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. You know, so even the, the people collectively, the people of God themselves, get this kind of language applied to them. And again, it's because this is what God wanted originally in Eden. He wanted a family. Now, the one you're, you're probably still thinking about, the, the outlier here, is Messiah. Can have, have you thought about Messiah in connection with this tree language? The Messiah is likened to a tree or a branch in a number of passages. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to read these to you and, and note that there are several of them that also combine the branch language with God's mountain. Again, that's not a coincidence. Isaiah 4.2, in that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. Isaiah 11.1, 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 11, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire and his resting place shall be glorious. So there you have branch, you have tree imagery of the Messiah and also mountain imagery you know, for both the Messiah and the people of God. Jeremiah 23, 5, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Ezekiel 17, 22 through 23, thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird, and in the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. If you've got this humongous, larger than life tree that God plants. Zechariah 6.12, say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Again, it's, it's messianic imagery. It, again, we don't often think of things like this. You know, even, even in Unseen Realm, you know, when I talked about, you know, cosmic mountain motifs and the cosmic garden, you know, I, I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot here that I didn't include there. You, you just can't put everything in. This is why I say I've got enough material for two or three more books. You know, it, there's just so much of this kind of stuff. And, and here we, we've gone from a reference to palm trees at Elim, of course, with the springs of water, to, to what? To places of divine encounter, to echoes of Eden, to the people of God, to Messiah, again, to, to, the, to the land itself where, where these people are supposed to dwell and God with them. All of these things are connected. And the thread that runs through them in, in, the, in the verses that we've read here is tree and planting imagery. And this is part of the ancient Near Eastern, specifically here, the Hebrew Bible worldview. This, this, is, this is part of the, the complex of ideas, the matrix of ideas. That if, if it's in your head, when you encounter a verse like Exodus 15, 27, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be thinking of the Torah. You're not going to be thinking of, of the cross, even though the cross is, you know, was made from a tree. You know, there's a negative side of that curse. There's everyone that's hanged on a tree and so on and so forth. You know, I get that. But the positive side of, of the tree metaphor is really what you should be fixed on. And you, know, you, can, you can do that with the cross, obviously. 
But that isn't what's actually, what's actually you know, going through the mind of someone pre-Jesus who reads Exodus 15, 27. They're thinking about the divine abode, though. And if it's a later Israelite you know, who has more of the Hebrew Bible, they might be thinking about Messiah, dwelling place of God, being planted in the land. I mean, all these things are important ideas. Uh, that you don't you don't have to allegorize the passage. Is my point. There's there's just plenty of material here, biblical theological material, to track on uh, in your own personal study or preaching or whatever. Now Robinson writes this. Given then the considerable symbolic importance of the old in the Old Testament of water and trees, it seems entirely reasonable to ask <laughs> whether the stories of Marah and Elim, which each contain references to both a tree or trees and water, have a symbolic reference. You know, I'd agree. That's, that's quite reasonable. This interpretation, Robinson says, indeed to me, seems to be already attested within the Old Testament itself. In Isaiah twelve three, okay, let's just read that. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Okay. In Isaiah 12, 3, immediately after a reference to the crossing of the Reed Sea, that's in Isaiah 11, 15, and 16, and to the singing of the Song of Moses, that's the first two verses of Isaiah 12, we have the phrase, with joy, you will draw water from the springs of salvation. And he's, what he's saying here is that that's a reference to Elam in the itinerary. It's the place of salvation. Well, how would it be the place of salvation? Because of the symbology that is in verse 27 when Elam is mentioned. It's the divine abode. It's the presence of God. That's why it's springs of salvation, the place of salvation. It symbolizes, again, where salvation is, where eternal life is. That would be with God. That would, again, that's the original Edenic vision. Let's talk a little bit about the number 12. If the water and trees point to the divine abode, okay, the divine presence, and by extension, the divine counsel, again, where, where you know, God's entourage is in his abode, as his abode is also his throne room in Scripture. And of course, you know, we have plenty of instances where we have members of the heavenly host with, you know, with God in his throne room where he runs the show. If that's true, and all those things are you know, in Scripture, then the number 12 here seems transparently to speak of the inclusion of Israel, the inclusion of Israel, the 12 tribes, in God's family. Israel is the product of Abraham, whom God chose to restart his human family after divorcing the nations of Babel. You know, that really makes complete conceptual sense to include the number 12 in, in this little description of, of Aileen, you know, where God is, his family, his house. To include the number 12 there would make perfect sense because that would be the 12 tribes, and the 12 tribes are the restarting of the human family God wanted after he had to abandon humanity at Babel. Now, Robinson says the number 12 was generally taken by Jewish commentators to contain a reference to the 12 tribes, and I think it very improbable that this is a late conceit, Robinson says. For I cannot believe that any reader of the text in the Old Testament period would have failed to make the connection. I, again, I'd agree with that. This is not a late invention. You don't need that. This is going to be transparent. Now, I would say, just as my own little rabbit trail, i got a couple of rabbit trails here. In case somebody out there in the, in the listenership wants to presume that this means salvation by ethnicity, you know, that, that they're defining election that way. Oh, you're a Jew, you're elect, you're going to be in heaven. You know, it actually requires the opposite. One could not be worshiping another god and be part of Yahweh's home. Yahweh shares his fathership with no other. Israel is supposed to be utterly separate from the gods of the nations, and so believing loyalty which you know, I, I discussed this in Unseen Realm a good bit. Believing loyalty, as always, is the point of salvation talk, not ethnicity, not law-keeping. You can't merit salvation. You must believe and worship no other. Okay, It's believing loyalty. In the Old Testament, you believe that Yahweh was the God of gods. He is who he says he is, and he has chosen to be in covenant relationship with us, and we will worship no other. We will assign our faith for our eternal destiny to him and his covenant. Not by being born into it. We must believe this stuff and not worship another. It's believing loyalty. And it's very consistent. And it's consistent even into the, the, uh, you know, the New Testament as well. Now, I want to take this a little bit further into the New Testament. And this is going to be sort of a, a bit of a riff, but I, I find it really interesting. In relation to the 12 apostles, specifically, my, my launching point here is going to be Mark chapter 3, verses 14 and following. The, and, you, know, you could start it in one of the other Gospels too, but the calling of the 12. I'm going to read you a section from uh, Joel Marcus's Anchor Bible commentary, Mark 1 through 8 about the calling of the 12, because this is one of the few commentators, again, that, that doesn't miss sort of the, the bigger picture, the bigger metaphorical, the conceptual metaphorical, biblical theological picture of the calling specifically of the 12. And it, it's also the backdrop for why when Judas you know, was lost, that, that the number had to be restored, because it meant something. It telegraphed a set of ideas. Again, it's part of the matrix of ideas. So Marcus writes this. Again, he's commenting on, this isn't an Exodus commentary, it's, he's commenting on Mark chapter 3. Jesus calls the 12. He writes, it is probable that when Mark describes Jesus' ascent of the mountain. He has, he has in mind Moses' ascents of Sinai throughout the Pentateuch, Exodus 19, Exodus 24, Exodus 34, so on. As Allison in his book, The New Moses, points out, in the Septuagint, Mark's phrase, anabinein ace ta horas, to go up to the mountain, occurs 24 times. That phrase occurs 24 times, of which 18 are in the Pentateuch, and most of the latter refer to Moses. Exodus 19.3 is a particularly interesting example, since two verses later, it is prophesied that Israel will be God's treasured possession, and this is similar to the way in which the Mark and Jesus chooses the twelve for intimacy with himself, and hence by implication with God. Now, let me break in here. Remember, who's leading the people in Exodus 15? That's Moses, okay? and they're on the way to Sinai. And again, the, the, the twelve here being associated with the, the tribes of Israel, and in, in Exodus 15, 27, it's the number twelve, choosing the number twelve there for the springs, is a way of telegraphing the fact that God's people belong with him. Back to what Marcus is saying here. Another important mosaic ascent occurs in Exodus 24, 1 through 4. 
where Moses ascends Sinai in the company of a group of priests and elders and sets up pillars symbolizing the 12 tribes. And we'll get to that when we get to Exodus 24, but that's true. He sets up pillars, one for each tribe at the mountain. Thus, the mark and linkage between the ascent of the mountain, association with a group of leaders, and the number 12 also has a mosaic parallel. A mosaic typology, therefore, is probably at least part of the background for the New Testament picture of Jesus surrounded by 12 disciples. The number 12 awakens memories not only of Moses, the human leader who welded Israel into a nation, but also of deeply felt Jewish hopes for a renewal of the nation at the eschaton, okay, at the, in the end times. Ten of the 12 Israelite tribes had disappeared as social units after the Assyrian invasion of the 8th century BC, though some individual Jews, such as Paul, preserved memories of their affiliation to these tribes. But many Jews in Jesus' time cherished hopes for the eschatological restoration of the 10 lost tribes. And he quotes you know, Sibylline Oracles, Testament of Joseph, jo Josephus here. He quotes a number of Second, te second Temple texts. Twelve, then, was a number symbolizing the longed-for fulfillment of Israel's destiny in the end time. And he quotes, again, some pseudepigraph, pseudepigraph texts and some Old Testament texts here. It is no accident that the eschatologically oriented Qumran community, this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found, was ruled by a council of this number, twelve. That's in one of their, you know, he quotes one QS there. In another Qumran passage, the Pesher, the interpretation of Isaiah 54, 11 and 12, 4Q 164, the 12 chief priests and the 12 tribal leaders of the renewed Israel are compared to stones in the eschatological temple. And the stone symbolism here is similar to that in our passage, in which Simon is renamed Peter, the rock. The eschatological nuance is further supported by Mark's repeated use of epoiasin, literally made for the idea of appointing, which may echo Genesis 1, because let me just break in here, because in Genesis 1, that same verb, Greek verb is used you know, for the acts of creation frequently. And Marcus writes, it may, you know, point, may echo Genesis 1 and thus associate Jesus' appointment of the 12 with the hope for a new creation. And by the fact that the 12 are instituted to proclaim the good news and cast out demons, both of which activities are linked with the arrival of the new age, the age to come, in the Markan narrative. And that's the way the Gospel of Mark describes you know, the, the future, the eschatological hope, the age to come. Now, he goes on, I'm not going to read it, but he goes on to, to get into this about you know, how three of the disciples are put into a subgroup, you know, Peter, James, and John, and the imagery of, of that, and the renaming, and all that kind of stuff. But that, I think that's enough for now. But the number 12, again, symbolizing the people of God, in this case, the tribes of Israel, really had significance throughout. Israelite and, and Jewish history. And so, again, when, when you put it in Exodus 15, 27, it, again, that's no accident because you associate Israel with, as the family of God. And, and later on, you know, in the intertestamental period, when you, get after, you, know, you have to go through the exile and after the exile, 10 of the tribes are still missing. It was really a, a big deal when Jesus goes out, you know, there's this guy who's doing all this crazy stuff and he claims to be the Messiah. Or people claim that about him or whatever. You know, and he's going into the, into the synagogue in Nazareth and saying, you know, Isaiah 61 is fulfilled in your day and you know, all this kind of stuff. When he calls 12, okay, people are going to be thinking eschaton. He's going, to, he's going to bring the 12 tribes together. This guy, he's the branch, you know, and, and, and we got the tree. Then the full tree is the people of God and, and the dwelling of God and you know, the land. And all these things are just going to converge because they're supposed to converge. They're all connected. And again, our, our little passage for today you know, is just, and it's, it's a little seed, if I can borrow the metaphor here and, and use it. You know, it. It encapsulates a whole bunch of ideas. But we have to ask, okay, if the 12 points to Israel as Yahweh's family, if it telegraphs God's desire to have these people in his home, so to speak, what does the 70 suggest? Well, I think you already know. I would say it suggests precisely the same thing. I think it's a textual allusion back to the nations in Genesis 10 being included in the covenant with Abraham. God's intention is not only that ethnic Israelites be in his human family. In fact, anyone who assigns their exclusive believing loyalty to Yahweh is a true Israelite, a true seed of Abraham. And that is, what, that is why Paul explicitly uses that language of Gentiles in Galatians 3. Let me just read you Galatians 3, 7 through 9. And it just can't be any clearer. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And, it, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. He's quoting Genesis 12, 3, which is part of the covenant he makes when he calls Abraham right after abandoning the nations at Babel, abandoning the seven nations. By faith, they are still going to be part. So then, Paul writes in verse 9, Galatians 3, 9, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We go to Galatians 3, a little bit later, verses 26 through 29. For in Christ Jesus, you, and he's, and he's writing to the Galatians, these are Gentiles, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Jew or Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean, he just can't be any more explicit than that. So the 70 points to the 70 nations. An Israelite reading Exodus 15, 27, oh, you know, Elam, you know, the, the palm trees and the well-watered garden, and God, you know, took us out from the realm of the dead, you know, through the Shehor or through whatever, you know, body of water it was, you know, you know, he delivered us from death. He's raised us, you know, to, he's made us new. He's raised us to life. You know, we're reborn as a nation. You know, we go out and we cross the border, we go out into the desert and we've got all the chaos, 
know, that the desert represents and, and God protects us from that. He gives us good water to drink. He gives us food, so on and so forth. You know, and, and, and again, they're going to wind up at Sinai. They're going to wind up, you know, at Canaan, you know, the land that flows with milk and honey and all that. But again, in little, in little capsule form, they wind up at Aileen in Exodus 15, 27. You're going to wind up with God. You're going to wind up where God's house is. You're going to wind up in God's home. And they're going to look at that at the 12, that 12 that's us. It's the 12 tribes. And then they're, they're going to keep reading, uh, 70 palm trees. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, when, when God called Abraham and supernaturally created us, he also looped the nations into that. We can't forget that. We shouldn't forget that. You know, and, and if, they're, if they're living at a time when they have access to the later you know, chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah doesn't let them forget that. It's when you have Gentiles ministering as priests you know, before Yahweh in the temple. Okay, I mean, it, it's, it's very clear that the nations are supposed to be in. In other words, Babel is supposed to be reversed. The nations aren't supposed to be forgotten. Babel is supposed to be reversed and restored. Humanity is, you know, God's family comes from all, all tribes, all nations, you know, so on and so forth. And so I think that the 70 is a numerical, conceptual reminder of that. You know, God rebirths them at the Exodus. They go through all this stuff. And oh, by the way, let's not forget, <laughs> let's not forget about the nations. So, you know, in a nutshell, you know, to wrap up here, in a nutshell, this is what we have in Exodus 15, 22 through 27. We've got a rehearsal of what's happened to this point. We've got a little bit of telegraphing of what's going to happen. Deliverance of death, deliverance from chaos, back in, in Yahweh's you know, home, his, you know, where he is. We have that all sort of in a nutshell in Exodus 15, 22 through 27. You know, God delivers them from death, preserves them supernaturally in the wilderness from chaos threats, and he brings them home. And again, they're supposed to be the conduit through which the rest of the nations are to be brought home as well. With that said, let's just jump in. So we will go through the whole chapter here, and I'm just going to you know, read through, and you know, when we run into things, then we'll We'll hit them when we come to them, and then just stop and discuss them. So the first one's going to, going to come pretty early here. So starting in verse 1, I'm reading ESV. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. Let me just pause there for a moment. Incidentally, that's kind of a, a bit of an odd kind of third-person reference there, but we'll just keep going. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. And then oh, I'm going to stop there. You know, he'll, he, We go into the episode where Moses and Aaron are speaking to the congregation, but back in verse four, let me read it again. Here's our first, why is that there example? Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Do you see the issue? There's a reference to the Torah, walk in my law, Torah. They don't have the law yet. They're not at Sinai. The law hasn't been given. So what is that? Now, is this a reference to the Mosaic law that doesn't exist yet? Well, you know, maybe. But Exodus 15, 25, back in the previous chapter, may indicate a more general idea that God gave the people rules before they actually get the law, you know, capital T-H-E, the law. Let me read Exodus 15, 25. And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Then the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. This is the reference to you know, the solution to bitter waters. So the Lord makes for them a statute and a rule. You know, so you know, God gives them instruction, you could say, before they actually get the law at Sinai. And the fact that the word Torah here shows up doesn't necessarily mean that we have you know, some anachronism here. Sarna sort of takes that, that trajectory. He writes this, Exodus 15.25 leads us to assume a tradition about laws given before the Sinai revelation. Okay? And if this was the only instance in this chapter, you could say, yeah, okay, I can live with that. You know, God's given them rules before they get like the real rules. And so the fact that the writer would use this kind of vocabulary doesn't mean that we have something really odd here, you know, maybe a boo-boo. Um, where you know we reference the law before it actually exists. If this was the only instance of this in this chapter, you could live with that. But as you can tell from what I just said, we are far from that being the only instance of this. Now we get down to verse nine. Let's pick it up there again. Uh, Moses said to Aaron, "Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling." And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, "I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God." In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, 
fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer, O-M-E-R, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more and some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever ever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, leave no, or let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Okay, now listen for what comes next. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink and there was no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now that's reading through verse 29. We're almost, we're about three quarters of the way through the chapter. Do you see the issue here? We have several references to a day of solemn rest and to specifically a Sabbath. Now, we haven't gotten the Sabbath command yet. And if you think, well, the Sabbath is just something that was part of Israelite culture. But think about what you're saying. How would they know about the Sabbath? Well, you say, oh, it's in Genesis, right? Genesis isn't written yet. The same guy who's speaking to them here, who is ostensibly supposed to record the law giving at Sinai, which hasn't happened yet, is also the guy who supposedly wrote Genesis. We have references to the Sabbath before, biblically speaking, anybody even knows what that is. Now, there are two it's kind of, kind of curious, if you actually look it up, there are two and only two references to a seventh day with the command or the comment that it was a day of rest prior to Exodus 20. There's only two times when you have reference to a seventh day before we hit Exodus 20. That's the giving of the Ten Commandments. And those two references are Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Exodus 16, 23, which we just read, is the first use of the noun Shabbat, Sabbath, in the entire Torah. Now, if that sounds surprising, yeah, it is surprising, but it's true. So how would they even know What's going on here? How would, how would the, the people in real time at the event, if Moses is actually speaking these words to the people in, in the manna incident, Moses is like, well, this is a Sabbath to the Lord. I would think, because the word Sabbath hasn't been used until this chapter in the entire Torah, even if they had a Torah, they, they might look at him and go, what's that? What? Like, we don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you read through it here, and it looks like they should have known this. But how would they? And you could make that, you know, some kind of argument here that you could go either way. I mean, you could hit this hard and fast, like this is just a hopeless, anachronistic comment here, and the, the editor's kind of stupid for the writer. Or you could massage this in some other way, you know, about how well, you know, maybe it's not, maybe they don't have written revelation, but they could have talked about it. And of course, if you go down that road, you're going to say, well, what started the discussion? Who brought it up? Where would anybody have heard this other than the Torah, which doesn't exist yet? And we haven't even had the, the Sinai event yet. So, okay, in theory, they could have been talking about six days and seventh day is rest day. But if you're the people in real time here, where do they get that information? Now, obviously, you could, you could say, well, Moses didn't write this. Somebody living later wrote this. Some, some would argue Moses you know, either didn't write it and somebody later did, or you could, you could have the possibility for, within the Mosaic uh, uh, composition, the Mosaic authorship tradition, you could say, well, Moses didn't write it like the day after it happened. He wrote it like years, decades later, you know, toward the end of his life, after the Sinai event had occurred. And that, that means they have this law about the, the Sabbath. And, and then Moses is writing this down later and then sort of you know, adding it to the details of what happened. But again, that, that makes us think about some things as well. You know, if you, wrote, if you argue that Moses did write it, but at a later time, sometime after the Sinai event before he dies, then the wording is post-Sinai, of course, reflecting back on the circumstances of the manna episode. That might sound good, but if you give it some thought, if this got written later, what would Moses have said in real time at the event in regard to the manna? I mean, saying he wrote it later presumes that he only knew about the Sabbath at Sinai, which hasn't happened yet. This approach would mean that when the incident actually did happen, Moses couldn't refer to the Sabbath because he'd never heard of it. So then what would he say about not gathering the manna on the seventh day. If he said nothing, then the after-the-fact approach here has Moses making up details of the story later in his life that weren't actually true in real time. You know, Moses had to give the people some rationale for not gathering on the seventh day. And then he changed whatever he said years later in his life to insert the Sabbath stuff. So th this particular strategy for sort of saving or preserving Mosaic authorship at a later time gets kind of convoluted. Now, again, you also can't say that the people should have known from Genesis about the seventh day being a day of rest because Moses supposedly wrote that too. So they don't have that either. You know, again, I'm trying to show you how, how this, this, just this little observation really, again, raises some kind of fundamental questions or really important questions about, well, what, what actually happened and when was it written? And, and the information in the, the, the written version of this, how, 
how did that get there? You know, like, like what, what, how did this all come together so that what's written reflects what really happened? You know, if, if you say that Moses wrote it or somebody else did again later, again, like oral tradition, we'll just say they would have to be either Moses or this other person would have to be recollecting some original rationale for not gathering the manna, you know, if, if uh, at the real time event. But, but what, again, what would the source of that information be? It seems to me again, to have this reflect a real event, you need to assume, and that's the key word here, you need to assume that God told Moses about the Sabbath before we get to Sinai. Now, you could read verse 23 um, sort of that way. This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow's a day of solemn rest. This is Moses speaking. Tomorrow's a day of solemn rest, the holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, so on and so forth. So you could say, well, God, you know, not only told him like what to gather and bake and not bake and all this kind of stuff, but, but God offered him some instruction about the concept of the Sabbath before we ever get to Sinai, which is where the Sabbath is going to become a command. And obviously, this is something Moses could have said in real time. You know, like God just told me to do this. And again, he, we read it and we assume that, that Moses just knew this, this information, like because of Genesis. And we never stopped to think, well, Moses wrote that too. And he, you know, like, like, did that exist? What evidence do we have for that even existing at this time? You know, we never think about questions like this, but critics do. They think about them a lot. So we, we'd have to go back to verse 23 and more or less say, God and Moses had a conversation. You know, God dropped a few breadcrumbs here about this Sabbath thing, even though, you know, he, you know, he hasn't, in a mosaic authorship model, he hasn't prompted Moses to write Genesis yet. He hasn't given Moses the revelation about what happened to create. He hasn't done any of that. So, but, but he's dropped enough breadcrumbs here in Moses' skull so to speak, or in the conversation, so that Moses know, okay, this is important to God, you know, that, that we not do stuff on the seventh day. Okay, that's what I'm going to tell the people. And, and, and we, we don't have to assume that Moses knew much more than that. Now, he's going to get more information. And once the, once the Sabbath idea becomes a command handed down at Sinai, the Sinai event, then later in his life, you know, Moses will know what a big deal this was and what the rationale for it was, you know, the creation week and all this kind of stuff. But he doesn't know that now. So you could read verse 23 in that way. I mean, it's a bit odd, but there's no rule against reading verse 23 that way. I mean, there's nothing that forbids it. You, know, you could just suppose that the instruction here was more general, and it gets codified later. Again, is that a distinction that makes a difference? You know, to some people it is, and some people it wouldn't be. But again, I want to point it out that even though it's easy to read this, and we never think about these questions, they're actually real questions. And there will be people again who have no concern, you know, nothing invested in the idea that, that scripture either, in any sense, you know, really comes from God either providentially or some you know sort of you know more more spooky you know kind of automatic writing kind of thing. You know, I'm using the, the two ends of the spectrum here, the caricature of inspiration here. Somebody who doesn't care about anything on the spectrum. And, you know, the Bible's just a book. It's a human book and put together by humans. And that's, that's the end of the story. You know, we don't have to think about providence here or God's role or anything like that. It's a book written by people about God. God really had nothing to do with the content itself. Okay. If you're in that camp, and, and you know, most, I think it's fair to say most criti- critical scholars are, you're going to notice things like this. And again, if you're mean spirited and you happen to have a group of, you know, as, as a group of freshmen in front of you or, you know, somebody taking Bible as lit, and you want, you're looking forward to disabusing them of any sense of divine origin for this document they call the Bible. You can pull this one out really easily. So we need to, we need to be thinking a little bit better about how these things in the text come together, either at one point or in stages or with many hands and all that kind of stuff. This is why I, you know, I have the, that short series of, of lectures that I do though about having a better view of inspiration. This is why it's important. We had some of these in the preceding episode, and I think even the episode before that, but this chapter, again, has, has a number of these. They're easy to, to miss. They're easy to read over. They're easy to not think about because we have the whole canon. We, you know, we, we just assume that Moses has all this in his head and that Genesis has already been written or that it's oral tradition. Or, you know, and you could say, well, it, it could still be oral tradition. Well, sure, you know, it could be. It's just nothing ever got written down. That's possible. But it's an argument from silence, just like taking verse 23 the way we, we talked about. That's an argument from silence, too. It's possible. You know, we, we just don't know. But I would say if it is possible, if it is oral tradition, why do people have the question? I mean, why, why, did, it, why did it not occur to them to... Why were there some dunderheads in the group that, that you know went out on the seventh day? You know, you know like like well, what's the big deal? I mean, they, if you, you would think if this is an oral tradition that has become intrinsic to the culture, that there wouldn't, really wouldn't be a question, there wouldn't be any need to answer the question. But nevertheless, here we are. So again, they're, they're just things to think about here. The next item that we're going to run into goes beyond sort of mere words that were verbalized at an event, or, or asking the question what words were verbalized at the event. Uh, this one's going to go a bit beyond that, and perhaps did not happen. I would say almost of, of necessity. What's described in Exodus 16 didn't happen when it's described as happening, but did happen later. And so the writer intentionally wants to telegraph some particular point by creating, this is important, the writer himself creates the chronological disconnection. In other words, it's not an error because it's a deliberate literary or theological strategy that was more important to the writer than giving us a play-by-play, blow-by-blow chronology. And that, let's, just, let's just read verses 33 and 34. I, I stopped at 20. Where did I stop here? Yeah, I stopped at 20. Uh, actually, at verse 30 here. Let's just, you know, verse 30 was, so the people rest on the seventh thing. Now, here's verse 31. Now, the house of Israel called its name, this stuff on the ground, manna. It was like coriander seed, white. The taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generation so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. So we're going to talk about manna in a bit after we get through these anachronisms here. But here, here's the next one, verses 33 and 34. Now listen to this. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it 
and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. Two phrases there. Let me read the verses again. Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. So that the two phrases are before the Lord and before the testimony. Basically, everybody in biblical scholarship, because you can just more or less look this up, agrees that the testimony here, Hebrew is edut, refers to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is in fact sometimes referred to as the Ark of the Edut, the Ark of the Testimony. Now, covenant is a different word, barit, the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of the Covenant is, is called the Ark of the Testimony as well. And so when, when the, the testimony, placing something before the testimony, before the Edut is referred to, it's a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. I actually discussed a little, you know, this phrase, this word a little bit in Unseen Realm. Now, Sarna translates the term Edut as pact, P-A-C-T. Okay, and he writes this of this verse, but verse 34. The pact. This is an ellipsis for the Ark of the Pact, and what we might think of as the Ark of the Testimony in other translations. Sarna says, Hebrew edut is synonymous with berit, covenant, even other different words. The Ark housed the two tablets of stone on which the Decalogue was inscribed. These are variously designated the tables or the tablets of the pact. The Hebrew is lukot ha edut, tablets of the edut of the pact, as in Exodus 31, 18 and elsewhere, and also called the tablets of the covenant, lukot ha berit. Let me just stop there. So what Sarna is saying is, look, when you get the tablets, they're called both things, tablets of the covenant, tablets of the berit, and the tablets of the pact, the tablets of the edut, or the tablets of the testimony. So this is evidence that berit and edut, covenant and testimony, or in Sarna's lingo, pact, are synonymous, they overlap in meaning, and the reference in either case is to the Ark of the Covenant, because that's where the tablets were kept, okay? Continuing with uh, Sarna, he references Deuteronomy 9, 9, and 11 there as well. Following the revolt of Korah, Aaron's rod was similarly deposited, quote, before the Lord, that is, before the edut, for safekeeping and for an educational purpose, as recounted in Numbers 17, 19, 22, and 25. That's the end of the Sarna quote. So clearly, what we have here is when, when you have this reference to putting something before the, the edut, before the testimony, before the pact. It, whatever this is, is, is being deposited. This jar is being put before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what's the problem? It's a very clear problem. The Ark hasn't been built yet. The Ark had not been built yet. That only comes after they get to Sinai. Its construction is given to us in Exodus, in Exodus 25. And frankly, the whole tabernacle doesn't exist yet. Instructions for the tabernacle and its contents are Exodus 25 through 27, a little bit in Exodus 30. This is clearly anachronistic language. You can't say, well, it just means before the Lord. You know, before the presence of the Lord himself, without a tabernacle. you got a problem there. If the deity is invisible, how do you put anything before it? You say, well, you know, maybe it's the, the mobile cloud or the angel. Well, that's nice. It's a moving target now. But you, you, you keep following the cloud or the angel around, and whenever he stops, you stick the, you put the car there at the feet or at the bottom of the cloud. I mean, it's really convoluted, and it ignores the, the kind of data that Sarna had in his quotation that Adut and Berit, are the, the Ark of the Adut and the Ark of the, of the Berit, they're, they're the same object. This is two ways of referring to the same thing, and it hasn't been built yet. And it's, it's a clear anachronism. And again, it goes beyond you know, what might have been floating around in somebody's head in terms of a conversation or instruction, like the earlier examples. This is something that was either done at that moment or not. And you can't say it was done at that moment because the things that you need to do it don't exist yet. Now, Sarna writes of this, I mean, obviously commentators, this isn't news to them. Sarna writes the, uh, the, the appendix, this, this commentary, you know, the appendix, he's referring to verses 33 and 34, actually to the end of the, the chapter, which concludes with verse 36. But verses 33 and 34 is where we're at now. He says, this appendix stems from a later time than the events just narrated. It presupposes the erection of the tabernacle, the appointment of a priesthood, the termination of the fall of manna, and that's important. It presupposes that the manna is going to end. It presupposes the settlement in the land and the obsolescence of the Omer measure. Now, that might be a little bit of an odd detail. We'll come back to that, but it's, that's actually interesting too. Sarna writes that medieval Jewish commentators recognizes, recognize that verses 32 to 34 tell of events that took place later on. It was already well established in rabbinic times that the order of the Pentateuchal narratives does not necessarily conform to chronological sequence. That's true, and we've seen it already before in other instances where things will be inserted, again, to draw the reader's attention to something deliberately. It's not careless. It's not haphazard. It's designed to trigger a thought in the reader at that particular time. There's, there's something that, that the writer is trying to either teach the reader or reinforce in the reader's mind. That's why you have these disconnections. And, and this is going to be another such instance. Now, Durham, in the Word Biblical Commentary, again, notices this, and he, he writes as follows. He says, this location, again, before the adut, the testimony, as critics have frequently pointed out, is anachronistically specified here. The testimony in front of which the jar containing the manna is to be placed is the testimony of the tablets or the tables of the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, or the Ark of the Covenant that contains these tables of the commandments. And of course, neither tables nor commandments nor Ark nor Covenant have made an appearance in the Exodus narrative to this point. Neither, for that matter, apart from this passage, has the institution of the Sabbath, holy to Yahweh, now been given at least as a law. These references, Durham continues, are set here, however, for an important theological purpose which overrides considerations of logical and chronological sequence. Yahweh has proved his presence in his provision for a complaining and disobedient people. That proof, miraculously wrought, must be plain to the descendants of Israel, who have yet to face the struggle of belief. 
They should share the story of their fathers and also the important evidences of their faith. Th- thus, the manna is to be kept, one omer of it, one day supply for one person. It is to be put in a jar and located in a spot before an object anyone reading the passage would know full well. The redactor who made the compilation of Exodus 16 was aware of this and was more interested in the proof and its transmission to the generations than in preserving a chronological and consistent sequence. Now, let me just stop there and unpack that a little bit. What Durham is saying is whoever you know, was responsible for the final form of Exodus 16 wants his readers living hundreds, you know, centuries later, hundreds of years later than these events, he wants them to mentally connect this jar with the presence of God who preserved their people during the wilderness you know, period. And so he does that by associating the jar with the place where the presence of the Lord dwelled, which is the Ark of the Covenant. So it's a device designed to teach them a theological point. It may or may not actually correspond to an event in real time at the manna episode, and I would say it couldn't because the Ark hasn't been created yet. Rather, it is a, it's a teaching point. It is something that the, the editor deliberately does, deliberately puts, cast the story this way so that any visitor, you know, I'm, I'm using you know, air quotes now, anyone basically who's living centuries later who would hear about the jar, the manna, or you know, let's just throw in Aaron's rod and, and the tablets of the law. You know, th- but this is, the, this is the, the anachronistic example. They're going to know because those things are stored at the Ark of the Covenant, which is where Yahweh dwells, that the manna was somehow connected to Yahweh. It was something he gave. They can't take a picture of it. They can't take a video of God giving them manna in real time. There's no way to quote unquote prove the point. And so what the editor does is the best he can. He associates the jar, which people could, in theory, go see, or again, you know, if, if they were if they knew a priest, a high priest or whatever, the priest says, Yep, it's in there, or you know, in theory they if it's not mobile anymore, but the, the tabernacle does get disassembled after the, the, the end of the land during the period of the judges and all this sort of stuff. I mean, people are going to see these objects, you know, a couple hundred years, you know, centuries after the fact, before we even get to the monarchy. They're going to see these objects. And when the, these things get written down by juxtaposing the relationship of these objects to each other, the jar with the Ark of the Covenant and whatnot, it's going to telegraph the point that it was God who gave us this manna. And here's the proof. Here, here's the manna. Here's the jar. It's right in there before the Ark of the Covenant because that God was the, was the point of origin for it. And they don't have any other means to connect these things other than written words. And, and since the events and the objects didn't coexist at the time, but they were certainly associated, it is the presence of God that lives, that sits, you know, on the throne of the Ark of the Covenant who gave them the manna. Even if the Ark didn't exist at the time of the manna, it was still the same God who did that. They're, they're, they're trying to juxtapose these things in the only way, by the only means they have, and that is writing. And so this is an editorial decision to connect two things that belong together, but were not together in real time. That's what they're doing. That's what, what the, the editor's doing here. That's why we have to us, again, looking, looking back on these things. This is an anachronistic thing in the chapter, but they are nevertheless two things that belong together. Two things that in real time were in fact associated with each other, the presence of God, the power of God, and the manna. And the only way that, that people are going to be able to sort of visually or you know, some other way, you know, sort of you know, having some kind of proof that these things were connected together was to connect them literarily in the text that they will have and that will be copied and people hundreds, thousands of years later can read about it. So you, again, this is a good example of, of having to put yourself in the shoes of a people, Israelites, that don't have any means other than writing something down to quote unquote prove something or preserve a thought, connect two things that belong together, even though again in real time things might not have coexisted. How else are you going to do that? You know, now if, if they were artists, if, if you know, if Israel did lots of iconography, and of course they don't because they don't have a, they don't have a country. Okay, they, they don't have a, they don't have cities, they don't have a temple, they don't have any of this stuff yet. And even you know, in centuries later, in the period of the judges, they don't they still don't have it. Even when they get a monarchy, they don't have it until Solomon. <laughs> okay, it's not like they're building things like the Egyptians and they draw pictures all over the walls. They don't have that. This is what they've got. And so this is a good example of putting yourself in the situation. And asking yourself, okay, if I'm the editor, this is my editorial project. I got to finish this chapter of, of, of you know, this is the second book of the Torah here, and I, and I want these things connected. And, I, and I'm living at a time where where we do have you know an ark, we, we do have the, the temple, and we, we've got this jar here. And and I know the episode, you know, how we got the manna that's in the jar. I know that, but how do I connect these two things? Well, the only way to do that is to just say it, <laughs> just put it in the story, just to, just say it, because we don't have any real time movies. Okay, we don't have anything like that. This is why in the Bible you get some of these chronological disconnections. There's just no way around connecting things for readers other than this. And so, you know, are we going to look at that and blame them for something? It's not a boo-boo. It's not an error. It's a technique. It, it, it's a means of communication. But, you know, we on our, on our modern high horses, well, this isn't the way that we would write history. Well, good for us. You know, good for us. You know, we, we have a bigger data pool. We've got things like video and audio. You know, and again, you go back to the, to the whole question, the whole presuppositional question we began the book of Exodus with. If, you, if I tasked you with writing a history of your own life, could you do it? Could, would it conform to your own standards? Okay, get ready to fail because I'll be a critic on your sources. I know you, you didn't record in real time all your conversations. I know that you can't go back and find witnesses to events in your life. Even if you could, you, you don't have those conversations recorded. I can impose your standards on your own recollection of your own life and make it look like you have no idea what you're talking about, dude. I can do that. 
But we're content to do that with, with the Bible, at least many people are, and they won't do it to themselves. They won't be consistent because they have an axe to grind. Okay, so yeah, we can get on our high horse here and look at Exodus 16 and, and somehow poke fun at it or, or, or turn it into some mistake or error. It's not a mistake or an error. It is a technique. It's what writers do. It's what they do with the tools at their disposal to accomplish the communicative task that they want to accomplish. That's what it is. So again, th- th- see, this is the kind of discussion that historicity ought to be about. But instead, what happens you know, on the internet, on YouTube, and you know, all these, these, again, these sites where people basically talk like they know what they're talking about, okay? All they can do is find disconnections or anachronisms like this and then think they've, they've proven something. They don't put much thought into it at all. They don't impose the same standard on themselves. They don't put themselves in the same time period, the same set of circumstances, because that would require thought. That would require work. Okay? It's just easier to grind my ax against this Bible thing. You know, and, and it is, it is, it is easier to do that, but it's, again, it's, it's misplaced. You know, it's, it's really inconsistent, actually. Now, there's one more of these. This is kind of interesting. Let's go to verse 35 here. It's verses 35 and 36. The people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And then verse 36, in, you know, ESV in parentheses, because it's a parenthetical thought. An omer is the 10th part of an ephah. <laughs> That's how the chapter ends, with his editorial comment about measurement. An omer is the 10th part of an ephah. You know, look at this. If Moses is writing this, and again, I think you can, you can tell already he's not, how would he know this? How would he know that the people of Israel ate manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land? How did he, how, you know, he might, you know, squeeze that one out because he dies, you know, real, real close to them getting into the land. But they ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. When do they actually, when does the manna actually stop? Joshua 5.12 tells us that. Let me read Joshua 5.12. The manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, that verse tells us that the manna ended the day after the Passover celebration in the book of Joshua, the first one, at Gilgal, right before the invasion of Jericho. Moses never saw that. He was dead. Okay, again, this isn't a goof on the part of the writer, the editor of Exodus 16. It's deliberate. I mean, he wants, he wants us to know this is obviously added by somebody living later, and he, he, he's connecting this thought you know, again about the manna to what you know, he's just said really in the, in the previous two verses as well. Now, Carpenter notes here, the writer of this note, well, at least in verse 35, could have been Moses, his scribes, Joshua, or a later inspired editor of his document. The purpose of recapturing or recapping the entire 40 years in the wilderness was to emphasize that the manna was a constant, it's important, a constant food supply for Israel throughout the wilderness period. Israel could rely on her God to supply her daily needs. God's care never ceased, although the Israelites rebelled against him many times. In a barren desert, God supplied his people with food during a time when a significant amount of time was spent murmuring and rebelling against Yahweh and his chosen leaders. However, this wilderness period becomes at the same time a picture of Israel's glorious past to some writers. For Israel was never more cared for than during this time of great vulnerability and need. It was Israel's childhood when God was forming them into a people. Sarna adds about verse 36, the omer, let's catch this, this little editorial measurement comment, the omer is a measure, or as a measure, never recurs in the Bible outside Exodus 16. This is the only place it's mentioned, the word omer. The note is needed here because the omer became obsolete and unintelligible to later generations of Israelites. A tenth of an ephah is otherwise termed isaron in the Hebrew Bible. The ephah, a word of Egyptian origin, was a dry measure frequently mentioned in the Bible. This is clearly an editorial comment by someone living after the fact, well after the fact. And so this little throwaway thing about defining what an omer is, if this was written by someone near the events, they wouldn't have to do that. But since this unit of measurement falls out of use and is never used again in the Hebrew Bible, somebody, again, working the chapter later on, realizes that and says, nobody's going to know what an omer is. Better tell them. <laughs> Footnote, end of chapter, an omer is the 10th part of an ephah. Oh, okay, I got it now. Again, this is the kind of thing you run into in Scripture. This is an obvious editorial hand. It's obvious that this, is, this material is written you know, later after the fact. And of course, if you connect it, as Joshua 5.12 does, to the Passover at Gilgal, which Moses never saw, again, this can't be a mosaic hand, you know, these last few verses at the end here. So again, what we're trying to do here is, is just to, you know, we're trying to point these out so that you aren't duped. On one hand, you're not duped into taking a view of mosaic authorship, will some, well, which some people will marry to inspiration itself. Okay? I don't want you to be duped into taking a view of mosaic authorship that is indefensible and easily overturned and assaulted. The sorts of simplistic things you hear over the pulpit in many cases in this regard are not helpful. Uh, they can actually set listeners up as easy targets for you know, critical zealots online, you know, militant atheists that you know, have a video camera and now they're scholars. Um, it, it's, just, it's easy to, to hear simplistic things about the text that just don't conform to the reality of the text. And then when, when your people or when you, know, you yourself or somebody you know runs into these things online, they're like paralyzed. Oh, what do I do? My pastor said this. I was always taught that. Well, you know, maybe it was too, too simplistic of an approach. Maybe the problem isn't the Bible. Maybe the problem is that we need to think better about the Bible. Okay, so th- that's, that's the one, you know, again, one of the reasons why I bring these things up. I don't want you to be duped. I don't want you to be led astray and junk the faith because, you know, of, of Exodus 16, 36, you know, some later hand put something in about it, what an omer was. Oh, I can't, I can't believe an in inspiration now because Moses didn't write. It's just ridiculous. I mean, you, you might be laughing now, but I get emails where the, that, you know, where people tell me their stories. You know, I was a Christian until, or I left the faith because of, and it's some of the dumbest stuff I've ever heard. 
Now, it wasn't dumb to them because it had an impact because they were poorly taught. But, but it's like this would have taken five minutes to clear up by somebody who could just think better than wherever they got their information here. If you're in pastoral leadership, let me just get on my soapbox here a little bit. If you're in pastoral leadership, you owe it to the people under your charge to do some studying and to think better because they will come to you as the source, the, the person who has the answers for their questions. And if you don't have it, again, where are they, they going to go? They're going to go to Middle Earth. Okay, they're going to go out to YouTube, Google, and the internet. And you know, Lord only knows, truly, what they're going to find there. You owe it to them. So what can I say? Maybe I'm a little too sensitive to this because I do get those emails, but this is the kind of thing I want to address here. Now, the rest of the episode, this won't take too much time. I want to talk about the manna because there, there's actually something interesting here going on that might make somebody wonder about what in the world's going on in the text. The, the, the basic, there's a basic question stemming from Exodus 16, 15. So let me go back there. I'm going to read you the verse again. This is, well, I'll go back to verse 13. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. In the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Here's verse 15. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? In Hebrew, it's manhu, for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, well, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Now, ESV has a little footnote next to what is it? And this is kind of telling. The footnote says this, or it is manna, Hebrew Man who you say well what that doesn't really mean anything to me well if you know a little bit of Hebrew you should know that the word for what in Hebrew is not M A N it's not man it's ma the text should say ma who that would that would literally mean what is it now the fact that the ESV puts a note there they take man who and say or it should read it is mana that who could be translated it and then man is mana it is mana it gets rid of the question and when you say well why would the translator want to get rid of the question because the translator knows that man M A N in Hebrew is not a question that word is ma so the the, the translator of the ESV knows that there's an issue here. There's something funky going on here with you know with the Hebrew text. So, and the, the Net Bible actually gives a, kind of a an extensive you know note on this. But I, I want to read uh, a, just a sentence or two from an article here. Uh, the article is by Zvi Ron. That's R O N, and it's entitled "What Is It?" Interpreting Exodus 16:15. It's from the Jewish Bible Quarterly, Volume 38, Number Four. It's, it's a 2010 article, and it's seven or eight pages long, 229 to 236. So he again he tackles this question. He writes, "If the Israelites spoke Hebrew, and since the Hebrew word for what is ma, why did they ask man who when seeing this food?" Based on proper Hebrew, they should have asked ma who and named the mana and named the mana ma instead of man. <laughs> okay. So that's what his whole article is about. Like, what in the world is going on here? Now the Net Bible says this. Okay, the text has man who ki lo yadu ma who. See at the end of the sentence, it actually has the correct you know, Hebrew word ma who, but it, in the beginning it has man who. So man who, that's the, the, the troubling portion. You know, what is it or, or it is mana? The ESV footnote. For again, they didn't know what it was, mahu. So it's really odd that the second half of the verse has the correct, you know, the quote unquote, you know, correct Hebrew, and the first half doesn't. So the Net Bible writers, the editors say, from this statement, the name manna was given to the substance. Man for what is not found in Hebrew, <laughs> but appears in Syriac as a contraction of ma den. What then? In Aramaic and Arabic, man is what. So it shows up in Aramaic and Arabic, but not Hebrew. The word is used here apparently for the sake of etymology. In other words, the, there's their suggestion that the writer uses man here to connect it with the noun that will follow later in the chapter, the noun man, which is mana. You know, when it, when it, it's a noun form. So that, that's their take. Uh, and then they quote Reverend Childs, here is a famous commentary on Exodus, so on and so forth. He, Childs says, or Childs follows the approach that any connections to words that actually meant what are unnecessary, which is unfortunate because that's, that's the trajectory we're going to follow here in the rest of the episode. Because Childs thinks it's a play on the name, it's a play on words, whatever it may have been, and therefore related only by sound to the term being explained. This, however, presumes, this is the Net Bible editor now, presumes that a substance was known prior to this account, a point that Deuteronomy does not seem to allow. SR Driver says that it is not known how, the, how early the contraction came into use, this, this other form, but that this verse seems to reflect it. Probably one must accept that in the early Israelite period, man did in fact mean what. There seems to be sufficient evidence to support this. Now, the Net Bible refers to three sources here. This is getting a little arcane, but I kind of like this stuff, okay? It refers to the El Amarna tablets, one, one, you know, a tablet and a citation, a line there. It refers to Gordon's Ugaritic textbook, and it refers to the Dictionary of Northwest Semitic Inscriptions. I'll come back to that comparative Semitic stuff in a moment, but I, I, for, for, for the time being right here, we have an issue here that man who, man, translated what, does not occur in Hebrew. So what's it doing here in Exodus? You know, how do we resolve this? Now, Ron's article, that article I mentioned a few minutes ago, goes through all the options, and which is why it's of interest, and I will put it in the protected folder for, for the curious. Um, I'm, I'm going to excerpt a couple of places from it. He writes, in the JPS, Jewish Publication Society, translation of Exodus 6, 16, 15, the phrase man who is understood to be a question. What is it? Many commentators affirm that the Israelites who said man instead of ma must not have been speaking typical Hebrew at that time. The early medieval sages, Rashbam, Yosef, Bechor, Shor, and Hizkuni explained that man is the Egyptian word for what? And at the same time, or at that time, the Israelites spoke a version of Hebrew that, again, in theory, was heavily influenced by Egyptian. Um, let me just break in here. That's overstated. Now, it's true that Again, for those out in our podcast audience who've had Middle Egyptian, you know, hieroglyphs, okay, 
if you have access to Faulkner's uh, Concise Dictionary of Middle Egyptian and Gardner's Grammar, Gardner's Sign List, you'll find man in those sources. They note the word. It's actually a variant spelling of the normal interrogative pronoun in Egyptian. Again, Ron's article quotes Budge. Budge is a more popular and frankly less, less accurate uh, Egyptian dictionary lexicon than some of these later ones are. But, but the later ones do have it. Now, again, I think this is a bit idiosyncratic. It's one word. How can we conclude that the Hebrew of Exodus 16 is, quote, heavily influenced by Egyptian if we're only dealing with one word? Just, I think that's overstated. I think it's kind of unnecessary given something that follows here. So back to Ron's article. He notes that Casuto, Umberto Casuto, is a, was a famous Jewish scholar, written a couple commentaries on Genesis. And, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of well-known in evangelical circles. Casuto gives a similar explanation and writes that in ancient Canaanite languages, the word for mat or for wat is man. In Ugaritic, remember the Net Bible footnote referenced the Ugaritic textbook. In Ugaritic, it is mn, and in the Canaanite of the Elamarna letters, it is manu. Remember the Net Bible, again, footnote referenced the Elamarna letters. The Israelites then were using an ancient dialect variant for this word. Currid, you know, who we've, we've quoted a number of times in this series of episodes, Currid prefers this view, this view as well. He says, man is an ancient dialect variant found in Canaanite literature, such as in the text of Ugarit, end of quote. And that, that's all true. You know, I'm sitting here, I have the uh, Dictionary of Northwest Semitic Inscriptions open on my laptop here, and there's lots of occurrences of MN, man, in Northwest Semitic languages. You don't get any in epigraphic Hebrew, but all these languages are related. So in theory, in theory, um, you know, the Hebrews, early Hebrew speakers, you know, could have had this pronoun and, and this noun as well. I mean, it, that is very possible. So again, you know, this is, what we're, this is what we're dealing with. We don't have any specific examples, but it's very possible. Aramaic and Syriac, these are later, but again, they're in the Semitic family. They have words like man and mana that can mean what. Again, some, some scholars will, will take the Aramaic information, mana, and then they'll go to the early chapters of Daniel, where the verb mana, to a point or something like that, uh, to provide, is used for the food prepared for Daniel. Now, it's not the noun for the food, okay, but, but this verb is used in, in what is prepared for Daniel and his companions to eat. And so they go to Daniel and they reason that, well, maybe a later writer or editor borrowed the term to create a pun you know, with the food itself, and the question of what was it, and all that kind of stuff. That, that's possible, too. It's very possible. Um, there's another explanation offered by Ron's article. And this gets us into what many of you are probably thinking about the manna, like these naturalistic explanations. So Ron's article covers this ground too. He writes, the Judaic press translation, it renders the phrase man who is a declaration, not a question. Okay, so he, he first referred to the JPS translation. Now he's dealing with another uh, translation. So there are Jewish translations out there that take it a different way. When the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna. Okay, so it's not a question, it's a statement. And, and the ESV had this in a footnote. But they did not know what it was. Accordingly, the Israelites named what they saw, okay, man, because it looked like this is, this is from Rohan's article, because it looked like tamarix manifera, a sticky sweet substance excreted by scaly insects that feed on the sap of the tarfa tree, a kind of tamarisk, the biblical eschel. This substance contains glucose and protein and has been collected for generations by the Bedouin, who call it man. In many ways, this substance is similar to the biblical manna. It melts in the sun, hardens into white granules, and it can be used as a substitute for honey. It was well known in the ancient world and is mentioned by Josephus, who wrote, quote, it is a mainstay to dwellers in these parts against their dearth of other provisions, unquote. Now, Ron puts that out to, hey, the Bedouin have this thing called man too, and it's this you know, stuff secreted by insects, okay? But Ron is fair with the information. He says, you know, there's a problem here. Moses had to explain to the Israelites what, that what they saw was not anything natural. It was from the hand of God. It was not the natural sap-derived man, but a miraculous substance sent by God. The Israelites named the food they found after the natural man found in the desert. So what Ron is angling for here is, okay, maybe they used the term for this stuff, but, that, but, but the, the stuff that the Bedouin collect even today was not what they were eating. What they were eating was delivered by God. So you know, at best, maybe they borrowed a term. So again, Ron is in his article is trying to cover all the bases here, all the possibilities. He doesn't really fall uh, with that explanation. Again, he, you know, again, because he, he, he sees this, this account, Exodus 16, God has to tell him what, you know, Moses has to tell him what it is. And Moses doesn't say, hey, you see that bug over there? You know, lots of these bugs secrete this stuff. I know it sounds really, really gross, but it's good. I mean, that's not what Moses says. You know, and, and again, it's this idea of bread from heaven. It has a divine origin, not, uh, not from insects. So Curid chimes in here about naturalistic explanations for the manna, and he writes, numerous attempts, I mean, this one I just read from Ron is just one of several. Numerous attempts have been made to define scientifically the nature of the food. For example, Bodenheimer remarks, quote, accordingly, we find that manna production is a biological phenomenon of the dry deserts and steppes. The liquid honeydew excretion of a number of cicadas, plant lice, and scale insects speedily solidifies by rapid evaporation. From remote times, the resulting sticky and oftentimes granular masses have been collected and called manna. Again, that's what Ron just told us about the Bedouin. Curd continues, such explanations are not sufficient, and they do not precisely fit the biblical descriptions. It is unwise to remove the miraculous element. Manna is, quote, bread from God, Exodus 16, 15, also called food from heaven, Psalm 78, 24, and the bread of angels, Psalm 78, 25. Now, my two cents here, as we wrap up, to me, it makes the best sense to say that Exodus 16, 15's wording in the phrase, you know, manhu, is drawn from an older form of Hebrew than biblical Hebrew. Even though we don't have instances, or at least I, I haven't been able to find any in the Dictionary of Northwest Semitic Inscriptions, um, I don't know, I can't remember the, the date of that publication. It's pretty massive, so it's pretty thorough for the time it was written, but maybe there's something else found that didn't make its way in there. I don't have a, 
you know, a photographic memory of all Hebrew, epigraphic Hebrew vocabulary here, far from it. But in view of that, in view of that absence, inscriptions by definition, epigraphic Hebrew, the, the corpus, the number of them that we have is pretty small. It's a, it's a small corpus. And so the fact that we don't have examples doesn't mean that this word, mn, mon, as a pronoun, what, it doesn't mean that that wasn't in their vocabulary. It's in basically all the other Northwest Semitic languages around them. So it, it probably was. I'm content with that. To me, that, that makes sense. You know, Mon is an ancient dialect, again, found uh, from, you know, it occurs in these other dialects, including Ugarit and Canaanite literature, all, all this stuff. So it's quite conceivable, again, that this was in use for Hebrews in a much earlier period than biblical Hebrew. Um, again, I, I'm good with that. I think that's, that's a sufficient explanation. We don't have to you know, just jump the shark and you know, go off in all these other lengthy trajectories. But I thought I'd, I'd throw some of that in in case, again, people out there in the audience are curious. So if you're a newsletter subscriber, you can access Ron's article. It's just R-O-N is his last name. I'll put it in the protected folder. And you know, for the curious, it's, it's an interesting read. But again, for my purposes, you know, where I come down, I, I, I'm content to go with the cognate information here, just the, the cognate possibility or probability uh, that this was part of the early Hebrew vocabulary. And, and that in and of itself might be something new to listeners. I hope you realize that biblical Hebrew is not quite the same Hebrew that biblical characters would have been speaking, you know, especially the ones in the early stories. Hebrew is like any other language. It evolves. Biblical Hebrew is sort of like a classical Hebrew. Um, there are differences in inscriptions, stuff that's, that's 10th century. 10, 10th century is the oldest Hebrew inscription that we have, you know, 1000 BC. So biblical Hebrew, by its very nature, is later than that. That doesn't mean that all of the biblical stuff was written after the 10th century, even though most critics would say that. We have, an, we have updating of the script. The script certainly changed. The grammar changes. The morphological forms change. So you, you have an updating later on anyway. Put whatever might have existed in early Hebrew into classical Hebrew form. But again, that may be news to some of you. And I'm not suggesting you got to go out and take a class in that or go get a degree. But you should know that some things in the biblical text that are problematic actually get solved because of that. You know, these older forms. And I'm not speaking here specifically of Exodus 16, 15. There are other things as well uh, where this pops up in the biblical text. And if you know, oh, that's just an older form of this or that particle or something like, oh, okay, I got it. It's not, a, it's not a problem here. That's just, it just is what it is. And either a scribe, you know, when they were updating, again, the form of the language for the Torah, either left it in, didn't care, missed it, you know, whatever. It, it, it's intelligible to someone who knows the language from a native perspective, as the scribes did, but maybe not to us, unless you go out and get graduate degrees and this kind of thing. So anyway, with that, we'll wrap up. Again, this is a bit more of a curiosity trail in Exodus 16, you know, not the good uh, divine counsel kind of stuff that we were, have been looking at uh, in earlier episodes. But nevertheless, I still think that the, the information is, is important. And again, just, just again, to jog us into the realization that we need to think well about how we got this thing we call the Bible. Well, you answered my questions there at the end as far as how old the oldest Hebrew we have. You said it was 1,000 BC, dates back. What's the chance of us finding anything older than that? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's reasonable. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's probably less reasonable than something like Egypt because their civilization was so old and they go around and they build things and the pharaohs say, you know, write great stuff about me everywhere. I mean, there's just more of it to, to find. But that doesn't mean that, you know, other examples out there aren't aren't you know, waiting to be discovered. There, there's certainly no barrier. There's no, no necessary time barrier uh, to anything like that. So I wouldn't be shocked. Do you know off the top of your head what the oldest uh, script, I don't even know what you call it, uh, we found is, or you know, the story behind that? Well, it, 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 you know, some, it, it depends if you want to lump the Gezer calendar in here, which some, some older sources will say it's Hebrew. It's probably not Hebrew. Some, some think of it kind of as a hybrid, um, but it was used in, it's, used, it, it's found at Gezer, okay? So whoever produced it, and again, there, there are things about it that dialectically don't work with epigraphic Hebrew. But regardless of that, they're using it together so they can read it. So what it, sh- what it shows is that, is that Hebrews, people, that, that's just a, a, an agrarian calendar. So it's not like a big military or scribal. You don't, you don't need a trained scribe to produce this thing. It's just something you'd use to plant and, and sow and reap and all that. They could read. Okay, they, they, could, they could do stuff like that as far back as 1000 BC. So it, it's still worthwhile as evidence, even if there you know, are niggly problems of it. That, you know, is, it is it true Hebrew or not? Is it a hybrid of something else? You know, who, who wrote this? It doesn't really matter for, for what we're talking about. It, it was used. They could read it. They could produce it, understand it. So it's, that, that typically gets the nod.